Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Gameform Show. I'm your host, Ben Hanson, joined by my ever-present co-host, Tim Turry. Hello. And then we have Ben Reeves. Uh, oh, hello. And then we have Michael Larry, who is oh, an hello. intern at Game Informer. Welcome, Michael. Hey, what's up? Hey, wait a minute. Something's off. Yeah, we normally don't have interns on this. Why did we bring an intern in early? Yeah. I snuck in. You guys had the door open. Oh, I would okay. argue that you've seen some pretty privileged gaming content, Michael. What what might that be? I think it's Resident Evil Seven. <gasps> what? Well, right into that one. Oh my gosh! It's like it just snuck in this building alongside a mysterious figure known as You're former corrupted. Game Informer co-host Tim Turry. Welcome back, sir. Hi. Thanks for having me. It's real good to have you. So yeah. we've got a big show here. We're talking about a couple big games, and then the great community email section, and then after that, we're talking about uh, Pokemon Sun and Moon. Whoa. We're starting the whole cool. GI Game Club. That's this episode, y'all. I want to start that game. So we're talking about everything in that game up to the end of the second island. The second you step off the second island, that is the end of that discussion, but we'll have a good old chat all about that. What's the name of that island again? The second island. <laughs> Pokemon okay. Island. Okay. That's right. Is uh, it Aluhu or something? <laughs> well, Alola is the name of Alola. the region. Okay. You know, but it's like a big island Thank situation you. with Hawaii. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Hello, you. Uh, Tim, welcome Hi. home. Hi. Uh, thank you. Fear Comes Home uh, is the tagline for, and, and Fear came to Game Informer's office. That's uh, right. So we yeah. played Resident Evil 7. You brought it around. You carried it around in a backpack and traveled the country, I, I believe. The nuclear football. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, bra- we brought our, our most recent um, preview for Resident Evil 7, which was a big chunk of the game. Ben sat down uh, and a co-pilot, uh, Michael, right. and played through like, I don't know, like three, four hours of the game. I want to say it was over four. Maybe four. Or Ben's four. very yeah. meticulous. Just, so when you like were not looking, six. I kept playing. Yeah. So the big, the big thing with this is like the the campaign's been very mysterious up to this no point. No S. Yes, I understand. Uh, you know, it's been a shift to first person. There was a playable demo, the beginning hour demo. It was kind of like, all right, we're back to kind of spook you a little bit. We want to be scary again. Get you, get you familiar with the your faces. I forgot about being on the receiving end of these. <laughs> no, go on about the spooks. To uh, you know, Wade sort of ease people into the waters of first person horror in Resident Evil Uh and what this preview the purpose was was to be like okay well this is also this is a Resident Evil game and let's show you how Uh, which I mean I've played it a lot uh, but now you guys have played it I've played the game it's an odd strategy months away from release to be like hey just just remind everybody this is a Resident Evil game here's how it is a Resident Evil game it feels like it's coming in coming in hot it was especially surprising because I was like, oh, yeah, what's the release date on this? And I couldn't remember. It's like, oh, yeah, January 24th. Is that right? Uh, yeah, January 24th next Holy year. And, and like, soon. It's soon. Like less than two months away. And you're like, now we're just learning about this game. And uh, Which, Tim, I agree. I think it's great and I'm excited about it. But the fact that it's this close is kind of like. What did we learn seems about foolish it? Yeah, put, to wait that long? Omar, but anyway. I would love, like, if you almost pretend I'm not in the room, like, and talk about the game like you would because. Sure. Uh, I'm super curious. We, like Ben and I actually, and, and Mike, we haven't really talked about, we haven't like debriefed on it yeah, really for sure. or talked about yeah, what really. you thought about it, but heck, I'm curious. Yeah, Reeves, <laughs> uh, just t- turn your shoulder okay, away sure. from Tim. Yeah. Um, what did you learn? What was the biggest question mark going into sure. this and what was like the, oh, this is Resident Evil 7 moment? Yeah. Well, I'm glad Tim's not here and he, he's really changed, yeah. guys. Yeah. <laughs> he's, man, what a piece of S. Okay. <laughs> Am I right? Uh, yeah, Resident Evil I was surprised how, and they'd said this in interviews leading up to when they even first announced it, that it was very Resident Evil-y, like they were going <laughs> to kind of stick to the, the Resident Evil elements. Don't be scared. But until or you do be see, scared, actually. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Until you see that, though, you like you don't know how that's going to play out. So I was very happy to see that the classic Resident Evil feel is still there. What does that mean? Well, it, it reminds me more of Resident Evil like 1, 2 than it did 4, 5, 6. In the fact that you're like in a more confined area. In the section that we played, at least. Yeah, I mean, I played, like I said, I played like four hours. So that's a pretty good chunk. And it might go to a new area. I don't know. But even that chunk, like if the rest of the game plays out like that, that's good. So we're we're in a confined area. You're on this plantation in the south. And you kind of open up rooms one at a time slowly, kind of like the classic Resident Evil formula. You're finding keys. You're finding... Uh, lock picks to open up new like cabinets you're finding like i don't know what do you call those like icons or like symbols that you stick in a door and then it unlocks like right right kind of cheesy but but it's very resident evil and i like that actually. you're using a knife to cut open boxes and get right. some some cool secrets inside yeah i feel like that's Ammo. there's like a little resident evil 4 in there where it's yeah. just like swipe the box and it just explodes and excuse me right. tim we're trying to talk about resident oh yeah. where did yeah. you where i get excited i get excited I, <laughs> uh, but then kind of in addition to that they showed off combat so it's 
first person shooter shooter stylings. Tim, please do not <laughs> laugh at Ben Reeves when he's trying to tell the story about this it. first person shootle you're making. He's a, he's a very entertaining guy. I, I thought it was interesting. You're very you charming. For the shooter. Shootle. Shootle. <laughs> <laughs> this is. I want to say so I, I, I listen to the. I listen to the show every week, and this is. Uh, I love this stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, I do really glad like you can be part of it. Yeah. Please take your hand off my shoulder. Hey, thank you for listening <laughs> to the show, Tim. I, I think it's very nice that you keep listening to the show. I wanted to get your take on that music trivia from oh. a couple weeks back because I'd imagine you had some big critiques. Slam on the brakes. Remember what sure. you, you, we were about to talk about combat. Uh, yes. Combat. Uh, my first bit of feedback about the music music trivia segment is. Uh, how fucking dare you! <laughs> <laughs> immediately do it after I leave. I don't know, but immediately, immediately like ten months. months. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But anyway, it, relatively so. I was fighting for that for a long time. I feel like, and you were kind of like, eh, I don't well, do that. yeah. I think you just wanted more music segments in general. I forget how much we talked specifically about trivia, but would you have annihilated Kyle and Brian? Uh, no, honestly, I think it would have been pretty close. Like you did some pretty deep cuts, I think, and there was some stuff that I was kind of faltering on, and uh, I thought it was good. I I think that. What you're the tricky thing is that you're going for name the game, right? So you're right, you're one so you're going for obscure tracks or kind of sometimes obscure tracks. I was trying not to for, but for yeah. a, a game that's recognizable, and that's tough because you're never going to have someone try to like. I think another layer of it, maybe this could be like a bonus round, is like trying to name a specific track, like what level that was from. I think it's fun to go yeah. a, a, a layer deeper, but that's that's when you can go really specific too. Um, but otherwise, I'm excited. I think that there was a little bit of a brand of Ben Hansen me <laughs> like, gosh, I really like this music from Twisted Metal. Or it was guess tough. what? The Chicago music from uh, uh, Perfect Dark. Perfect Dark well, movie. it was tough because there was a YouTube comment even where it's like, oh, great. Another trivia game where you just name Ben Hansen's favorite things. But it's like, <laughs> it's tough because you have to know the games well. Because it's like, if it's a game I've never played, I don't know if that track is recognizable. Like, I'm not a big Modern Warfare guy. And so I sent music to like jeff um to be like hey is this memorable from the game he's like no i don't remember that track mm. at all so you have to know the game so therefore it's games i naturally like That's and true. played more so i'm not trying to make it ben hansen as hell i'm just giving me a hard time i really liked it i liked playing along oh, good, i obviously thanks. was a huge fan of like back box trivia undefeated uh and uh had a great time with <laughs> asterisk it. city and, um yeah it's like keep it keep it going i would love to play sometime if it works out all right you know what i want to play more of it's resident evil 7 by oh. oh nice you're talking about combat, oh, talking Ben. About that? Yeah, we no. started with that. I, said, I was talking about shootle. Shootle. So shootle here's here's that's my starting Pokemon. So obviously it was confusing. Shut up, Tim. It was confusing <laughs> with uh you know the 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 demo where everyone's like, is this what Resident Evil Seven is going to be like? And I feel like in the messaging, Capcom and and you were up on a pedestal saying like, no no no, like there's, there's guns in this, like it's cool, everybody. Yeah. Just wait ten months and we'll show you. <laughs> right, but then there was a moment where like people were playing the game. You were playing the game in the office yesterday, right? And then Reiner came in the back bullpen. And he's like. Pfft. That's crazy in there. You're like running around shooting stuff with guns. It's it's nuts. Uh, Is that what he said? That was he basically left? the gist of it. Yeah. I wonder exactly if we get like quote, quote approval on that. <laughs> pretty good. What? So is it more shooting than you expected? The right level of shooting for Resident Evil? It's not like an. It's not like Modern Warfare or anything. Or like it's not like <laughs> instantly like an action shooter, right? Uh -huh. So, but there are elements where it's the it's it's well paced. I'll say that because you spend a good amount of the game kind of wandering around the Baker family who's the the family you've seen in the trailers are a little bit more powerful and like you want to hide from them sometimes let's yeah. say so you're spending some of the game hiding from enemies but then you'll un encounter an environment where these new enemies show up called the molded and they're right. these like monsters it's nice to see Resident Evil monsters they, they kind of look like monsters, the tentacle yeah. things from like five or six but like just those tentacle things yeah they're just tentacles they're not really humans and you end up, uh, like those enemies, you can mow down a little bit more easily. So you have, your, your, it's shootle gameplay. Like you're, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it, guys. Yeah. Well, uh, I, was, I was struck. I mean, I played, I don't know, the first half hour. What was that, Tim? Um, yeah. And, and uh, I was struck. And this is like and, and, an hour into the game. To be clear, yeah, about an hour into the game. Right. right. I was surprised that there was as much stealth as there was. It is you just hiding from right. this creepy family. Well, what's interesting is that, like, that's kind of a play style thing. You know, I don't know, back as 
far as long ago as like Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, you know, you could either choose to engage Nemesis at a lot of enca- encounters or you could just book it and and hope that he doesn't follow you into the next room. Yeah. Um and like this, yeah, like you chose to kind of hide from Jack Baker because you start out you don't have a weapon. Right. Um but, you know, once you're armed, once you get a pistol, once you get your shotgun or even your knife, you know, then you can choose like, all right, I'm tired of being stalked around, you know, this wing of the mansion by Jack. I'm going to take him down for a bit and uh, and, and put him down. So, I, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I sort of did that too. We all kind of played differently. Like you both were pretty stealthy and I kind of, I just booked it when I could because, mm-hmm. you know, I, I already seen you two play it and I didn't want to wait around. I feel like the whole thing about that demo was that you could tackle it kind of a couple different ways and that's what i took away from it the most sure yeah there's some cool it was, it was fun to watch you guys play because i played through that section and things small things like i don't want to over overemphasize this but like some things can play out a little bit differently depending like, in a sh- scripted way even um i mean you know in a way that like if certain elements aren't in place like one one thing the main story will always kind of go in the same direction but it yeah. might kind of play out a little bit differently what Okay, let's talk about this main story because even things like the main character has been mysterious up until this point. So, who is the main character in Resident Evil Seven? Is Ethan Winters? Uh, he is arrived. Him? <laughs> yeah. So he's a new character, wow. uh, and he is on his uh, on a mission to basically find his his missing wife, um, and it has led him to the Baker family residence in Dolby, Louisiana. Okay, so how representative? Is this Baker family? By the way, if you've seen like the trailers, they're the ones that are like cannibals eating crap on a table. Yep, and that's uh, that's right where this preview started. Right. Are they are they being pitched as the main antagonist in the game? Is this one chapter where they're only a problem here? What what are you guys saying about that? Uh they are the the main yeah, the main antagonist of really? this game. Oh, cool. Yeah, definitely. Like it's uh it's I mean, like Ben mentioned, there's the molded enemies, which are like these these kind of oozing black, like mold fungus kind of monsters yeah. that like ooze in through the walls or up through the floorboards. Sounds right. like my ex wife. <laughs> it's really cool watching them pop up out of the environment. I was trying to think of another show or something that it reminded me of. And I, it it's a, I don't know, maybe like the aliens in the walls and aliens or something. I was like, thinking necromorphs because if oh, interesting. a couple of times um, me and Ben we would run away because you know it's super cramped. Mm-hmm. And sometimes if you run away, they'll go back into the walls like they won't like be right. in the world forever and i thought that was really cool because you can't just run back to a hallway and just funnel them you have to kind of play on their terms yeah so that was really neat uh did you see zombies in your playthrough reads uh just michael it was the only <laughs> yeah, zombie i, I, I saw didn't, actually. i didn't leave what, what what's your no, take so on that <clears throat> excuse me i'm actually interested to see how that plays out i i don't know if you could consider the the baker family zombies because there's definitely something wrong with them that you find out throughout the course of the game there's something off about them right and something like i don't know supernatural supernatural ish and so i don't know what that is fully but like it'll be interesting to find out what that is like some kind of chemical or something so maybe that connects into the larger resident evil universe and umbrella or whatever but we'll see so that's the closest thing to a zombie because the molded which we talked about are unique black tin tendril creatures and yeah. then we saw these giant wasps later on did you see anything that connected it to the larger re universe no actually that's like <laughs> that's cool no thing or at least not yet like nothing seemed to be connected to this like you know 20 years of lore or whatever mm-hmm. and i thought maybe later it does but and that's what's interesting is because the last few numbered resident evil games have been so kind of bombastic and so like kind of world spanning world, span- <laughs> world spandexing uh-huh. they've been so Big. <laughs> should, should I be a, ca- a Capcom spokesperson? <laughs> this is great. Have you ever thought uh, maybe you could do some commentating on uh, uh, Capcom Pro Tour? Or something oh, like that? that'd be great. Yeah, yeah call me. Uh, but it, all I'm saying is, like, the last few Resident Evil games have been the t- tonally different and felt bigger. And this right. one feels much smaller contained. You're in a plantation, at least what we've seen. Little alien isolation-y. You're fighting yes. one family and their monsters and so i don't know how that connects to like the larger events of the world I think fighting a family and their monsters <laughs> yeah you know well <laughs> they're monster it's rangers. Their rag part, part of my favorite part of like this section of the game is that it gives you a sense like you know i think resident evil one was a good touch point like it's it's kind of going back you know it takes place in the chronology it's after the events of six but yes it's like way more focused in and you're an everyman right you're not a super cop that's in, like it survived multiple you know apocalyptic right. events or anything um you're you just need to guy work out a little bit more because his run speed is 
depressingly slow. slow. But like, he's got a low crouch to make up for it, that's and that's right. all you need. <laughs> you in a get that low crouch. But uh, you know, like Resident Evil One, one of my favorite moments is like when you finally break out of the mansion and are on your way to like the guardhouse, like the or, like the residence hall, the uh-huh. dormitory, and you're kind of exploring this other section. And what I was excited about you to be able to kind of check out is like, oh, like oh, I found these, uh, you know, these these dog heads and now i'm like leaving the front door of the mansion mm-hmm. um and so you got to kind of explore outside a little bit uh in the grounds yeah there's like a it. greenhouse area there was another like guest house or i don't know what to call it um so yeah there's other areas and there's areas we didn't get to go to so i don't know how big the game ultimately gets but i got the feel that it's maybe like resident evil 2 where you're in the police station a large part of the time but then you also expand into the city and maybe other areas i well, don't know what are the reference points from the team i don't know how much communication you have with the dev team but are they saying like we want this to be like re1 again is it's definitely a return to like the classic formula um you know obviously the first person perspective is is updating that element of the game. Um, and I don't know, it's a different way to deliver scares and and you know where the player's looking. So I think it kind of enables them to like make this like tailored. There's one great moment for me that like, I remember where it was like a molded was just walking up behind me. I just happened to turn around I was like, oh hell. And if this was a third person perspective, like I would have seen yeah. that coming. Um, but other than that, uh, yeah, it's like, it's, it's very much the, the dev teams like listen to fans over the years and I'm someone who's like really enjoyed the evolution of Resident Evil over the years even as it's gone more bombastic uh, and that's all documented um, <laughs> but uh, this is definitely like okay fans love the original classics they've been wanting the the dev team to scare them again and this was like definitely an answer to that is like this is scary again and like it's very deliberate combat like you gotta you know like I was watching Ben play and he's in the in the safe room in his item box like being like all right well the sh- the shotgun takes two two item spots uh and oh, i have this other weapon you know maybe i have the flamethrower and it's like all right well you have to make these deliberate choices and um and really really choose what you want you had to be strategic about what you're going right. to bring out on your next exploration run in the mansion yeah we should oh go ahead Riz. well i was gonna say because my favorite resident evil is the resident evil remake that was originally on gamecube and then came out again like what one one or two years ago yeah and it's totally worth playing if you haven't. But I like that because it took the formula that the first game on PlayStation had, but it updated it, and the visuals were darker and it was a little more serious. Yeah. And so this feels, I'm not saying it's exactly like the remake, but it kind of does have that feel to it where it's its darker, it's serious, uh, but it, it pulls in some of those elements of like exploring uh, an environment and like, okay, I can't get in that room yet. I need the crow key where do i find that and then you finally find the crow key like two hours later and then you can go back and double find new areas and new environments yeah that was like always one of my favorite things is like you'd spend this entire like think of resident evil one and there's elements of this in seven where it's like all right i spent the entire time searching the mansion figuring out all right i got the sword key find every door that the sword key opens but i keep on seeing the you know the helmet key pop up and it's like dang it okay i've gotten the sword key shield key i got the helmet key or i you know the armor key like where's the helmet key and you finally get that like hours into the game and you're like oh man now I can go and like go back and open all those doors. And the the game I think does a good job of like folding back on itself a little bit like really? that. It's yeah. that big of a mansion. Yeah, it's huge. It's like yeah, it's a big plantation mansion. And like they've and then the grounds and the surrounding grounds as well. So. well like, and it, are you, can you guys say is that the entire game of RE Seven? Is it just that area? It takes place in that area. Yeah. Well, okay. Even in the beginning, there was a door we couldn't open, and then at the end we got the key for that. So Ben doubled back and found a. A nice thing in there. So it, a and it's nice marked on the map. Thing. And not, I'm not going to say what it is. I would it say double nice back thing. and get that nice thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would, yeah. We, we heard we heard you should go back and get that nice yeah, thing. Yeah, you so mentioned I'd the it. you mentioned the more serious tone. Uh, can you guys talk about who's writing this game? It's uh, internally written by Capcom Japan. Okay, yeah. I saw news stories that it was like the guy who wrote Spec Ops: The Line. Yeah, I you know whether that was someone that collaborated on that, I'd have to investigate that a little bit more. But sure. I know that it was it is a Capcom story. Capcom ass story. Okay, gotcha. Um, we should point out as well that we did not play this in VR, but the entire game is playable in PlayStation VR, yeah. right? Yeah, beginning to end. So everything you played would be the exact same thing content-wise. Like, nothing plays out differently. There isn't more things being thrown at you or, or something, you know, to like a 3D movie or something like that. It's all the same. Uh, the difference being, you know, obviously, when I play in VR, I move a little bit slower. Like, things feel... Like, stakes feel raised a little bit. Like... It reminds me of, um, you know, some of the early horror VR demos. I just play the game differently because I feel really nervous. Um, And the other little advantage you can get is uh, 
kind of peeking around corners. Like you can actually, you know, oh, like, interesting. oh, all right, well, there's Marguerite and she's stalking towards me. So um, you can kind of get a little bit of a, a leg up that way. But mostly it's just like the immersion factor. All right. You've mentioned a couple of these characters in passing. Let, let's break down this family. Who we got? Yeah. So you got Jack Baker. He's the dad. You encounter him very, who we, you encounter him very early on. Yeah. And he's like, he greeted players of the beginning hour demo that welcome to the family son guy yeah um, he's got glasses is that right yep yeah glasses a, a beard um yeah he's like a basically a unhinged father figure that's stalking you um some very dramatic things happen with him and we've shown that like you know you can take him down and he he'll come back you know he'll he'll come back at you he has a so is it like a family of five little nemesis is that the idea <laughs> I, I mean like that's a i think that's a Nice compare. Obviously, they have a little bit more personality than Nemesis did. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. A little broader vocabulary, but uh, uh, and I get, you, I think you told me that they're AI driven. They're not like it's not like they're on specific patrol patterns all the time. But sometimes they'll just kind of wander around. Yeah, and so you don't know when they're going to pop up or or where they're going to be. Yeah, I'll play through the I'll play through the game and I play through the section that you played a few times and I'll be like, oh, that's where you know Jack pops up, and then I'll be running around and suddenly in one playthrough where he didn't bust through a wall very much like nemesis or mr x from resident evil 2 uh -huh. like oh now or the kool-aid man yeah. or the kool-aid man oh yeah uh and and suddenly he's busted through this wall so that's that's jack um and he's usually wielding like a some sort of some farm sort thing. of like farm tool yeah, yeah like a shovel or a um farmer's daughter yeah he's and, a shovel knight yeah thanks ben um and <laughs> i've been playing shovel knight again recently actually i still it's love good that game, game by the way and then there's marguerite baker um both of these characters we meet at the the dinner table, and they're um, in love. Yeah, you can they tell they are they are husband and they're wife, still. Jack and Marguerite Baker. Um, and that's you. Ben mentioned the greenhouse and like this old house, and that's where you encountered Marguerite and a lot of bugs. There's that's a right. yeah, there's yeah. a wonderful grandma figure. Highlight of my life reminds me of the grandma from Beyond Two Souls. She's oh, really got a lot of personality going on Beyond Two Souls. Is a we all know the grandma from yeah, Yadu's Holes, Navajo character. Navajo character, right? Yep, she's at the left of the table in that trailer. And then there's Lucas, uh, Lucas Baker. So we haven't said much about those two. Okay. And focusing on Jack and Marguerite, which Ben got to know really well. That, those are mostly who I encountered throughout my playthrough. Gotcha. As well. Uh, so talking about it being in first person, I noticed there's a lot of stuff that not, you mentioned like it's not like, if you're playing the VR version, they're going to be throwing stuff at you in a 3D movie. But there is definitely some stuff playing in 2D, if you can call it that, where it's like, okay, this is this is made with VR in mind. Like a lot of things, like uh, your hands going in front of your face or like sharp objects being put close to your face, that type of stuff. It's, it's interesting because I've seen those types of elements in like games, like first-person horror games before VR ever existed. Sure. And I feel like that's been like a common thing to kind of make you feel like, oh, this is coming right at me. And, you know, characters putting their hands up on walls and stuff has been, I think, something that's been more and more through the years. But it's just stuff that I think it, I think the game is really scary and that stuff works in, you know, when you're playing the games on your regular TV. And I think it's a little bit more effective, yeah, when you have the headset on. But you you definitely playing the game, you can be like, oh, that in VR is definitely going to be like right in my face. Right, yeah, right. I did uh, feel like when I've played the game in VR previously in other demos, I do feel like more than any other VR games, I've played like a little bit queasier, just a little bit. I'm just curious if that's been, I don't know, how long do you end up playing the game in VR before you kind of want to take a break? I mean, for me, it's just a matter of comfort. Like the, the nice thing is that you can play for like, you can play for a, a half hour, stop, take out the headset and then like play without it for a half hour. So it's like you can play the entire thing in VR if you want. You could play uh, as little as you want. Everyone should at least try it out once if they if they can. But I mean, for me, like, yeah, I'll maybe go like a half hour at a time. Um, but like, that's the cool thing is like, I don't know, VR is still pretty much like a Wild West right now. So there haven't been a lot of, you know, full, like Resident Evil 7 is like on par with like your average Resident Evil length, especially like if you can look back at the classic games. So I haven't, I haven't been in VR that long at a time. I don't think I'm ready yet. Um, but I, I, yeah, I probably go like a half hour, an hour, and then I'll keep playing or take a break and go back in. But as far as like the VR goes, uh, like I mentioned, like the character putting his hands in front of his face, there's something that might connect to another RE game where his hand looks weird and sawed off, like stitched together. But then he also has a, basically a GoldenEye watch oh, that yeah. reminds me of like the fear bracelets from Revelations 2. 
Oh, interesting. Oh, wow. I hadn't actually oh, thought about that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's uh, it's called the Codex, and what this thing does is, so in the classic Resident Evil games, your health was represented by an EKG meter, you know, green for fine, yellow or orange for caution, and then red for danger. So sometimes you'll get a glimpse of it while you're playing, or if you press the inventory screen, you know, he'll raise up his watch, and, and you can see your health. So that's that just health. It's not representing any story content beyond that? It, has, it has some other functionality. Gotcha. Uh, but, you know, to be continued. And yeah. his hand, it looks like it's been cut off. I think you mentioned, like, it's got like, like staples, staples around it. it. Yeah, his hand is actually the hand of Revolver Ocelot. Is that yeah, that explains so, uh, the Cam uh, Clark uh, video? Right. Yep. So he's, all secrets revealed. Sorry, you, you sorry got to us. blow that one. Uh, is, yeah, yeah. Does Ethan back. talk in first person? Yeah. yeah okay. He yeah, he's know. talking. What's he like? What's his personality? Um, I mean, I think that the the goal of the team is definitely to like have it make it feel like you're in the game. But he addresses, you know, he'll he'll call out for his wife or he'll. Uh, you know, comment on like something that was particularly crazy, uh, but he doesn't. He he's not like equip a minute uh, by any means. Yeah. So okay, right on. Stays out of the way. He um, didn't speak much, but when he did, it was like it was pretty good. I thought pretty it, good. It fit. It, it fit with what you would probably say in that situation. That's yeah. what I thought. What did anything stand out to you, Michael? Overall, like did anything surprise you? What you thought you were going into playing Resident Evil Seven versus what you got? Yeah, I think Ben was saying this. I wasn't expecting it to be this much like a Resident Evil game. I was expecting. Huh. I was honestly expecting like PT or something like. Th but there's like herbs and like guns. Like there's. And there's like a good balance of shooting and stealth and horror, and I I wasn't expecting that. I, I didn't really know what I was gonna expect. Right, you just but, thought it was gonna be a little more abstract, a yeah, little bit stranger. And I didn't think the shooting would be as like effect effective's a weird word for it, but you can you have you straight up have to shoot some of the enemies sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. And I saw you get getting pretty deep into the crafting. Yeah, as and well. like I didn't expect. I mean, herbs outside of that, but right. you can the crafting is multi layered. They're called um, herbs. 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 Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm I was going to mention the crafting. The crafting is kind of cool. It you is pick cool. up different like chemical bags, and then you can mix those with herbs or like gunpowder, hmm. and like make either ammo or health restorative items. And uh, but since you kind of use some of the same, you can't make both. Is yeah. what I'm saying all the time. And so you're kind of like torn. Like, do I need more ammo or do I need more health? Like, you're kind of making that decision. It, it, it's kind of like The Last of Us. Where Your you inventory could... feels like tight sometimes. Yeah. You feel like constrained a little bit. And then uh, I saw that Ben would sometimes be like, oh, I need to make some space. I'm like, ah, well, you know what? I got this herb. I got this chemical fluid. Maybe I was waiting for some gunpowder to make some handgun rounds, but I'll I'll make the, the, the medicine so that I can clear up my space a little bit. And like what I like about that from playing a ton of the classic games growing up is like the, the common currency in Resident Evil is like, Health and ammo. You want mm -hmm. a lot of it all the time, and if you want to save ammo, you got to use health, and and usually vice versa. Um, so it's like, all right, well, you have these chemical bags, and like you just have to choose what's what. How do you play? What's more important to you, or what's more useful right now? So you can keep the constituent parts in your item box and come back to them later uh, in case you're running low and decide what you want them to be later on. So yeah. I, I like that element of it. Um, and then you can get like stronger chemical fluids. So you can make enhanced handgun rounds, which for me would like take down the headshots of one of the moldeds from like maybe seven or eight to like two. Nice. Um, wow. How much have you played this game? Have you just played this demo a lot of what I, we're showing here? I have played this section a lot. Yeah. Okay. Like how many times are we talking? Uh, I don't know. Twice. Five or six, maybe okay. something like that. I did find uh, an antique coin at one point that Tim was like, "Well, I haven't found that yet." And I'm like, yeah. "Oh yeah, yeah." You looked. Uh, well, I won't say where it is. Uh, there was a couple of themselves. There but... was a couple parts where even you were saying, "Oh, I haven't even heard that or seen that." And I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Did you... So I did it better. You guys found a basically. Good, you guys found a lot of like eight antique coins or something like that. Uh, I think a little more because he yeah. had a number. Yeah. Did you ever notice the details in the grandma's face as much as when I was playing? <laughs> ben, you spent so much time. So the left, the left trigger um, will bring up. So when you're holding a gun, it'll aim. But when you have like a melee weapon or you're unarmed, you kind of raise your arms to guard yourself and it can yeah. soften a blow a little bit. But it also kind of maybe looks like you're reaching out. And Ben spent an inordinate amount of time just trying to like caress the gram, like the, the old lady's face. Um, and I, uh, I thought that was Ethan's wife. I was confused. <laughs> I thought that I found her game right over. away. Roll yeah. credits, everybody. <laughs> we did get it out of here. Is it, is it tough to demo this game? Do you worry about people cracking too many jokes? You want it to be moody? You want it to be scary? I mean, the goal is for people to get scared, but like the ideal way for me to always play a Resident Evil game is like headphones on, like the shades are down and it's nighttime and I'm alone. And like that's... Obviously, we're there with you, and you guys are both playing right. it. So headphones, you're not going to get a comically large pair of headphones and, and share it. Uh, so it's like, 
We could but have, I still though. saw you guys jump a little bit regardless, and you guys cracked some jokes. Like, that's yeah. how I played Resident Evil. Like, there's always going to be corny moments sometimes. And these ba- the Baker family has a ton of personality, but there's some lines in there that, like, are genuinely funny. Are genuinely, they're, <laughs> they're like, unexpected and just kind of like, these guys are really weird. I, oh, sorry. I, I, did, I did jump a few times, probably more than anyone in the room combined, but there's some decent, non-cheap jump scares, I thought. Well, good. I'll be damned. Uh, what have you learned about game development? Over oh, at Capcom, Tim? It is, I mean, so obviously I'm not nuts and bolts like uh, in the code of the game or anything like Wait, that. you didn't I'm make on the, the game, whole game yourself? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, oh, sorry, Michael. Oh, I should have said that. You should uh, just make sure to cars that. Yeah. nuts and bolts? Yeah, that's right. Oh, Banjo-Kazooie game. Um, I need to get back around to that. Uh, I, Good game. I <laughs> am on the marketing team. Good game. It's good but, game. <laughs> but it's fun seeing how much like this, you know, certain elements of this game have changed from like encounter to encounter, you know, like certain certain battles with Jack, which are like, you know, really dramatic moments have, have changed so dramatically uh, across the course of the game. So just like checking in, getting a new build and seeing where the team is deciding to focus and polish up a certain part, you know, seeing which part they, they clearly thought like this, this part works, we're going to stick with this um, or just moving around items, you know, in the mansions, just like, uh, like, oh, I don't know where to go now. It's almost like playing a remix mode uh, it's just constantly evolving. It's That's like, gotta be interesting. It's, it, what's bizarre to me, and this is like the nerdy thing, is like the the bakers kind of like play with you and like move things around in the house and like are are kind of they know the mansion really well and they've altered it and they 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 play tricks on you. Um, and it's just like kind of like that in a meta level where like the game code is changing. So hmm. I'm getting more and more familiar with it, but things change. Uh, Do you have dreams about it too? Like you're locked in the house and what? Am I not dreaming now? <laughs> Oh my well, God. Tim, so get up, come Tim, on, oh, right, right up, here we go, Jack, right sorry, uh, uh, anyway, yeah, get your hand uh, off my I, I have, I've, I've learned a lot, um, but it turns out that shipping games is hard work, uh, and in the end, we just, like, want to make stuff that people really love, and I hope that, I hope that they do. Here's I, a, here's a softball, Tim, how are you feeling about Resident Evil 7 at this point? So, I'm excited that we can talk about the stuff that we showed today, yeah. because when I first started at Capcom, I remember sitting down. And it was very casual. It's just like, hey, we should get you familiar with Resident Evil 7. Like, let's go. That's what's next. I didn't know there was going to be another Resident Evil game. Like, the only thing that had been announced is like, hey, Resident Evil 2 remakes in pre-production now or in concepting. And uh, I'm like, I, th- I figured that's what I would be working on first. Um, and then I sat down. I was like, this is Resident Evil 7. And it's a first-person game. And, you know, it's uh, I was playing parts where I was unarmed. You know, like how you started off and you're unarmed, being stalked around by Jack. I'm like, what? What's what is this? Like, I understood the, some of the the concerns and 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 maybe some of the reservations that some fans had about like the direction of the series. And there's one moment in this particular section when I was sitting in that office at Capcom by myself and like, oh, this is Resident Evil. It's after you encounter the first molded enemy and you pass like a super dark staircase leading into the basement and get into another save room. The save room music starts playing. There's a trunk. You get like a lock pick. Okay, I got my herbs. And I started planning for, you know, loading the shotgun. I started planning for my like trek into the basement. And I'm like, and it felt deliberate and I was kind of nervous about it. I'm like, oh, this is Resident Evil. Yeah. Um, and I want to say like, I was that, or am, that deliberate fan who's just, oh, not deliberate, but just hesitant of where the series was going to go from here. Mm-hmm. And after that demo, I feel very confident in what I saw that it'll keep what I wanted and kind of shake off what I just... Des- didn't necessarily like from the old games. Cool. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Ben, ben, like you and I have spent a lot of time, uh, Ben Reeves, I'm pointing and looking at, uh, playing Resident Evil games. I feel like we were two of like, the bigger Resident Evil fans in the office when I was here. There's probably 600 hours of you guys playing uh, Resident Evil games and Game Informer videos in the past. Somewhere. That's true. Out there. Um, somewhere. So I'm really curious to, you know, read your preview and stuff and see what you think when I'm not in the room. I'm not going to let you read it. Oh, no, you're no. going to... Yeah, sorry. Some weird... You don't get to proof it anymore. <laughs> alien language appears for me. That's right. Uh, um, well, but, speaking of you not being in the room, I feel like we should move on to some other yeah. games. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I'm sorry we have to let you go. No. Uh, you're welcome back at any point, especially because we hit $50,000 of Extra Life. You're I, coming back. I wanted to say uh, yeah. congratulations. I oh, watched as much you. of it as I could, uh, and I had this, like... This dual thing where it's just like, oh, I feel like I'm learning a lot from just watching it and like couldn't stop thinking of like, oh man, like this is working so well. Yeah. Best, the best show out there as far as like the extra life stuff goes. Wow. Thank you. You guys did an Thank awesome you. job. I love the pie stuff. Thanks for joining us too. Yeah, yeah. We're playing it. some Dead Rising too. Uh, I really want to make it happen for next year. I want to eat some more 
ghost peppers. I like to eat ghost pepper pie. I like to get pied. I always oh. want to get pied in the face. Ghost pepper uh, pie. Wait, you're saying you want to come out for next year? I would love to. If I can make it, I, I guess now I'm saying it into a microphone. Well, how much That's money right. do we need you to, just raise swore to, it. to make you that swore happen? It. Ooh. Oh, I'd like the idea. Oh, man. If we could do some early goal and like raise some more money for it, like. That'd be awesome. But the money will have to go to your yeah. plane ticket. That's but outside true. of that, right. other than that uh, idea. before we go, can I just do the the top level shameless plug deets oh, about it? God, this is going to be excruciating. Because we <laughs> talked about we talked about PSVR a lot. I just okay. want to make sure like they, these guys played it on PlayStation Pro on like a 4K TV. So we have PlayStation Pro 4 Pro support. You can play it on PlayStation 4. It's the same game. Uh, one just looks a little bit clearer if you are uh, like to be on the bleeding edge of, edge of technology. Um, so same game, whether you play in PSVR or not. And that's also coming on Xbox one and PC. So, uh, Day and date? yeah, it's going to be, yeah. All multi-platform launch on January 24th next year. So it there we look, go. It did look damn disgusting on that pro. It looked good. In Thank a good you. way. In a disgusting good way. Yeah, that game good. is disgusting. Yeah. Anyway. There's a lot of food. That's my piece. Thanks. I'll look forward to listening to the rest of the show. Yeah, yeah. it should be fun. Yeah. Uh, do you want to help us do a clap transition here for everybody? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So we're doing it after three. So one, two, three. All right, all wow. those jokers are gone. We got a brand new batch, a hot new batch in here. Hey, the other big game we're going to be talking about is a game called Final Fantasy XV. So we have the 15 crew. We have Andrew Reiner. Hello. He wrote the review. We yes. have Joe Juba. That's me. Whose voice is raspy at this point by talking about Noctis' <laughs> adventures. And then J.V. Gwaltney, Final Fantasy XV expert. Yeah, I mainlined like <laughs> seven hours of it last night. Did you really? That's so sweet. Thank yeah. you so much. I'm glad that you did. Uh, we're constantly looking for new opinions in Final Fantasy 15, and I think we've exhausted every person in the office, and we came down to JV. <laughs> yeah. to I thought you brought him because he has the Final Fantasy hair. <laughs> nah. Oh, yeah, no. he fits right in. Yay. Yeah. Okay, let's all just acknowledge that we now live in a world where Final Fantasy 15 is on store shelves. It's really weird. Yeah. Also, at the same time, all of our hairs are turning gray. <laughs> We're getting less attractive every day to the opposite sex or the same what? sex. I don't know about that. Yeah, I, I don't, don't know. know Maybe that. for you guys. Andrew Reiner, mm -hmm. what did you score Final Fantasy 15? 8.5 out of 10. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. All these years of development, and it comes down to that number. Yeah. Well, this they is thought, amazing. you know, if they hit 10 years of development, <laughs> they're going to get a 10. <laughs> you know, that was their reasoning. Is that, that was what they the said on process. the cover trip, Joe? Yeah, yeah. I mean, normally, <laughs> I, as reviews editor, are, are, you know, my policy is a point per year of development. And that's why yeah, when yeah. back in the day when the Square team used to make a Final Fantasy every year, like, it took one year to make Final Fantasy VI. That's why it, unfortunately, got out of 1 out of 10. Yeah, that's why, it, that's why it's so bad. And it was done. 15 was done when it, seven year, you know, seven years in, and they're like, we don't want a 7. Right, <laughs> right. We want a 10. This but. is logical. Okay, here Here's, here's my read. Um, it seemed like Miller played a lot of the game before. Uh, we talked about it on this podcast a couple weeks ago. He was cautiously optimistic, I think it's fair to say. And I was like, okay, I'm going to play all this. This is good. Then as you started this review, Reiner, there was a lot of walking back into the bullpen and saying, oh, I don't know about this. I don't yeah. know about this. And just to the point where I had written it off completely, like, it's sad. I guess I just won't play 15 because Reiner seems to be the mini Conan O'Brien storming around the office talking about <laughs> what a disaster it is. And then the review comes out and you gave it an 8.5. Yeah, so I don't do these walks often where I'm like perplexed by a game. I mean, I walk around the office to see what you guys, Yahoo's are working on, all that stuff. But uh, it's just points where I'm like, something will happen and I'll just put the controller down and just be like, what is going on? Like, it's breaking my brain. So I'll just kind of walk around the office and talk through it with other people. <laughs> Story-wise? Uh, Systems-wise? Systems-wise. In particular, we're starting on a very negative note, by the way. But for a game that I gave an 8.5, but the car. The car <laughs> is the reason I was walking around. We'll leave it at that. How about that? We'll get back to it in a bit. Okay. The car. I hate that thing. Naturally. Like, it is baffling like i, Let's I think just, i use we can that start word. out negative we're gonna get to the wide range of sure. the final 15 spectrum joe you mentioned that the car changed from when we played it in japan right so from what i remember what we played in japan our controls like the control of it was still a little limited but you had at least the opportunity to go off road it Maybe. wanted it like pulled you gravitationally towards the road but you could totally go off road right and like you can't anymore it's like like you are on the road, and even though you can like you can sort of control what lane you're in, and you control like where you turn and how fast you're going. You don't really well, have fast is fifty miles well, an hour tops, yeah. sixty with an upgrade. Those cops are brutal in oh man, Narnia. All that, where's this gonna be? Okay, first? you control your acceleration and deceleration. <laughs> okay, and uh, 
and where you turn. But for the most part, the car is is more of like a an on rails sort of experience. Like if you hit turn, it auto turns. You are not controlling that turn. Yeah, it feels like a really long theme park ride. Like especially <laughs> when you have to go across the map. Well, that's the thing. That's your main beef, then, Reiner. Right? Is just spend so much time in that car. Yeah, and there's it's like picture like Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, the countryside where. There's like two paths through that area, right? There's yeah. not a it's not a city where there's blocks everywhere where you can turn or go wherever. There aren't a lot of roads in this game. So they want you to like I get the design. They want you to feel like you're on this road trip, you're hanging in this car with these your friends. They don't really talk to each other a lot in the car, which yeah. I anticipated like if I was designing that game it would have been like we got to make sure like for 10 minute rides for five minute rides for three minute rides. We have a ton of dialogue and we could just cycle those in just random things they could be talking about, but they don't. Instead, Gladiolus will be in the backseat reading a book. That's what you see. And it's basically the game's basically telling you like, hey, do something else. I mean, because like, yes, the first time through, you're like soaking in the environment. Oh, look, that crystal's cool. The sight line's really nice. Oh, look at that weird rock structure. The second time you're like, there's that crystal again. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny that you say that because earlier I've been playing it at work today a bit and there was a ride that was five minutes long through the same place I'd already been. So yeah. while I was doing that, I just took off my headphones and started like checking my email and setting up appointments and stuff while the game kept going in the background. Well, pro tip See, from the developers, they recommend that you play the Final Fantasy 15 spin-off iPhone games while driving around <laughs> the car. Sure. I remember that specifically from the visit. <laughs> See, and for me, I think that uh, th th this actually didn't bother me as much as it bothered Reiner and, and some other people out there, but um, I think that the lack of conversation in the car is really the big problem. Like, like I would not mind taking these longer car rides through places that I'd seen already if I was getting new content yep. from the characters. You know, like mm -hmm. if I was getting more insight into like their backstories or or even just like their relationships or. It wouldn't even have to be that deep. I mean, just if they had more very dumb interactions about, like, I don't know, some guy lets one rip in the back seat and everyone's like, oh, come on. Or 99 bottles of beer on the wall oh, every man. time you're in the yeah. car. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just just some, just something just something to, like, fill that space. Because I, I think when you add in the length of some of the rides and just the sort of, like, uh, barren, uh, you know, landscape both <laughs> – uh, orally and visually, then th th then it gets to be a problem. But orally, you can pipe in some classic tracks from Final Fantasy, right? Oh, and I love it. That seems that really is, cool. Although, is, the one thing, as great as it is, is they have all these classic tracks to listen to from all these classic Final Fantasy games. If you pick a song, the next time you get in that car, it's going to be on that song again. They have no randomization system in there. Yeah, they do. There's a shuffle. Well, you could shuffle, but if you don't do that, if you have the track set, you get back in the car, it's going to start that track again. Okay. That seems pretty nitpicky, Ryder. Like, yeah, like, hey, I'm just saying, like, again, it's a weird thing. Like, Grand Theft Auto, you get in the car, it just picks a random station for the random car, whatever, right, and it right. goes. Where, But this isn't a radio. This is no, like a playlist. But, yeah, but and, it's and like, for me, at least like, when pick I, it up at the end of where my song was then. It's on the Final Fantasy VIII track. Um, the other, I don't know, like, for me, when I think about a game like, like, when I play Grand Theft Auto, for instance, even though in a game like that, it, it gives you full control over the car, you still have five minute rides where you need to go from sure. point A to point B, where all the, like, you're maybe hitting some pedestrians or some, you know, street lights or something along the way. But for the most part, like, like that, the experience of driving from point A to point B in the GTA game is also, in my opinion, like, is also sort of similarly, uh, you know, like, like uneventful. Except you get to say that you're directly controlling. Well, which is the, important. The, which well, is a big thing. It, you are di directly controlling it, but they've also thought about like, even that isn't enough where they have for a lot of points in missions in Grand Theft Auto from point A to point B, they will have dialogue that takes place that entire time. And if you screw up, they will have a different dialogue yeah. strain. Sometimes three different ones. Pre, I mean, people may never even see that, but they're so worried about people getting bored in that moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I guess, oh, real quick, I, I, I wanted to bring that up just like, I'm not saying that the way Final Fantasy 15 does it is like the best or the right way. Because mm -hmm. like, I mean, I acknowledge like, yes, that like they could be doing that better. But to me, it's not this like, it, it, it's not some, 
horrible misstep that like kills the momentum of the game for me. It's like I gotcha. get there and it's like, ah, I wish they would have done this better. But for the most part, I don't I don't mind the car ride. So well, much. let's head off YouTube commenters at the pass here, which is all I think about now when recording this podcast. <laughs> what is the best uh -oh. thing about Final Fantasy 15? Let's go from the worst to the best. Okay, so yeah, the villain is the car. The, regal <laughs> the regalia, that's the villain Don't of the game. Don't spoil the ending. What oh, are you doing? Sorry. Yeah, it transforms into a mech. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's uh, the best part is the time you spend with your friends in the game, like your party, those those four characters, Noctis, Prompto, Ignis, and Gladiolus. Uh, the chemistry they develop on this, this journey, even if they aren't talking to each other in the car, there is so much... Uh, relationship building in this game and character dynamics and you get to know them their past there'll be moments where they'll just you'll be doing something and all of a sudden prompt will be like hey noctis hold on you got a second and you'll just be like oh we're having a conversation you get some choice in how you're dealing with them you know mm -hmm. like you kind of dictate like am i a dick or do i like this guy uh but in those moments you really get to know him like whoa he's he's got some some baggage you know like there's there's some things here and then also you get to know them on a their interests, this is something you rarely see in games, is like Prompto's really into photography. Mm. And that comes up throughout the entire game where he is photojournaling your entire uh, uh, quest uh, to marry the Lady Luna, right? Mm -hmm. And as anytime you go to rest at, at night, you see all the photos he's taken that day. And I'm interested, like, I still haven't figured out, maybe you know, Joe, if they're randomized. Like, obviously some of them are not, but like, there'll be pictures from battles that look like, oh, this is just a random screenshot that Prompto was positioned here and took a yep. battle mm -hmm. of, like, some of them are obviously staged, especially, sure. like, mission-specific ones. But, you know, if they have a mix of that in there, that is super cool. Yeah, because there will be times where, like, a tree is blanketing the screen. So all I see is, a like, digitized, like, uh, really pixelated leaves. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice shot, Jack. Yeah. Oh, we, <laughs> we saw one <clears throat> when we were recording a video yesterday of, I think, of, like, Gladio with his face practically, like, up a gorilla's butt. He was, like, so close to it. So it's like, yeah, there's some funny But little... you get to learn why he's so into gorilla's butts. Yeah. <laughs> but it's things like that. And then Ignis is really into cooking. And anytime he sees someone, like, at a diner eating something new, he's like, whoa, new whoa stop the presses, new recipe. I, I'm going to make this for you guys. It's going to be amazing. My favorite moment so far was actually at a diner where we had fries. Like, that's it. Mm -hmm. Just basic fries with ketchup. And suddenly Ignis just breaks out his notebook. It's like, <laughs> I got to write this <laughs> down. It's fries like, really? Ketchup. Fries? All right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like that was the moment that I really, it's, a, it's pretty fascinating to me how quickly I went from, all right, this is kind of cool to, I love these characters. Like, it's pretty much like the first time you set up camp. It is really weird for, like, a AAA game to have, like, all these animations and stuff dedicated to a bunch of dudes, like, setting up camp. Because it's like a minute and a half sequence of them <laughs> propping a tent, starting a fire, getting ready, cooking some stuff. Yeah. And it's just really cool. And is it just the overall concept of getting to know these four people so well? Or is it specifically you think the writing really carries through? I think it's both. Yeah, it's both. Really? Yeah. So you know, far, yeah. Yeah, Prompto, and, I would say, is is he's a little high strung. He's a little over the top, annoying. But that kind of it's kind of like Titus in, in 10, where you're like, ugh, who is this guy? But by the end of the game, you're like, I love that guy. You and know? I'm glad like, that whiny wiener's dead. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's not even just Prompto. Like, all of them are annoying in their own way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're also... they. This is what makes them feel like real people in a way is like, you know, yeah. they have, you know, their good sides and their bad sides. Like, um, uh, Ignis is, uh, he's super annoying, like a lot of the time because he's got that butler thing going on, he but he also me. makes you food. Yeah, he's he got reminds the... me of you, actually. Oh, <laughs> there we go. There we go. Also, tone. Yeah. yeah, it's the same tone. A deep tone? Yeah. Yeah, he's got that voice. I can and you're that. kind of like our office butler. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I bring you like hors d'oeuvres all the time to your desk. It's perfect. Yeah. Also on this front too, I think it's like, I think the writing is good, but I think they also use these opportunities. Like it, it's not actually writing in which some of the character person personalities come out. Like, right. Like Reiner mentioned, like Gladio pulling out a book. He's like the big, he's like the big muscle bound guy, you know, like he's the warrior. And yet. When you're on long car rides, he's the one who's just like, hmm, sitting there and like pulling out a book that adds, you know, it's like they don't make a big deal out of it, but it's just a thing that you see that adds a little bit of like dimension to him or things like, let's say like Noctis is like, oh, about to fall off a cliff or something. And like, who's the one who's like there to grab him as he's about to fall? That's Gladio. So it sort of establishes it like in ways like that, they establish him as the protector sort of character without him being like 
hello, Noct, I'm your protector. I'll do that for you because I'm your protector. You know, mm-hmm. it's like it, it, they don't need to be so explicit. They do a lot with just like, you know, showing and not telling. Too. It's like Steiner, except with more depth. Uh-huh. uh-huh. It, and it gets to a point where they start shuffling in different side characters that help out or one of your characters might leave and you feel like separation at that moment or like if there's someone else with you like a fifth wheel you're like get Get out out of here we got this (laughs) yeah i just got to a point where a character shuffled in and i'm like i really don't like you you're you're messing up our vibe here i didn't know they did that yeah Yeah. is it a big thing are you battling with five people Mm -hmm. yeah yeah wow there are a few parts yeah joe how much have you played so far uh it's it's hard to gauge i'm about 22 hours into it but Story wise, I'm not super far because I dug really deep into side quests and stuff as soon okay. as the world opened up. So you knew so much about this game going into it. What surprised you, Joe, about what you've played so far? Boy. Um I mean, for me, the the big the big thing, the big unknown was the character stuff that we've been talking about. So I'd, yeah. I mean I'd have to stand with that probably as, as being sort of like my favorite or the most impressive part. But um I think beyond that, I was a little worried about the combat system. Yeah. Um as someone who I mean, I, I always, I've always appreciated the Final Fantasy approach that I mean, even, even in like the 13 games where there's a real time element to it, it's still largely, there's still a big strategic part also. And like, mm-hmm. this feels like it goes a lot more towards just like a straight up action, uh, action angle on it, you know, like, like instead of looking at an enemy and being like, oh, they're weak to fire. So then you're going to like scroll through your things and choose fire. It's like you can find out that an enemy's weak to fire or but they might also just be like weak to broadswords instead of daggers or something. So it's all about so you're switching to the like those weaknesses on the fly and like going in and like trying to get behind them and like hook up as many like back attacks as you can. Uh, You're commanding your link attacks. Yeah. Yeah. The link attacks. You're commanding your party members. There's this meter in the corner that like fills up. And when you get like uh, a bar, you can command one of your allies to do an attack and then they eventually learn attacks that take you know more than one bar out of it but it fills up quickly enough that it's not a thing like wrath of the gods in god of war where it's like once every few battles you're doing i mean we're talking multiple times per fight you're be you're saying like you know prompto shoot a gravity ball over there gladio do a big like swipe with your sword and these are like animations that just sort of like interrupt combat and get in there and uh you know, like, like it, it just cha- it changes up the dynamic. It seems weird. It seems like you're saying it's so different from the normal Final Fantasy turn-based system, but it's a good thing because there's well, so much to do. Doesn't that seem like the opposite end of the it spectrum? It actually feels like a weird amalgamation of the two, where you still feel like you have the the little details in the turn-based stuff, where it's like, okay, I'm going to heal now. Okay, he's going to get an elixir. Okay, now we're going to time in two seconds. I'm going to unleash. Gladio's big attack, sword mm-hmm. attack to take these guys down. Then I'm going to come in with a link as they're as he's down. Like you feel like you're still strategizing at a really high level, but at the same time you feel like you're playing like a Devil May Cry or God of War because it's really twitchy. You're doing a lot of evasive action. Yeah, um, not just switching up weapons, but you're always rolling. You're always trying to get a counter set up, and that's all twitch time-based uh, reflex stuff. Yeah, yeah, I was actually super impressed with it because I didn't play any of the mini demos that released of this. So I was going into this fresh and it seemed really intimidating at first, that combat system, the first time you get in there and it's like, oh, this is reflex-based. Yeah. And I have to memorize all these systems, but it's also one of those systems where you just adapt quickly. It's really easy to slide into and physically know what you need to do, where you need to be. And it's also... it's. It's good at being, um, like, it's very chaotic when you first start, I feel like, and, but it's also not so demanding. It's not so hard at the beginning. So even though there's a lot of, like, chaos going on, it gives you enough opportunity to sort of make sense out of it. And, like, okay, why are these things happening the way they are? When are these happening? So by the time that, you know, the sort of, I feel like the combat, like, kicks in and sort of expects more of you, you don't learn it all. There is a tutorial, but you don't learn it through tutorial. You just sort of learn by like jumping into the deep end and figuring right. it out. It seems complicated. Were you turned off by it for a while, Reiner? Oh, no. No. Oh, okay. it, it, I mean, that was my favorite part right out of the gates. You know, it was the car, the flat tires on that bastard. But <laughs> uh, the the combat right away, I was like, okay, there's something really special going on here. Like, it, this is neat. It feels good. Like, it's not, you know, there is a bit of glue when you're doing your attack and it kind of pulls you into an enemy. But at the same time, it's very range-based too. Right. Like you're going to get different weapons that 
just on the fly, you're switching like, okay, now I need to be two meters away or this one I can do from four or this one's my long range. Like you're really kind of mixing that in with all these other strategies. Yeah, it's very combo driven is what it feels yeah. like. Yeah. And I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, I was, uh, I don't know. I've always been turned, JRPGs are not my favorite genre. It's, it's a genre I have a pretty strong uh, apathy towards. I've played like three Final Fantasies to completion. Uh, so That's pretty good. Yeah, and I and I feel like the reason that gets in, I feel like the battle systems in those games often get in the way of that. Like I just do not love like the menu based battle system of you know send out an attack, wait for everyone to take their turn. Like that's just not my thing. So this battle system is one of the big reasons. Like I'm really into this game. Like I I stayed up till five a.m. playing it. Like I I really I'm really digging it so far. Wow. And Ben, you said like what I wanted to say is like you, it sounds complicated when we're when we're here like trying to describe it in words but like really it's it, it's not that hard once you're actually into it i mean it's 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 really just a question of like like finding the right weapon to attack your enemy with trying to get your position right and dodging when mm -hmm. the the you know yeah. when when you can i mean and, seriously think god of war you know yeah, like really okay. all those different weapons when you when kratos has those it's very similar to that right but with a lot of RPG undertones kind of guiding it. And right? I right. saw some people talking about, or I think even on the podcast, we talked about like fighting inside can be a mess and the camera can be a mess in combat at times. Is it that much of a hassle or just eh, not great? It's not for me. It's not great. Like sometimes the camera will get stuck, especially when characters do link attacks. Like the camera will actually get stuck there for a second after the link attack is done and you're trying to move around. Yep. Uh, but on the whole, you know, it's not like awful. Okay. It's not terrible. There'll be things they don't do like the uh, translucent environments like trees or walls or stuff. So every once in a while, you'll just have like, like prompto shots to show <laughs> like trees blanketing your view and you're just like, I'm killing an enemy. I haven't seen it yet. I'm trying to switch <laughs> oh, the camera. Oh, it was Gladio the whole time. Oh, God. <laughs> every, every angle is like more brush and trees. Uh -huh. So there are points in the environment that, you know, you, you start thinking of games like Witcher. It's like, oh, the tree canopy is really tall there. This one, it's really, it's right on the ground. You know, the brush mm. is just thick right off the ground. So it's like, okay, that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. But it's not like game ending. You're not going to throw your controller down and be like, this is it. You'll get through it. Yeah. Right. I, it has never been bad at cru like crucial moments or long and bad right. long enough to make a real difference other than just like I mean yeah like 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 they said just sort of like this come on annoying. yeah come uh -huh. on yeah so one of the interesting bits of feedback i heard you uh raving about in the office runner is you said that it has a simple plot yeah. yeah yeah i think you know 13 final fantasy 13 i played that and i was like wow there's a lot to this and then like loading screens would come up and they would be a summary of the story and i was like Oh, that's what's going on. <laughs> like, there's so, points in that game that just, I mean, I followed it closely. It uh -huh. just didn't spell out until you had it smack dab in front of you. My them favorite, telling you. My favorite bit of 13 lore is when they announced 13.2 and we got a press release about it. And it, it said, <laughs> Final Fantasy 13.2 finally solves the prime mystery from Final Fantasy 13. Is lightning happy? <laughs> ah, and everyone's like, "What? That's what that game was about?" Okay. There, there were way bigger questions about that than whether lighting. Yeah, happy. I remember my uh, best friend playing Final Fantasy 13 in college and just watching him and not being able to make heads or tails of the story. And so when 15 was announced and you know we were seeing footage of it, I really liked the idea of it, but at the same time I was super nervous about it being overcomplicated because I just do not have time for overcomplicated JRPG plots. I and mean, they have 10 years to soak in their own lore. Like it's so easy just to assume everyone knows all this stuff. Yeah. So this like one... the simple plot like built on these sort of archetype characters who are mm -hmm. lovable and also this whole thing about, well, here's a prince trying to earn his throne and reclaim his kingdom. You know, that's pretty basic stuff that's also, it resonates, I hmm. feel. Here's where I think the big difference is, is like 13 had this deep, had this ridiculously deep lore fleshed out world that you needed to understand for certain story beats to make sense. Right. Like there was an expectation put on you as a player to dive through these like, tu or not tutorials, but like menu screens to read this like really sort of obtuse stuff and like try and make heads or tails of it. And then, and only then does like what happens in the story really sort of feel satisfying. Whereas I think FF15 still has... A very like very fleshed out characters, a very fleshed out world, but they don't put the burden on you to understand. You can understand what's happening. You can understand the characters and their relationships just by diving in. But if you want to watch the anime, you'll have a better understanding of like how these four friends 
like know each other and what their relationships are like. If you want to watch Kingsglaive, you'll have a better understanding of like King Regis and Luna and what happened in the city of Insomnia. Like, yeah. like it supports all that. But and and I know like whenever any like cross media stuff happens, the companies always say, "Oh, well, we want it. You know, we want to be we want it to support the the core content, but not be required." And mm -hmm. That rarely happens, and I think they did it this time. Yeah, yeah and, I, oh, go ahead. I uh, when I found out I was doing the review, like Joe and I have been talking about it for months, and it was like, okay, I should watch Kingslave, and then it was like, no, I shouldn't. Yeah, I should play the game first. So that's what I ended up doing is getting the impressions of just the lore or the story without any of this extra stuff on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, I followed it perfectly. Like I had no problems. It was so simple. Like like JV said, it is just about. This thing happens. I don't want to give away any plot points, but it's like you got to like get your kingdom back. Yeah, Just it's it's interesting to me because I I did not care about watching that CGI movie at all until I played this game. And now I definitely want to go watch it. There's this awkward point where it feels like there's a cut scene that plays like two hours in that I'm pretty sure is from, it's the, movie. from the movie. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it really? doesn't fit that well into it. It's like. This is totally from that CGI movie. So yeah. it's like some pivotal points from it's the movie point. that, okay. Yeah. It's not, it, putting it as a cutscene isn't exactly right. There's a point in which in the game, someone is describing to Noctis something that happened in the movie. Okay. And what they do, so they keep the sort of voice, of like they keep what's happening in the present, but they're sort of showing a flashback to what happened and that is from Kingsglaive. So you just see the visual from the movie. Yeah. And yeah. In that moment, like Noctis, he doesn't really emote a lot. He's kind of a <laughs> blank slate of, of a character. And I was just kind of like, man, he, that scene was botched. Mm -hmm. But as the game goes on, you kind of learn that's intentional. I'll leave it at that. I won't go into too much, but there are reasons why Noctis is the way he is. And, People should just play the game to see where he goes yeah. as a character. So I feel like we're hitting the story is simple note a lot, but would you describe it as a good story, great story? Yeah, I think it's a good story for what they're, they're not doing anything daring with their storytelling, right? Okay. Uh, there are some big reveals of certain characters pulling the strings and stuff like that are that are interesting and well done, I think, and some interesting characters on the side that I think are really well developed as as good as the the, the core cast, but um, they're not doing anything crazy with it. It is a fine story. It's engaging. You want to see Noctis get to that point and see what happens, right? Goodbye, Noctis in a coma theory is what I'm reading when you say that. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, no, there's there's some cool stuff uh, and some big moments. Like they they like scale in this game. That's one thing I'll say is um, I don't want to give away too much. You guys saw the the Titan, obviously the 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 summon that mm -hmm. you eventually get. That's a huge scale. They showed yeah. that at E3. They play up stuff like that a lot in this game, and it's very cool. Uh, wow. visually and uh, how it affects the world. I, I love it too when you're just like driving around and all of a sudden there's like some enormous monster that's just like, oh, that monster lives there. It's like, I, I'm not going there. <laughs> that thing is huge. I mean, like there's th things Somebody that Somebody call Geralt. Yeah, yeah, pass. Or I mean, well, we saw it in the episode Dusk Guy demo too. It's yeah. Like, like the, the Kato what do you call it? Catoblipus? Catoblipus? The, the big... No one will call you on that. Absolutely. Whatever. Yeah. The, the, there's like that giant thing in the marsh and like, yeah. Oh, we did a feature on that thing even in uh, yeah. uh, for our cover story, and like that's still there. And you walk like what you walk up to it, and it's just like yeah, it's just massive. And it's seeing there. that kind of stuff is. Oh, yeah, I, I fish near that. those guys. Yeah, I caught a bass. Oh man, I love how much Noctis <laughs> loves fishing too. It's that's really a, cute. Yeah, yeah, I like that the fishing <laughs> tutorial. <laughs> minor, minor spoiler: the fishing tutorial is presented as, hey, there's this hungry cat. You need to prepare a meal for it. Oh, gosh. So you that's... go catch a fish, and then you have to, like, then you take it to a <laughs> chef who's like, there's this cat that's hungry. Will you please cook this fish yeah. for it? The cat doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> I've trained for dozens of years as a professional chef. I have a better use of my time than feeding a straight cat. The cat's cat, probably so. like, bring it to me live. Like, part of what I love is killing it, and then I'll eat it. Uh, yeah. But on that note of the cat, <laughs> the... <laughs> But no, what, what they do with the side content, it's very separate from the story. And I think that's where, again, the story succeeds is you don't have like stuff branching off of it. All these side activities are very individual, like on their own, will never intersect. It's like, go catch frogs. Uh, so on that front, as far about side activities and everything, Phil Kohler, who used to be a game former over at Polygon, he described this game in a positive way, but he described it as a mess. 
And I'm curious about that. That's actually kind of exciting to me that it's just this weird hodgepodge collection of systems and it ultimately is great, but it's rickety. Is that yeah, fair? Absolutely. Like yep. it feels like a game that's so I mean, again, I'm less than 10 hours into it, but it, so far it feels like a game that's bursting at the seams <laughs> with like ideas and some of them aren't implemented that well, like the car, uh -huh. but you know, there's just so much weird stuff in it. Like it's constantly exciting. Like yeah. it's around every corner. There is something new that is odd or peculiar in an interesting way. On a systems level. Uh, yeah, I'd say. As I put it to Joe, it reminds me of playing Grand Theft Auto 3 for the first time in that it is like, they are trying some really new daring stuff. They're not trying to replicate a lot of open world stuff. They're trying their own thing. They're doing this road trip. Um, part of the game is open world. A third of the game is completely linear. You just don't see that kind of stuff in these games. Like They really take some chances and they fumble a lot of that stuff. But at the same time, there's something really unique here. I don't get it. So I've heard you can make this comparison mm -hmm. to Grand Theft Auto 3. Like, that's one of like the top five most innovative games of all time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I they don't understand. They're trying something new in the RPG What space. is it? I mean, they've done open worlds. Is just the combination of the open world with then just, shifting to a linear format? No, or? just everything they, pretty much everything they attempt here. Like, like we talked about combat meshing with RPG conventions. How they even handle the open world of trying to make you feel like you're on this big, long road trip. You know, those things... Yeah. are cool in concept and in the storytelling context really work, but on the gameplay end, they don't. Whereas there's so much here, like uh, the the big boss battle. Like, again, I don't want to go into too much stuff, sure. but there are some big moments in this game, that, like JV said, that are a whole new idea that's just thrown at you and you're just like living in the moment going, holy crap, that just happened. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of, again janky a little bit <laughs> right it looks amazing it's spectacular but they try so much new stuff and I, I really appreciate this about this game that they're not just like this works let's do it gamers like this it, they didn't have a checkbox you know a checklist of just marking them off like make sure we have this they really tried something new and that's where i think it feels like grand theft auto where like hey let's bring this top-down experience let's really try to flesh it out in a big way yeah it feels uh you know because we talked about a, another game uh that tries new things, like Mafia 3, but Mafia 3 tries new things in an old box, you know, and it doesn't work because all of the stuff that's old feels like a game from like nearly two decades ago. Right. It's just like so old, but here it feels like everything is new yep. or trying something new. Like nearly everything, everything you're going to do feels newish or has like a new perspective to it. And that's why I hope like Rockstar, they can come back. I hope they keep this foundation, not necessarily just make another 15 2 or you whatever. Mean square? Yeah, but Square comes back like Rockstar does with the Grand Theft Autos. Okay. Get another chance. You saw where that series went and evolved. Man, if they if they kept working on this formula, it could be but incredible. I mean, okay, here, please, let, Joe. I'm, I'm, let, I I thought of a, a way that I that I can explain this to you, and that's like when we were when we were on that cover trip. Uh -huh. They were they did a lot of talking about like trying to like discard their pride a little bit. At, at, like as a studio, Square Enix and the yeah. Final Fantasy team, they feel like they it felt like some of the ways that the series had gone wrong was by like uh, them as a company assuming that they knew better than fans in of, as far as like what is Final Fantasy, what like what do people want? Yeah, and um, that I guess that that's another instance where I feel like they they actually pulled that off in the sense like you you play this game and the willingness. The willingness to deviate from what Final Fantasy has always been and what people always expect from it to just sort of like throw in is like, hey, let's see if like, hey, let's let's put a car in here. A car has never been like a major part of Final Fantasy, but like that's what we want this to be. And even if the trips feel a little long, I mean, I'm sure that there's also a sort of like balancing there is like, well, the trips are long and that's going to bother some people. But it also really like hits home this idea of like a road trip and these people yep. like bonding over time. But so no we're fans keep were it in there. asking for it, something like a car. So well, no, no that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you do exactly what the fans are asking. What I'm saying is it felt like some of the overconfidence that. I think led to games like the Final Fantasy 13 games where it's just like, well, we know what makes a good Final Fantasy. It's this. Blank. And, you know, it's been tested over years. This is what we're going to so do. So just trying new stuff again. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it feels, again, I don't, I guess I don't feel like Reiner does that 
every step of the way felt like some big innovation. Well, in, that's what he said. In, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, like, to me, it doesn't, as a whole, it feels innovative. Like, putting mm -hmm. all of these pieces together in the way that they are assembled is new. But, like, yeah, it's not new to have an open world. It's not new to put your characters in a car. It's not new to have side quests all over the place. But just, like, the ratios, the way right, that yeah. it's all assembled and and under the Final Fantasy banner. And how they approach it. You know, like, yeah. like that whole road trip concept. Would it work if you controlled the car? I don't know. You know, like, that's yeah. just something we wouldn't know. But, uh, yeah, it just has such a unique thing. And, it's again, it's baffling at times where you're just like, why can I fast travel here, but I can't fast travel there? Like, what is your logic here? Yeah. There's just certain things in this game where you're just like, there's a instantly warp to the car option, but if you're in a dungeon, you have to warp to the beginning of the dungeon first, and then from there, you got to warp to the car. And it's like, why not just give me the car option there? Because you know what I'm going to do. Like, yeah. it, it reminds me a little bit of like, not to say this is just a Japanese thing, but I think studios going for an open world for the first time, like of Metal Gear Solid Five, and people that are used to open world games are like, this is just a little bit different and a little bit quirky and strange, and then trying new things in there. Is that yeah. a fair analogy at all, Joe? Yeah, I think so. I mean, an another thing, especially with the car driving around, is that like, I get vibes of deadly premonition from this. Also. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, in that, And again, like, I, I love deadly premonition, by the way. So that's a, supposed to be a favorable comparison in uh -huh. that, like, you know, there are just some sort of like, you have some important thing you should be doing, but at the same time, like, hey, I'm going to go do this like weird side quest for someone over here. And like, then you drive to the other part of the map and you do it. And, you know, and there are also weird things that like, oh man, I really wish I could just zoom out on the map and like see where all of my quests are. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have to go through your quest list and then it's like, like, this quest is here. Scroll. This quest is there. It's like, just let me see where my, where I, everything I can pick up and turn in is. There, are, can't there are times where I'll be like, okay, I want to do this mission, but it's a 10 minute, I kid you not, 10 minute car ride yep. that I can't fast travel <laughs> to. So let me see. If I fast travel to this mission point, mm -hmm. that'll only make that ride maybe four minutes. Yeah, it's really So then weird. I'll fast travel there and it's like a minute load. So I cut the time in half. But it's like the moment I start thinking that, someone on that dev team has to be thinking that thing too. And at mm -hmm. that point, the brakes got to be put on it and it needs to change. And if they have fast travel, patch that sucker in. <laughs> Make every option fast travel. If people want to experience the game the way you want it to be, then you never should have put that damn fast travel in. But since you put it there, put it on everything. Right. So it's a personality-soaked, lovable, janky mess of a good game. Yes. Yes. I wouldn't okay. say it's a mess of a game. I mean, okay. I think it's it very feels well like a mess. mess. It's a lot of ideas, but right, I, right. I, I do I think, like, I feel a really strong connection to this this world. Wow, and, okay. Uh, I want to be a part of that. Like, I think that it succeeds in that capacity very well. Uh, but, yeah, there's just some things that just don't work as well. And baffling. Well, uh, that's, yeah. that's the word I put yeah. on it. It's like, baffling at it's times. It's brimming with creativity, but there's a lack of polish, like, everywhere. Pretty yeah, much. Weird. So yeah. there was a certain moment, Reiner, in your daily walk into the bullpen to <laughs> have some new bombastic thing to say about what I was doing, <laughs> where you're like, there's a thing in this game that is the dumbest thing of yeah. all time. Yeah. The dumbest thing in recorded history yeah. of human beings. Yeah, That's too much dumb. of a spoiler. We I know, I know, but that. is there any way you can w is it a detriment to the game? Or it's what the a, hell is like, this that you were talking it's a, about? It's an idea that they their story goes some crazy places and things get messed up and there's points you can't return to. Yet they realize in development, like, they need to return. Okay. How do we how do we solve that problem? And that's what they do. And it is just like, well, if you're doing that, why not do this and this? And it becomes it's, it's a weird story it's conceit. A yeah. It's a weird story conceit to accommodate a gameplay necessity. Okay, thank you. That is exactly the framing that I was looking it, for. It doesn't yeah, it, it throws a lot of kinks in their their lore and their basic logic they're yeah. using in their world. What a weird thing. Yeah. We should it's do... not a mess. It's busy. Busy. Okay, there, busy. there's a great word. Okay. I'm really looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's it has exceeded a lot of people's expectations. And I'll say this again. Like, a lot of people wrote me saying, do I have to know Final Fantasy to get yeah, into this? Yeah. No, absolutely not. This is a full standalone thing you might not get some of the the jokes of like certain characters you meet the you know the 
Sid. I'll take Sid for an example. You see Sid and you're like, oh, that's their version of Sid. You're not going to know about the other 14 versions of him or whatever. Uh -huh. That's all you're missing. Right. The nostalgia. Right. right? Everything else flows like it should. It makes sense. It feels like a new gaming experience. You don't need you know, tutorial 101 or anything like and that. And if you want Just like one of the in. most memorable gaming experiences of the year, it's, it's a good stop for you. Yeah, yeah, I think it really is one of the weirdest, strangest, <laughs> like the <laughs> coolest... Games games this year yeah wow. i just i just ordered the strategy guide today because i realized that like once i finish this game i like i know there's a bunch of post game stuff that you can do also and it's like i'm gonna have to do that like i'm yeah. enjoying this game so much right now that i'm already is, like anticipating like well i'm gonna need, need to spend many more hours with this even after i finish it so i better have the guide to like steer me right. I, th I think the best thing about it is uh the game opens up with every time you load it up, it says, what is it, Joe? A first time, Final Fantasy for first time. Fa for fans and, and first timers. First -timers. And I yeah. feel like that's pretty accurate so far. As someone who doesn't care for Final Fantasy, it's pretty inclusive of people who are like, eh. Yeah. Like, I'm really enjoying it. It's probably one of my favorite games of the year so far. Wow. Parentheses, yeah. tell a friend, please, for the love of Christ, tell a friend about this game. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, hey, great Japanese games discussion, y'all, over this section. And I feel we like there's all another over one the place. coming yeah. up later talking about Pokemon in the Game Club. Woo. But for now, let's move on to some great emails from the community. All right. We're back with some great emails from the community. If you want to send feedback or just overall thoughts, questions, news stories, you want us to talk about anything in the world, uh, send it to podcastagameformer.com. Pictures, uh, just send everything you have really to podcastagameformer.com. Uh, tax returns, <laughs> all right, junk email, credit card, card numbers, numbers whatever social you security Think numbers. Think of us as your deleted items folder. Absolutely, <laughs> podcast. We are your trash, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Matthew Th Th Thice. Well done. He, that he, sounds like a Final Fantasy. That's a lot of A's. That's really weird. Th thighs? Thice? Yeah. So he says, Matthew Dear Game thighs. Informer, I've enjoyed your site's video content for years. Haha, <laughs> video. Uh, but my first interaction with the community was outbidding video editor Wade Wojcik for the autograph Skyhook oh, during the that. Extra Life stream in early November. That was yeah. amazing. This yeah. was the Dan Tack murder weapon. It was a real bidding war, and Dan uh, Wade was pacing around the room trying to outbid this guy. Turns out it was Matthew. He says, my brother is a huge Bioshock fan, and when I gave him the Skyhook, covered in blood and guts and fingers <laughs> and hair that Ken Levine... Like that staple onto it. Uh, but I gave him the skyhook for his birthday. He spent a good half hour just staring at it in disbelief while occasionally yelling obscenities, knowing no gift he would ever receive for the rest of his life could be better. It's over for him. Thank you for this. Time. Nice. Thank you so much for bidding. You I'm paid really, a lot for that, man. Thank you. I'm really glad Wade lost. Yeah, I am too. Uh, he wouldn't have enjoyed it that much. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob Brothers. Wait, he didn't have a question? Uh, we're moving on. That was just a brag, huh? Yeah, I thought it was nice that we got to hear okay. from this guy. Uh, Game Informer, Ben Hansen is the most handsome guy. Oh, we're actually okay, getting that email one. later. Oh, okay. uh, Jacob Brothers from Las Vegas writes in. He says, today I saw that yet another season of Telltale's Walking Dead is coming out before Christmas, which is crazy. Uh, as someone who hates The Walking Dead, this upsets me. <laughs> Where is my Wolf Among Us season two? What other Telltale games would you like a season two for? I mean, Tales from the Borderlands. Do you think they're going to do it? No, absolutely not. Really? I do not think. And I, honestly, I would be okay if they didn't because it ends on a note that it's like, okay, this is fine. It's a standalone thing. Yeah. Or, you know, but I'd be open for a sequel. Uh, yeah. I would say, although we're only four episodes in, Batman. Oh, that's inevitable, though. They are knocking that out of yeah. the park. It's really uh, good. And there's so, rumors that they're doing a Guardians of the Galaxy game. It'll be weird if they keep that I think that's going confirmed on. now, right? Is it? Yeah. Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but it's going to be weird if they keep a DC line going and a Marvel line going at the oh, same time. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm amazed. Yeah, Walking Dead, by the way, coming out before Christmas. It's crazy. And yeah. the teaser image didn't have Clem on it, right? No, Clem is in it. Clem is she's in it. Obviously, she has to be. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but it's she's not in the background. It's not okay. guaranteed that she's your protagonist. No, though, it so. is confirmed she is not your protagonist. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you play someone named Javier. But Clem's with her. Go ahead, Clem. Right. Javier's going to die in the first episode, and then you're, you're going to take over for Clem. Episode yep. two. That's the way We're it's sorry. Work. We take it back. Uh, uh, my, uh, my answer to that, real quick, I want to I want to get a plug in. Life is Strange is not Telltale, but it's a <laughs> similar <laughs> episodic sort count. of thing. already confirmed get season out. two. Come on. You have to give a real answer. Uh, the real, real answer, answer clearly is Wallace and Gromit. And on that, okay. I want another Bioshock. 
<laughs> I'm just saying, like, you're talking about episodic games that could use more. Uh huh. All right. Also, uh, Jacob Brothers says, "What is another series you would love for Telltale to adapt?" Oh man, that's so that's so hard. I still want my biographical game. I want give us some nonfiction Telltale, please. I want Battlestar Galactica. Oh, like a good. standalone Battlestar Galactica. They could nail that. Yep, that'd on, be a, good. on a ship. With, Columbo. Uh, with everyone like <laughs> suspicious of each other about who's the Cylon. That could be fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, that would be good. Uh, the thing on that same note, kind of mm. the same thing. Um, Preacher, I'd like to see him do. Like comic books, they do really well. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I Transmetropolitan to... would be cool. Mm. Uh, man, there's a, there's a ton of things. Yeah, Cor- there's, there's yeah. a ton of comics they could do that could be really cool. Cork and I always talk about, but I would love Twilight Zone. And just not carry the story forward, but each episode is completely different, and then just, awesome. just make everyone so divergent with different options and choices along the way. Oh yeah, like or like a Black Mirror. I mean, yeah, Black Mirror yeah. is sort of Twilight Zone. I know. Also, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it could be fun connected by like a narrator or something. You know, right, like the Twilight right. Zone guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah who's the present Bruner? That's a great idea. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. How that? the, that's the best idea. I've heard handle that here. pig moment. It'd be tricky. Hey, yeah. Mash hit it now. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Anyways, William, uh, this is uh, following a whole thread of Jojuba hate mail for his thoughts on Pokemon. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, but wow. William from Utah writes in and says, with the release of Pokemon Sun and Moon, I'm getting back into Pokemon for the third time in my life. <laughs> oh, that's it. It's always struck me as a strange design to release two versions of the same game. Can you think of any other game that would benefit from a Pokemon-style release model? Like, would Dishonored 2 have more interest if you had a different version of the same game for playing as Emily versus Cor- Corvo as a main character? These things sound like bad ideas to me. <laughs> it sounds like gating off some experience behind an arbitrary extra payment. But how is that not what Nintendo's doing with Pokemon? Is their two-version release model good for players or just good marketing? There's not... I feel like it's just... I don't know anybody personally that is compelled to buy both. Right. I think clearly they're profiting off yeah. it because there are those super fans that feel like they need to collect both. Right, right. I don't see any other justification other than, well, we want to make more money. Like that is that yeah. is what I, I mean, see. It's well, clearly no, content they have. Why not just put it all on one? On because one well, thing? because there's differences where it's like you know, for example, we'll probably talk about it coming up soon with the Pokemon Game Club. But there's differences like in Sun and Moon. It's not just content. It's a varied experience. Like if you play Pokemon Moon and you play during the day in the real world, it's nighttime in the game. Right. Just but weird it, things. That but are it's flipped. the same experience. It's just yeah. Y- Why can't you choose one is. at the main menu? They yeah, want yeah. kids to trade players to trade Pokemon have that kind of social experience. That's why they make these two different versions. It's not to sell two to one person. It's to have that social element where you're like, hey, do you have this guy? I'll trade you this one for that one. Yeah. But to answer his question, I feel like we saw Nintendo trying to do that same thing with Fire Emblem. Exactly. And it failed. Like, well, maybe not for them, but like it just created so much confusion. Like, you know, no one knew what they were getting until that game right. was out and had been reviewed, like, all three versions. And it's such a little thing, but, like, I had so many friends that love Fire Emblem Awakening, mm-hmm. and then it's like, hey, the new Fire Emblem's out. What is this? And, like, just yeah. that confusion's enough to be like, I just won't get it. Right. I like, know. I remember, like, we having to spend, like, what, 20 minutes on the podcast trying to explain the, the difference? 20 longest minutes of my life. <laughs> yep. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, to answer his question, no, no one else should do that. Yeah, no, no, please don't. No one in the history ever. I mean, unless you have an innovative idea, no other game franchise should think about two different experiences yeah. selling the game twice. And actually, Nintendo, please rethink the way you're doing it and don't and stop doing yeah, it. Yeah, stop doing it. Okay, great. Uh, Tyler O from DC says, "Hello, Game Informer crew." This seems relevant for the episode today. After the announcement of Resident Evil Seven being in first person, a lot of people have been claiming this isn't Resident Evil. While I disagree with these people, what is your guys' opinion on this? Can a franchise still be what it is even if it attempts to try and shake up the original formula? I mean, it depends on, like, how far you're going to go when you say shake up the original formula. Because I don't necessarily think, like, putting something in first person as opposed to third person, especially if, like, you know, the basics are still there, is necessarily shaking up the formula that much. Well, I think... I don't know how much we could talk about yet on Resident Evil oh, 7. Oh, yeah, go nuts. You can talk about uh, that. Oh, we can. Okay, yeah. I, I mean, they definitely sold a different vision out of the gates where they're like, it's like more like supernatural horror opposed to mm-hmm. zombie. And it's like ghosts moving around the environment and more jump scares of specters and stuff like that. Whereas now that we see the game, it's, it sticks pretty true to the, the conventions of the series. You're shooting yeah. things in the head and, you know, mm-hmm. like... It looks more Res Evil now, but that initial thing that they they teased was very different. So, um, 
Final Fantasy, I think, is probably more of a, a curveball in terms of, of changing things up. At 15, especially. If you yeah. stack all those games next to each other, there was a clear connection between the early ones, but man, it started to diverge uh, oh, yeah. pretty pretty significantly. You know, when, when you got to like 10 to, and you don't count 11, but like 12. I mean, you big, count 11. Yeah, count yeah. 11. That's a divergence. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. 12 was, you know, like, mm-hmm. whoa, what are they doing here? Uh, and now here we are at 15 where it is, like we just talked about, a completely new experience in gaming. And I think it works. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that is probably better than seven straight years of Assassin's Creed, you know, maybe, maybe series should, if they want to be sustainable, change it up a little more. Well, what is, what do you think is the year cutoff after five games that are similar at five years, then you nuke it? Like what is the right ratio for nuking the formula? I guess I'm excited for new Assassin's Creed games in that Uh, traditional vein. And I want a new Ratchet and Clank and I I wouldn't mind playing a new Call of Duty every year. I wouldn't mind uh doing that. But at the same time, I would like to see these developers stretch their wings and, and try new things you have to yeah, choose it's, one Rainer, it's, it's like sorry. a hard thing though like you know trying to figure out okay how are we going to keep the staple of the series but also innovate at the same time and i felt like infinite warfare did a pretty good job of that uh you know because it's still it's still call of duty but campaign wise yeah, yeah campaign yeah. well yeah yeah i don't know, i feel like it's ultimately like i mean there are things that the fans sort of want and expect from something and that's some, where some of that identity comes from but like ultimately it's up to the to the creators to decide what it means, like what what their the identity for their franchise is, and like if you don't like it, maybe you don't like this thing anymore. Yeah. But Aaron from Cleveland writes in and says, "Good morning, podcast crew. Good afternoon, Aaron from Cleveland. Uh, ever thought about reviewing a single board game every month in the magazine? You know, just a little half page at the back of the magazine or something." We're Matt Miller is not here to answer yeah, that. <laughs> we're getting close to that. I mean, he's doing as many board games as he can. Uh, he has his column online. What is it called? Ryan? Top of the table. Of the there table. we go. Every two weeks, he writes about uh, some new board game that's fun and exciting. It's yeah. uh, it's every fri- other Friday, right? Every other Friday. Well, yeah. there we go. You yeah. check out the site for that, Aaron. Um, and then he says, "Moving on. What are some of your favorite board games? I'm not talking about Monopoly and all that junk. More like Pathfinder, Android, Boss Monster. I'm curious to know what you guys like to play when you unplug for a bit." Boggle. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite, and I, I'm spacing on. I like I like the Cthulhu games. I like Arkham Horror kind of stuff. Those are huge cooperative experiences. Take seven, ten hours. Uh, those are super fun. But I really like House on the Haunted Hill. I think it's oh named. yeah, that's a good one. Yep. Uh, where you're assembling the mansion and then eventually one of your players you're playing cooperatively, mm-hmm. exploring this mansion and you're putting down tiles for the different rooms you're going in. Completely random every time. But uh, eventually one person in your party is going to become the betrayer. Or Betrayal uh, on Haunted Hill. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, I think it's just House on Haunted Hill. Something like that. Uh, Whatever. Uh, no, That's the movie, isn't it? Oh, Betrayal, yeah, that is the movie. It Betrayal is. on Haunted Hill or something yeah. like that. Uh, or Haunted House. Whatever. But Someone will tell us in the YouTube. Yeah, comments. but that, that game is awesome because the Betrayer leaves. They come back. You don't know what their end game is, what their goal is. You just know that they're here to mess with you and you got to kind of solve and, the but mystery. But you know exactly who it is? Yeah. Oh, that's a twist. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, so you're all kind of prepping... That player's prepping on their own, reading, you know, like what their mission is. Yeah. You don't know what's happening, what scenario they're in. They could be spawning zombies. They could just have to leave the house to destroy the world. But whatever you do, you got to try to figure out a way to stop them and stop their plot. It's a cool game. Yeah, interesting. Uh, This email really tickled me just because this morning I walked over to Miller's desk and was talking about board games a little bit with him. Uh, And I think we're going to try and do something related to board games on the podcast in the future. So a lot more there. But turns out Avalon's the best board game. That's the uh, Uh answer we're looking for. Hmm. Uh, let's see. We got a new email here. De- dear GI crew, Overwatch isn't a game I would naturally gravitate towards, uh, but after seeing the GI crew being so excited about it on the podcast and extreme enthusiasm from Dan Tech's eyebrows, I took a chance, bought it, and haven't looked back since. Mm. A game that, as Tim Turry would put it, is just fun for fun's sake. Uh, thanks for awesome coverage on it. On an unrelated note, what's the GI update on Pokemon Go? Is anyone in the office still playing it? Is it still a cultural phenomenon? Most humbly, Bert. Brian Shea never stops playing Pokemon Go. He never stops talking about Pokemon Go. It's Pokemon Go every day. It's JD like, sits next to Brian Shea. Yeah. By the way. Well, it Did, doesn't help you. I mean, I feel like it's like a Jetson style conveyor belt of Brian Shea just standing in the office being rotated around as he talks about Pokemon Go. Dan Tack still acts like knowing stuff about Pokemon Go elevates him to the ruling class of our society for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true the, the double xp stuff has been crazy i've certainly slowed down on it it sucks and it's not fair and niantic needs to do something about it we can't do much 
it's cold as hell up in Minnesota. Like, we're not <laughs> going for these long walks like everybody else is. Those southern states, people in tropical climates, they're going to annihilate. We're going to come out of the winter just unthawed, or thawed, I should say, and be completely behind everybody else. Yeah, so... I still play it every day. I'm trying to level up my characters and, and Pokemon, all that stuff. But I'm at a point now where I'm not going on these quests because I have all the stuff I kind of need. I just need like Snorlax, stuff you're not going to find out in the wild, right? So they need more. They need to add Gen 2 uh, to get me back 100% doing stuff where I feel like I can go to places and catch and evolve and all that stuff. But they've so. really ratcheted up their game over the last oh, yeah. month yeah. with like the you know the Halloween event really kicked it off and then adding Ditto. I feel like they're they're swinging hard now again. But the thing is it's like it's like an app on the phone now where I'm just like I'll check Twitter, I'll check my email. Uh-huh. I'll check in into Pokemon, I'll get my stop, my you know my streak going, I'll get my Pokemon for the day. Yeah. But there's not much else I can do outside of just kind of grinding levels. Mm -hmm. So I want more Pokemon. Like, yeah. Gen 2, please. Hopefully yeah. December. Well, speaking of uh, being smug about Pokemon Go, Drew, oh, I feel like you have the opposite reaction where you feel like you're better than everybody and shaking your head quietly in a Dantec style for That's not playing Pokemon Go. That's possible, yep. Okay, great. Uh, Hazal Muhammad writes in from South Carolina. Hey, GI hey. crew. You a big fan of Mr. Muhammad or just South Carolina? <laughs> oh, from South Carolina. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, hey, GI crew, <laughs> it's about time... Uh, that guy can go to hell, but South Carolina. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's about that time where games are coming fast and furious at the public. Uh, how anyone has the time to play Rise of the Tomb Raider, Watch Dogs 2, Titanfall 2, Infinite Warfare, Pokemon Sun is beyond me. And that's not even factoring in Final Fantasy 15 and The Last Guardian. Nevertheless, I can only imagine it must be an interesting time in the GI office with people jockeying for certain games to make the top 50 list that we do every year. So I've got to ask, which games are you backing this year for the inclusion in the top 50 as well as what games for the game of the year? Also, Litten for Life. What do you guys think about a certain top 50 list at Game Informer? But yeah. Um, what we're backing. Personally, championing. So the idea, like, what what are the games that wouldn't be... Because, I mean, there are some games that are practically slam dunks. Right. Know? I mean, like, there was an email about Overwatch. Like, I I would be really surprised if Overwatch was not on our top 50, you know? So right. no one's being like, oh, I'm really hoping Overwatch makes it. We have certainly had meetings about this to figure <laughs> out, not the 100% list, but it's getting close. Mm -hmm. We are in the final stages of locking down what that top 50 list looks like. JV, uh, was this your first top 50 meeting? No, I was here for the last one. Okay, what did you think about this year's meeting? Uh, it was much more civil really? so far than uh, last year's. Why do you think that is? Well, no one, no one was bleeding on the floor, you know. Maybe that's a code for everyone was a coward and no one stood up for what they thought was right. No, I feel like we had a pretty good discussion the other day. It was okay. good. Yeah, pretty civil. I feel like I'm comfortable with what we've come to so far for the picks. Yeah, I felt like everyone else had really good taste this year, <laughs> so I didn't have to try and... Uh, <laughs> yeah? Yeah. No, I mean, th like, honestly, there was just a lot of good games this year, so it's really hard to argue, like... If there's a if, if there's a game that someone's really behind and you're like, yeah, that was good. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's put that on there. There's a, my fa my favorite part in top fifty meetings, and it's always a weird moment. But there's always those moments where someone's like, I love this, but I'm reading the room mm -hmm. and I realize it's five on one. Mm -hmm. And if I stand up and give a twelve angry men speech, just the most eloquent speech I can possibly muster. I'm moving that needle three notches, and then I'm still getting knocked out. Yep. It always happens, and it's kind of sad, but it's the logical move at certain points. Mm -hmm. Yep. And right now, we're at the point of investigating more. Like, there'll be yeah. not enough voices for certain games that are in contention, so it's like people are going out, doing their due diligence, going home, playing these games. Or some games have been so updated, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah, gosh, we, we got to go out. back. Yeah. I love know, no Man's Sky's one it's, that's on the fringe, I could say. Like, totally. We need to go and... The original state, not so great. One of the most hated games of the year. By the public, a lot of people in the office had a reasonable yeah, time with it. I, I really enjoyed it. Actually. And But you're right. We haven't yeah. checked out the foundation update, which is huge. I love that, that could our, completely change it. Yeah. I love that our jobs, due diligence, is going home and playing video games. <laughs> yeah, that's it's true. such a great thing. It's like, I need to go home and do some overtime today. Yeah. Yeah. Going to check out some more Mafia 3. Yeah. <laughs> sure is better than getting like doing actual research. <laughs> <laughs> Suckers. <laughs> <laughs> Scientists. <laughs> uh, let's see. Daniel from North Carolina says, Hey, GI crew. Josh Groban tweeted out that he was playing Watch Dogs 2, which led me to this question. Who is Josh Groban? <laughs> <laughs> that, 
That was my question. Uh, no, he asks, uh, if you could pick one music artist to make the soundtrack for a game, who would it be and what game or type of game? Interested to see if JV would pick any artist that anyone has ever heard of. Is <laughs> Red Daniel burn. from North Carolina <laughs> right? Daniel. Good burn. Personally, I would have uh, Animal Collective write and record a song for Red Dead Redemption. Um, did you guys see that news story? No. Mm-mm. And I'm, like apparently, you're telling a joke right now. Uh, I'm. It's a. Here's why that joke was really funny because okay. <laughs> that happened. I guess Rockstar commissioned Animal Collective, which is a funky band, to make a song for Red Dead, um, and they did. And I guess Rockstar just didn't use it. And then Animal Collective just recently released it, and you listen to it, and it's like I don't know where the hell this would <laughs> fit in to Red Dead. It's just a bizarre sound. Interesting. Yeah, it's, hmm. it's a fun one to go back and look at. Honestly, I, for some reason, I'm thinking of Vampire the Masquerade right now. What? <laughs> so I'd want another one of those games with like maybe like Grimes, like doing the the soundtrack. Uh, what for is it? Grimes like? How does it go? Just sort of, uh, she's very sort of electronic and grimy. Hmm. Can you, you know, sing her not? biggest hit? No, I can't. Damn it, JB. I know I'm the worst. I, it's I like patching like uh, matching up like super positive with super positive. So let's just say like Go Team doing like Mario Party soundtrack. Something funky. I want another sound and sh- or what is it? Sound shapes or sound and shapes? Sound shapes, sound but shapes. more Beck sound shape levels. Yeah, like that those was Beck cool. levels were really great. It was really cool. Like I just love a whole game of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah for hmm. sure. Uh, you guys have any hot bands? Uh, Tripping Icarus, Reiner. What are they yeah, recording? Uh, <laughs> I got a new band uh, yeah. coming soon. Uh, Put a date on it. January, uh, and it's. With Justin Pierre from Motion City Soundtracks. So, okay. so if nothing's released by the end of January, what do we get? Uh, well, Wade has our first song, but okay. uh, he could play maybe ten seconds of it. Uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah, I, bands I would like to see. Back to the original question, uh, I want to see just train wrecks, like kind of like you were talking mm. about, like Red Dead, like Green Day doing like a Bioshock soundtrack. Oh no! Ooh, right, I want right, right. Guns and Roses doing Final Fantasy. Doing literally anything. Yeah, I mean, wreck. Metallica on Tetris, stuff like that. Wait, that's not a bad idea. But you want that. just like those novelty, terrible mm-hmm. end credit songs from like Call of Duty, oh, World yes. at War, but just like, like sprinkle it through the entire game. Oh, yeah. uh, Madden's rap song at the beginning. Oh, Ludacris like, from Madden 2000? Oh, man, stuff like that. Yeah. Yuck. More of that. Crying in the dirt. Do you guys remember? Skirt. Dishonored had that really weird rap at the end of the uh, no uh, yeah the credits are basically a rap song and it's super weird I think wow. it's Dan Bull or someone it's very strange hmm. uh, let's see Alan Joe I just assumed it's they might be giants or something that you're into. yeah why not Tom okay. Waits I want I want Tom Waits to do Final Fantasy I want Tom Waits to do literally anything yeah yeah Joe I like that uh, we went out and sang karaoke once and your go to karaoke jingle was oh my gosh. They might be giants. Help me out, Joe. Constantinople, Istanbul, uh, yeah. Triangle Band. I, I I did do that. Yep. It was on par with the vocal talents you'd need to sing Triangle Man. <laughs> part of it, man. It's just like <laughs> flat monotone. <laughs> triangle Man. Yeah. Triangle. Anyways, man. Alan Cooley writes in from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hey, Ben and GI Crew. Uh, I write this to you as I sit and wait for Microsoft to verify my account so I can sign into my Xbox Live account. Uh oh. I can never remember my password for Xbox Live because the requirements are too stringent. Remember during the as a Super Nintendo days when you could just turn on the console and be playing the game within 10 seconds? We do remember that, Alan. That was yeah. much better. That was nice. What is stringent about enter your email and password? No, because the password's like you need a symbol, you need a capitalization. Yeah, like, it needs to be, you know, must be eight or more characters I with one so, one symbol, one number, one capital letter, some ugh, stuff like so that. So what's the question? Just, just remember, remember the good old days? Yeah. Yeah. Remember? Remember the Super Nintendo? I too remember when I was a child and things were easier. Yes. Oh, every time I try and play Xbox 360, it's still just a nightmare. Like multiple people trying to sign in. Everyone has to find an account. And the saves aren't on the right thing. You're it's playing a, Xbox 360 still? Yeah, I play a lot of old games. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was trying to play through... Halo 1 recently. Um, anyway, Stuart Blessman... Ben really remembers the good old days. Yeah. He's still living them. Oh, I mean it right now. Stuart Blessman writes in and says, Hey guys, I've been reading reviews of Final Fantasy XV and they keep mentioning the ability to listen to the radio in the game uh, or classic Final Fantasy soundtracks. Obviously, having music stations in games is nothing new and the two previous generations of consoles showed it is possible to import your own music into games. 
But how far away do you think we are from games streaming literal music stations, national or local, like the current, he points out. He's a Minneapolis guy. Yeah. Uh, or advertising space targeted to your location, such as a billboard in Forza game for O'Reilly's or a radio spot inserted into a radio station in GTA 6 for D-Spot, the best bone-in wings in the Twin Cities. Incorrect. That's um, Spring Street. Uh, anyways, thanks again, and my brothers get a kick of how Tim says our name. Okay. That might be a while ago, but hey, there we go. Uh, Stuart Blessman. Uh Stuart, you should look into you're a truck simulator mm -hmm. because they simulate real radio stations. They don't even simulate it. They just stream it from all over Europe. So depending on yeah. what part of the continent you're driving through, <laughs> you can listen to like German radio live and it's awesome. It's I, the coolest thing ever. I think you could probably like someday anticipate something like iHeartRadio maybe being in an open world game or something like that. Um, but I mean, you are going to have those moments where you're going to have some talk radio stuff going on that is disconnect with what's going on in the game. If it's fiction based, you know what I mean? Right. Where that doesn't really fit, but maybe they could have like serious radio, a certain limited package that gives you like the alternative station or something like that. There is something funky in Forza Horizon three. Maybe you remember more right where there's a station where. Like, it has a bunch of radio stations. Then one of the stations is some sort of streaming service they but wanted you to sign one, up for. Yeah, it's like one station. I think he's saying, like, being able to actually, like, spin right. a dial on Yeah, on I don't know, radio. like, how that works rights-wise. Do you need rights? Just I mean, because anybody with a receiver can get the radio signals yeah, going Yeah, I think the it, air. it would just be another way of playing it, like yeah. an iPad, but hmm. it's a game. Yeah, more games should definitely do it. But That's um, something some developers should look into. You're out there. You're the game makers. Do it. Come on, game. Let us know. Do it with music. Don't do it with the ads. I, I'm into that. I love talk radio. Just I want. I would. No, no, no. I, he was talking. I mean, wasn't he also talking about other like other ads being right. pushed? Advertising too? space targeted your location. Yeah, yeah. I don't want that. Okay. Sorry, Stuart. Anyways, uh, Cameron from Clinton, Utah says, "Hey, Ben and crew. One of Reiner's big problems with Final Fantasy 15 was the stamina bar and how it gives you limited sprint." I found out, however, and this is a friendly tip for everybody, he says that if you turn on the visibility of the stamina gauge in the settings, there's a trick to allow you to basically sprint indefinitely. When using B or circle to sprint manually, as opposed to clicking the left stick to auto sprint, if you release and repress the button just as your stamina is about to deplete, it will instantly refill your stamina gauge. I'm not sure why this isn't mentioned in the tutorials at all, but it's definitely an intended mechanic as the Noctis will flash green with energy if you execute it correctly. I thought this might help out. That, I, I've uh, been doing that constantly. Yeah, and I I didn't huh. put that in my review. Mm -mm. Someone on staff write that email? Like, I don't know. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's really not in my review, so I don't... You didn't tweet it? Did we talk about it in the test chamber? Uh, I don't remember. I mean, you did... You, I, I think you did talk about just having a lot of time just in transit with not much going on. Hmm. Maybe that's what... But, I mean, I that's just assumed, maybe. I don't know. Jogging is yeah, no, that much is, going on either. That is... Uh, I turned on this. Th th that was one of my big complaints when we yeah. went to when we when we went to see the game earlier this year was that like when you're running, you're just running out of gas, like or you know you run out of stamina so quickly and it really takes you takes you out of it. It's, it's so lame. So at first their solution was just like putting on a stamina bar. So I turned that on first thing, mm -hmm. and then yeah, and then just like randomly I like let it go once and that's exactly what happens is that like you just flash green your stamina refills and it's like keep on trucking wow yeah and i didn't put it in the review because you eventually pretty quickly get a chocobo and uh -huh. that kind of alleviates all that you just call your chocobo ride it like you're in red dead or something like yeah. the horse yeah. i can't wait for my pet chicken i'm so excited Anyways, dear Ben and the rest of the Game Informers, in celebration of the long awaited final fantasy 15 release here are 15 rapid fire questions related to final fantasy you guys ready okay uh, Kyle, the, or we'll me, alternate. Me, you, me, you. And JB. Nope, nope, nope. Okay, let's go. Oh, okay. okay, let's join the end. Uh, Reiner, this one's for you. It's directed at Kyle, but Kyle told me you understood what it meant. How does uh, Sakaguchi sleep? Oh, God. That is a Kyle question. I can't. That's his game. That's some Shenmue inside joke. All right, uh, Joe. On Chocobo Feathers. Okay, and Joe, what do Chocobos taste like? Mm, alligator, probably. Reiner, what the heck is that ball thing on a Moogle's head? An antenna. For Joe. serious radio. <laughs> Joe, what's a Koopo? Uh, it's a soup, but also has a sandwich immersed in it. Perfect. Would you rather, Reiner, make out with a Cactar or a Marlboro? Cigarette or the Final Fantasy creature? Uh, Cactar, they're cute. Gross. Uh, Joe, which Game Informer staff member is most like a Final Fantasy character? 
Uh, Kim is prompto. Okay. Uh, Reiner, how much does how much gel does Cloud use to keep his hair so spiky? Hmm. What is the name of that Aquanet? A full can of Aquanet. Yeah. You think it would get disrupted in the live stream or something, but no. <laughs> uh, Joe, are you Team Eris or Team Aerith? Uh, Eris. Reiner, would you rather marry Quina or Vivi? Why am I getting all the makeout questions and <laughs> relationships? You're just, a, you're just a Randy guy. What was it? Would you rather marry Quina or Vivi? Vivi. Vivi. Uh, Joe, should Blitzball be an Olympic sport? Yes. Reiner. <laughs> Reiner, who's the hunkiest guy in the Final Fantasy series? Barrett. Uh, Joe, who's the cutest girl in the Final Fantasy series? Tiva. Reiner, who's more annoying, Dan Reichert or Vanille? Dan Reichert. Joe, what are the chances of there being a Final Fantasy musical? Dan Reichert. And Reiner, and finally, on a scale of 1 to 15, how happy are you that Final Fantasy 15 is finally here? 15. I mean, that's, there we go. that was a long haul. It was getting close to Duke Nukem territory. <laughs> like, I'm sick of hearing about this. Just get this game out here. Actually, what is that timeline? Is it longer than Duke? Less? It's got to be less, yeah. Because Duke me. was just, what, a few years ago? Yeah. And that was, like, generations ago. Yeah. Anyways, Tyler says, thank you for all the great shows, memorable moments, and lots of laughs. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Tyler. Um, we got a nice email from Marty C. in Springfield, Illinois, Joe. You'd be interested in this one. He said his first issue of Game Informer magazine was the Mass Effect 3 issue from ah. May 2011. Because he's a huge Mass Effect fan, oh, and he went yeah. to the store and bought it. And then he got a subscription, and he said that uh, five years later, he's a huge fan of Replay and the podcast and all that stuff. And it's all because of Mass Effect, and he's really enjoying our Andromeda coverage. Oh, excellent. Uh, Woodchuck God wrote in. We all know him. We all love him. <laughs> this better be an <laughs> awesome question. He says, hey, GI guys, I love the Monster Rancher replay from the other week. Well, I never played the first one, I bought a copy of Monster Rancher 2 on a board Friday night. Next thing I knew, it was Monday morning, and I was nearly late for work. I've kept the same save file for years and still occasionally fired up on my PS3. What games have done this for you guys? My answer is also Monster Rancher 2. <laughs> I love that <laughs> game so much. And just like devouring friends' CD collections and their parents' CD collections just to create more of those freakos. Sorry, I was focused. You said compy instead of a copy, and I started thinking about Jurassic Park. Oh, did what I What was really? his question? Yeah. Uh, Lost World specifically. Um, he just said, what do you think of compies from Jurassic Park? Hmm. Hmm. What Cute. games have kept you up late is the prime question here. Uh, Final oh. Fantasy 15. <laughs> Most recently, yeah. yeah. There was a time... So I'm I'm kind of old, and I go to bed usually between like ten and eleven or so. That does not surprise and, me at least. But uh, when I was when I was in the thick of my Stardew De Valley playing yeah. earlier this year, I was staying up until like two or three sometimes, which is like like several times a week. I don't and, want to alarm anybody. Occasionally, he'd have a glass of wine with it too. This is super Whoa. like. Super uncommon for me, which is why it stands out as, you know, significant. Uh, I think Mass Effect 2 kind of puts me in a trance where, like, sleepiness just disappears, and I can mm -hmm. just play the game for hours upon hours. When you talk hours. about being in the trance, are you talking about Arya's Freaky Club with the looping music? <laughs> you just zone out there? Sure. Okay. Ryan, what was the last game that kept you up at night? Well, the, one of the big ones, Res Evil 4. I played that. I knew I had meetings the next day, but I was just like, I can't put this down, and just blazed through it. Could not stop playing. It was like 5, 6 a.m. the next day, I think. Like, it was crazy. Mm. Um, but lately, uh, Gears of War 4, uh, playing Horde mode with friends, is oh, yeah. an absolute blast. It's and it's good. like, that is a time commitment because it's like, you want to get all the way to wave 50. And if you can get a party that stays together past their kind of mission rewards, uh, it's a remarkable experience because those like last 30 waves are just insanity actually yeah i had that kind of experience with uh, the last rainbow six game because when you get a good party together and it's late at night you can lose just hours playing like intense matches with teams who know what they're doing i hmm. see that game on sale and i'm waiting for it to get to that point where i can just spam all my friends and be like go 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 like we all have to get this because there was a period where we tried it and it was so much fun but it's just a pain in the ass to wrangle up mm. but i still hope they're bringing it to free to play on consoles that would at be some good. point. They're flirting with it so much on PC. Well, there's a second season they announced now, right? Like Is that right? They're coming... Rainbow Six we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's like a full second year yeah. that they're planning. Yeah, they, they announced pricing some... or anything on that? Mm -hmm. I assume it's just the same? Yeah, probably just more uh, DLC. Maybe we missed the free-to-play window then. Uh, Tommy from Wallingford, Pennsylvania says, uh, First... I personally really enjoy listening to the audio version of the podcast as it's easier, takes less data, and works better for multitasking. You've done a great job of making sure audio listeners aren't missing out by describing anything physically happening that's being re referenced. Thank you. I pay attention to that a lot. Nice work, Ben. Thank you. I really Good did job, it. Ben. So handsome, too. Uh, but there is one thing we audio listeners really do miss out on. 
Dan Tack's wonderful facial expressions. Of course, I could always just check out the YouTube version whenever Dan is on, but that would be too simple. So clearly the only solution is to release two versions of the audio podcast, the normal one and then one with Dan Tack commentary in which he describes his facial expressions and feelings throughout the show in a voiceover. That would be uh, unlistenable, Tommy. I'm sorry. Uh, but Joe, you see it in person. What's that like? I mean, wow. It's, it's, it's someone constantly ro- judgmental. Yeah. yeah someone I mean. rolling their eyes at you and then you say what? And they're like, no, nothing. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. If you want a really good taste of that, this weekend's replay that's coming up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Rare is, form, but we roast him over the fire. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, Thank good. God. I, Dan is great, by the way. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. But I mean, we roast. Uh-huh. We roast him. Joe, when you're busy not snapping at him, you think he's just great. Anyway, so Tommy has a couple more points. Sometimes you need to call Dan because like, otherwise he just, he just sits there. You need there. to take him down a peg. Yeah, exactly. I want to waterboard him half the time he's on this podcast. <laughs> Anyways, oh, the boy. Second, the second unrelated topic is about Mario. I've always preferred his 3D adventures to his 2D outings. Super Mario 64 has been one of my favorite games for some time, but strangely, as I've been playing through Super Mario Galaxy 2, I've been really enjoying the 2D sections in this game. So anyway, it got me thinking, what's everyone's opinions about 2D versus 3D Mario games? Which do you guys prefer? 2D. 2D. Super 2D. Mario World. Yep. I don't like, well, they're good games, but I don't like the new direction they've gone with the 2D stuff necessarily. The new with, series. Um, so... I wish if they did 2D, I wish they'd go back to Mario World or kind of three that time frame opposed to doing like the four player kind of stuff. Mm. I don't mind four player. I just want a distinct art style. I'm just yeah, sick of it, that bubbly blur. But so I would go 3D because I think they've been more creative with Galaxy and Sunshine lately. 100%. Um, Not that they can't be creative in 2D. What I really want them to do is go make a new 2D game in the new style but make all the art uniform and make it look like that Kotabe art, like kind of like the packaging for Super Mario World or like, if you remember like the character select screen in 3D World, they went back to that Kotabe art. Just oh, yeah, Look up yeah. Kotabe Mario art and just go for that style throughout the entire game. It looks so good. Anyways, uh, uh, Tommy's still rolling on here. Uh, wow. Thirdly, is Home Alone a Christmas movie? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and finally, I just want to say thanks to you and Jeff Cork for your amazing work on a Fire Inside Out podcast. Thank you uh, for enjoying our AFI podcast. So basically, if someone wants their email yeah. read, they just yeah. say that you are they're great tribute. or yeah. something you do is uh, great. The great. Hansen, yeah. Uh, what, everyone the writes ring. in with nice things. I'm not saying kiss the ring. I normally cut it out, but sometimes it's, it goes out of its way to be nice. Trevor Johnson writes in from New Orleans. This is completely disconnected from Tommy's email, which is why I love it. Could Solid Snake infiltrate a compound secured by Kevin McAllister? <laughs> How would the events of Metal Gear Solid 1 have turned out if Kevin had taken Venom's place in securing Outer Heaven? Snake versus Kevin McAllister. Go. Okay, so Snake, as a clone of Big Boss, actually has a ridiculously high IQ, which they you don't really think about very much since, since he's like the super soldier or whatever. But I think part of why Kevin McAllister's like hijinks work so well in Home Alone is because those robbers were stupid. But I don't think it's stupid. I think it's just they're on such different wavelengths. You think like Solid they... Snake wouldn't notice a big stupid <laughs> nail sticking out of some <laughs> stairs? Hold on, of course hold he on. Would. Pigeon poop. Yeah, that's Metal Gear Solid. Both of them. Mm. Ryden really took it hard. Like that guy is dead in in Kevin's world. You're but, right. But I mean, he just a little bit. That. I mean, just you clearly see it, and he still slips on it. Snake doesn't. I'm trying yeah. to think of the clumsy. Well, he does though, doesn't he? Isn't mm-hmm. there a point where nope. he he's, doesn't. he's done before he then. does slip on the water outside in the tanker in the beginning of the and he could fall too, downstairs. He? he can be very clumsy going downstairs. All right, that's y- you as a player are making him try to roll. That still upstairs. counts. That's there canon. stairs in Kevin's house. Yeah. <laughs> well, what is the dumbest thing canonically Solid Snake ever did? It has to be Solid Snake. Yeah. I don't know if you can really Eating count stuff it. That time that he three. was no, that's see yeah, that's that's, big that's boss, naked though. snake. Oh, that's yeah. God. So that time he was being trailed series. in Metal Gear Solid Four by three robots wearing a trench coat. I'd argue is pretty stupid. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> <laughs> that's that's oh, up there. of course, robots wearing a trench coat. <laughs> yep. big mama. That's pretty bad. Yeah, okay. That's certainly up there. But uh, I so think Kevin wins. I would like to play this game if there are indie games out there that simulate this experience. <laughs> there, you could not be more up my alley than the combination of these two things. What's the thing that gets him, do you think? Oh, probably what is Fox Beach Die. Um, I think I think the old uh, the old heated doorknob was was, <laughs> yeah. was a, would be a hard one to avoid. That's true. It, it really is. Uh, even like something as simple as the paint can swinging. 
Or, you know, the spider. I guess the fear is kind of like a spider-like character. But again, that's Big Boss. <laughs> and the spider being put on his face. I like. I would at least like a YouTube parody where it's Solid Snake screaming, but it sounds like uh, Harry from no. Home Alone. <laughs> or him getting, or sounds like being electrocuted and it sounds like Harry. That movie is so fun. I really want to go watch Home Alone now. It's so Like as soon good. as we leave the podcast. I hey. actually, I saw it uh, with a full orchestra last winter playing in Minneapolis here. Whoa. And it was amazing. That movie has an amazing soundtrack that people don't listen to enough. John Williams, baby. Yeah. It's great. I rewatched Home Alone last Christmas for the first, I mean, first time I'd seen it in probably, what, a long time. And it holds up. That movie is like legitimately good. I think both of them are pretty good. I, Except I, Trump shows up in the second one. That's I, I love now. the second one, though. Uh, I really think it's fun. Because it like fulfilled that childhood fascination of like, what if I had a whole fort? It was basically a whole house to myself that I could turn into a death fort. Mm. And that's what he does. Like the giant pit in the middle. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like so the cool. ultimate like seven-year-old boy fantasy. Absolutely. Yeah. Or like 29-year-old boy's fantasy. <laughs> or well, like that cool tube on the outside that you can climb up and down. Yeah. Anyways, um, welcome to the Home Alone cast. Felix from Paris <laughs> writes in and says, Hey there, Ben and crew. There's an astonishing diversity of loud open laughs in the GI office. I don't know how Felix from France knows this, but um, he says, Hanson sounds like a loud warning shot. JV sounds like an evil mad scientist. And Joe Juba's a joyful gasp for air mixed with a high-pitched bird, which I just heard right there, actually. Corks is a mixture of random dubious things. Uh, I must say, I never encountered such a high concentration of open, joyful laughter all in one office, and I wish the places I worked at could cackle the day away. Have you always laughed so openly, or has it come with the atmosphere of potential openness and camaraderie at GI? Wait, what? Did we laugh this much at previous jobs, I guess is the question. And it's not like Felix knows how much laughter goes on in the bullpen. There's usually a lot, because it's next yeah. to the two Jeffs, and they're very funny. Um, but I don't know. There's probably... We probably laugh more than the average office. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think because, everybody gets along. Yeah, because games are funny, or just because we're the funniest people. Because ever. we're all awful people. No, yeah. I think we, I think I think people well get together. along pretty. Like people get along with each other for the most part. And, and like when we're talking on the show, it's no different than when we're talking in yeah, the real yeah, world. Yeah. Like this is who we are. So yeah, yeah. yeah it, like is it works. We're most, garbage on air and off. Correct. Air. It's great. True. The most satisfying thing is when we like communicate through like your inner office communication channel and whatnot through IMs. And like when you post something in the channel and then you hear somebody on the other side of the bullpen <laughs> laugh because of what you wrote out. That's like the most satisfying laugh out loud moment in, ever. That does happen. Yeah, that it's happens really quite good. a bit. It's really good. Yeah. Um, or somebody just says something really offensive that everyone gives like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> just any sort of audio reaction to that messaging system always makes me laugh. And then the message disappears. <laughs> yeah. Ah, deleted. Right. Yeah. yeah. Jeff That's Cork nice. deleted his message. Um, all right, Andrew J.W. Thompson writes in with a doozy, so I hope you guys are ready for this. Um, hey, guys, this is going to be a huge waste of my time if it doesn't make the air. Throw me a freaking bone here, Hanson. <laughs> all right. <laughs> with all the talk recently about Game of the Year, I thought I'd write up a top ten list for Game Informer of the Year. Okay. Number ten, J.V. Gwaltney. Wow. <laughs> Let's get the bottom of the barrel out of the way first. <laughs> Whining and crying on Twitter about literally everything, forgetting to comb his hair each morning, and scoring some of the worst games ever made over a nine. Mm -hmm. JV's the weakest link. Goodbye. All right, fat. That's what? fair. Good Why reference. We, to that's, number that's number ten. That's number ten. Wow, way, what's below that? I gave JV a heads up, and he said, "Go for it. Yeah. Read this." Okay. Yeah, Everything else is great. Uh, number nine. Everything else is great. <laughs> <laughs> JV's just the worst. Yeah. I agree I mean, with that number it's 10. Fair. It's, it's, it's fair. really a top nine and then the worst. Right. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, number nine, Cyril Vasquez. Cyril's a great writer, but can't get higher in the list simply because he's not around as often. So get him on Mike Moore. I think Cyril's great on Mike. I think he's mm -hmm. yeah. underrated. Uh, Kimberly Wallace. We just don't see enough of Kim. Her writing is very thought-provoking, but more of her on the show would be a good thing. See? It's all positive. Matt Miller. He's the saddest sack of shit of... No. <laughs> uh, Matt Miller. Matt is often the quiet voice of reason on the podcast. He's an intellectual who hears both sides before arriving at a conclusion. Without speaking too much, he analyzes a thought, makes a pointed statement about it. Very calm, thoughtful, and insightful. Matt Miller gets my attention when he talks. He what about is his, a what? synth from Westworld. So he is an artificial intelligence yeah, that we programmed to be nice. I don't like his bad attitude. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Get positive. Yeah. I tried to convince him to crap all over Monopoly and <laughs> post it, and he refused. Mm. Uh, Brian Shea, number six. 
One of these is not like the others. Brian Shea reminds me a lot of myself. Insanely into sports, but enjoys a good old nerd fest at the same time. Whether it's touchdowns or magic spells, Brian Shea has your back and brings a little more alpha to an otherwise beta cast. Now I know why I'm at 10. <laughs> Wolf. Jeff Cork. <laughs> Jeff Cork. Jeff's, Jeff's number four? Jeff Cork is number five. Well, Jeff Cork is hilarious. For whatever reason, he strikes me as the quote, your mom comeback type of guy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Cork is a thousand times better than that. Yeah. But he pops in at the most opportune moment to deliver pure comedic gold. His work on replay is top tier. Top tier. I'll watch anything that he's in. His blatant right, skepticism. Trump. Oh, well, come on. I'm trying to read an email here. <laughs> you even did that. I'll watch anything he's in. Good. He's, his blatant skepticism of just about everything feeds his sense of humor, and I can't get enough. Number four. Coming in number four. Andrew Reiner. Reiner is another one of the good guys. He's engaging, fun, and always super excited to be there. His columns are well-written, informative, and his signature move on replay is... Get out of there! Uh, he says, <laughs> whoa, 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 what's not to love? <laughs> where did where did that positive personality come from, Reiner? My sure as hell mom and life. dad. Are they <laughs> They made people? me. Yeah, no, they are. When your mom was pregnant with you, she said, get out of there! Yeah. <laughs> and pushed on her stomach. <laughs> and I, his, his dad went, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Personal story, I almost killed my mom in cool. utero. Like Whoa. I had to be like I had to be jettisoned. Like, what what you what were you doing? I was like pushing up against her, like kicking her organs, all this stuff, and oh, it was making God. acid and bad stuff happen and I almost died and I she almost was... died. And so you're that's where all the you're happiness comes from. Basically. Basically. My yeah. God. Nice. Number three, Kyle Hilliard. Jesus Christ, he writes. I've never seen such stupidity. <laughs> but not bad stupidity. What? I'm, I'm talking, quote, JV loves Titanfall stupidity. He's the guy that every circle of friends has that they rip on over and over and over again. Have you ever seen basketball? Kyle is squeak from basketball. If you rip on him 23 or 24 more times, he's, as Reiner would say, out of there. Oh, boy. So I think he's saying be nicer to Kyle. Kyle does an amazing job at taking just an avalanche of garbage found it his way. I would feel bad for Kyle. You have to go give him a hug. Yeah, let's all be nice to him. You don't need to hug Kyle. Yeah. No, number hug two. Him. Oh, this is funny. I don't know if this is a typo. Ben Hansen at number two. Uh, the glue that holds it all together. The note scribbling master. The misty role playing maniac himself. Uh, during that embarrassing extra life moment, I didn't laugh. I didn't cry. I didn't blink. It was horrifying. I stared mouth agape for what felt like hours at how cringy Ben Hansen was as a child and what his parents must have thought. Yep. <laughs> That's correct. This guy clearly doesn't know how things work here. Yeah. Um, and now, for what we've all been waiting for and what we've all known was coming from the start, our number one Game Informer editor of all time. Their stardom cannot be beaten. Their opinion never dismissed. Their immortality never again questioned. Their taste never judged. Their name never besmirched, their reign never doubted, and their legacy never surpassed. I give you... Dan Tech. Yeah. Um, Joe, you were not... The I know, I was even lower than Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Who was quoted as the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, as soon as... Ben yeah. Reeves wasn't on there either. Yeah, you're right. And at least and he forgot a lot of great people. Just turd sandwiches. They're Every all, one of you. Yeah. <laughs> They're all clearly above Dan Tech. I, I feel like I need to acknowledge it because I quietly ignore it a lot, but... I'd say 40% of the emails sent in have some variant of like, all hail Dan Tech, Dan Tech is my lord. Weird we cult don't, following. I don't think we need to acknowledge that. I don't that. want to, but I just want to acknowledge that it's out there. There is there is a bubbling under the surface, uh, and it's all weird Dan Tech cult stuff, which I just assume it's him like private messaging people demanding that they send those emails in or he's just sending them himself <laughs> yeah very well could be that it's very be. confusing um email of the week what do you guys like i don't even remember that was such a whirlwind <laughs> yeah there's a lot of stuff <laughs> i know i i like the um the pokemon two game model i think that's an interesting question why more people don't rip it off uh i, I like the music one a good bit yeah yeah, yeah that one was all right what'd yeah. you guys, what'd you guys think i'll vote um, for the music one that but also all the thought that went into Dismantling our staff is pretty crazy. No, I'm not on that yeah. one. Not, no. Yeah. Okay. What about Final Fantasy? Uh, you know, 15 questions. Oh, that was good. I like that one. Yeah, that, that one's was really fun. good. Yeah. Do that one. You guys want that Topical. one? Topical. Yeah. All right. 15 questions from uh, Tyler from Nashville. You're getting email of the week. That was We're going to ship creative. you out the nicest thing you'd ever imagined. Uh, <laughs> so get ready for that. All hey, right. for now, 
if you're interested, coming up next, we're going to be talking all about Pokemon Sun and Moon. Nope. Uh, the first 15 or so hours uh, up till the end of Island 2. Obviously, spoilers up until you leave the second island. But please keep listening. If you're interested in Pokemon, if you're playing the game alongside us, even if you're not, you want to hear us uh, rant and rave and debate Pokemon Sun and Moon with a huge crew. So it's going to be the deepest dive imaginable. Stay tuned for that. And welcome back to the Game Informer Show, and welcome to the first episode of our official GI Game Club for Pokemon Woo-hoo! Sun yeah. and or Moon. We got a full house here, full, we almost have a full Pokemon roster. We got Ben Reeves, Howlin' oh, Mad hey, Reeves. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> we got Swimmer Dan Tech. Uh, what does that mean? Bug Catcher Brian Shea. <laughs> Hell yeah. And, uh, I don't know, Psychic Furball Serial Vasquez. I prefer the term Hexmaniac. Thank you. Oh, Hexmaniac is a good one. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're here to talk about everything in Pokemon Sun and Moon up until you leave the second island, which it turns out is really confusing as for, far as like where that ends because there's just like a dialogue option. And I said, yes, I'd like to learn more about this thing. And then they, believe it or not, in Pokemon Sun and Moon, they shuffle you along during like a 10-minute talky sequence that never ends they as sure you go do. to that new island. And it's like, <laughs> I need to stop for the game club. <laughs> I want to right here. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we have I'm a so lot mad of people. I was panicking. Uh, acknowledge the game club in this game. It's just really upsetting. Isn't that rude? But we have so many people that wrote in with their thoughts on the game. Uh, a ton of great emails, a ton of great responses that people sent into podcast at gameofformer.com. Uh, but to kick things off, what do you guys think of it so far? Uh, you know, I, I hesitate to weigh in at this juncture um, because what? I, that's because what the I, whole point of this thing. Because yeah, I, what because you I, then you can because take I feel your mic like off. I feel like a lot of the stuff, <laughs> the, the good stuff, is coming. Because right now it just feels like a lot of setup. Uh, I love the music. I love the graphics. The fights are not doing it for me at all right now. And I think it's because we're fighting trainers at this point in the game that just throw one ball at you. And like, doesn't matter what your crew is, you're going to be able to beat one Pokemon. I feel like that is the way Pokemon exists up through the end. Most you know, of them I, anyway. It's not like by the end of the game, everyone has a team of six and they're sure. real challenges. When you get to like, you know, in other games, Elite Four and stuff like that. Well, Elite Four, certainly, but not random schmucks in the grass. Well, okay, I'm not talking about grass schmucks. I'm talking about totem, <laughs> totem Pokemon or whatever. They have right. they have failed to be a challenge as well. Yeah, it, it really hasn't been that challenging uh, to this point. And I, I I feel it was that way for X and Y throughout the entire thing, though. So it, it never really got that difficult in X I mean, and Y. I mean, I understand this is a game marketed at a younger demographic. And you were and it shouldn't be super hardcore. Come. And it shouldn't be super hardcore and difficult. I mean, but maybe I would like a Pokemon game like that. I am completely with you. I feel like we got a lot of emails on this very topic, but I feel like this game is harder than X and Y was. I mean, experience share, you turn that off, you're going to have not a challenging time, but a decent time. But I'm that glad, is the I'm self-imposed glad this hard came mode. up because yeah. that's still not self-imposing hard mode. All that is is making more busy work. It doesn't actually change the difficulty. You're just talking about grinding levels. That's not a difficulty setting. What do you want for a difficulty setting? I would say, I would again, I'd like fights to be... So, like, if I'm putting out something, my opponent will know the weakness and put out their... Mm-hmm. They'll try different combos, like Sleep and Dream Eater or something like that, trying to get moves together instead of just being like, I'm the poison guy. I've got poison stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, that, uh, combinations, better AI. I mean, this is obviously stuff that's not never going to happen. You want that, you go online, you play other players. I get it. I get it. I do. I'm just saying, like, the experience so far has been, like, at least for me, as far as the combat goes, I'm just sitting there and just blowing through anything with just like one click i don't think the second half of the game is going to change much on that front i think it i might. think you're continu- you're going to continue to be like 10 levels above everybody but ben reeves what do you think about the game so far i like it okay i think <laughs> just a short response i think i liked pokemon go better <laughs> like i think i had more fun with pokemon go <laughs> well you're comparing just, like wandering around in a park with your beautiful wife to it's playing this a totally different experience and i play this with my wife oh okay uh but yeah i i kind of agree with Dan's sentiments a little bit. I think uh, for me, it's like all new Pokemon. The Pokemon formula hasn't changed much either, which is something that kind of, which apparently you're going to disagree with me. It's fine, but I'm just like, I'd be interested to talk about that more, but it just feels very much like kind of the same thing. And I haven't played a Pokemon game since like gold and silver. I oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, my Welcome God. Back. Well, I mean, for me, it was, I didn't play a Pokemon game since red and blue until X and Y. Like, that was my really? jumping back in point. Like, X and Y was a great place to get back in. It really they really was. tried to court those Kanto fans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they, they got me. So and, and then this one. And this one, yeah. I, I think that, uh, 
Yeah, I think that, that I echo all their sentiments. I think that uh, they haven't really changed a whole lot, but I, I, I do think that the, the trials versus the gym uh, battles are a significant change, but I think I like the gym battles better. I do too. We're going to get into all this yeah, stuff. But real I quick, have some other stuff I want to talk about too, but I don't know if oh, I want to talk about it now. I think no we'll just start down the, the emails. There's a ton to get Sounds to. Serial, high level, what do you think so far? Uh, I, I like it. I think it's fun, but I definitely agree that it's re e like really easy. I've been steamrolling the entire game. Uh, I've, I've had like maybe one difficult fight, um, but for the most part, it feels like I, it doesn't really matter what Pokemon I have for the most part because I can, uh, at some point, they have a... Um, they tell you, oh, this person's going to have rock type, so go get a grass type. And I had like <laughs> six Pokemon. That. And I just said, sure. And then I swapped one, swapped one in, played, you know, a few a few uh, rounds with other Pokemon and just leveled it up through the XP share. Pokemon? So, like Poke babies. So have anybody, has anybody like lost a battle yet or like died? Uh, no, no, because it's a little bit like Pokemon. It's more like okay. Poke babies. We're still yeah. early, and and yeah, since we have so much to get to, though, I want to. I'll I, wait to talk. I just about wanted to ask that, that quick question: If anybody has no. had to retreat, to the I, Pokemon I have. Center. I have gotten close with the second totem fight. Uh, I really had a tough time the, with that, that was one. The, was that the one that uses uh, Sinus schooling? I wrote it down. We can okay, we can good. find it in a little bit. Right. Uh, I had a tough time a real with son the of a gun. last totem fight. Actually. Is that the one with the healing? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it has a, it has a synthesis. Yeah, whatever yep, yeah. it's called. Yeah, and the synthesis. sun comes out. And they, Lu Luna, yeah, still, yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, it brings in cast form. At least it summoned cast form for me. I don't know if it summoned uh, a little partner for yeah. you, but yeah. it just wrecked me. Maybe it's because I'm a grass starter, but like cast form in sunny fiery mode was just devastating. And yeah. then mm -hmm. that thing kept healing itself, and it was to the point. It was to the point where it's like, this is all fun and games, and then it became that moment of. Oh wait a minute! I might die from this thing. Like I've been using a ton of potions. I don't think I can take this thing out. Mm -hmm. So I I was really plowing through everything up until that totem mm -hmm. fight, that second one. That maybe that gave me pause and maybe think maybe this game will be challenging at times. Not yeah, know, I, challenging. I'm not yeah, I'm not sure if that's like a sign of things to come or if that's just a, an aberration in terms of right. Like, I'm excited to find out. I, I, I think actually I, did die in that fight, which I was really yeah. I don't know. I had to go and grind a little bit and level up my uh, fire Pokemon. He didn't want to say to anything like, into it. Yeah. I don't know. So it's like, not Poke Babies. Well, <laughs> well, that's the Poke thing. Is like, I've been kind of like skipping some of the side content. Oh, oh boy, you don't want to do that. Ben but yeah, Reeves. like I'm down a few levels. I think from everybody else. Yeah, uh, Lorantis was the name of that Pokemon mm -hmm. in that second. Uh, totem fight that was a piece of work i really like the camera work though when it's like sneaking up behind you and they like, sure. cut it like a horror <laughs> film of this creepy like pokemon that, yeah. coming up yeah so anyways uh just starting out of the gate we have carlos diaz from mexico um who says i like the detail about your starting pokemon choosing you back because it leaves you wondering if someone hasn't been deemed worthy enough of becoming a trainer in alola you have to earn it um did you guys notice that as well there's the weird sequence yeah, where right. like it has to like Lock acknowledge you. I heard for some people that the Pokemon just doesn't choose you back, and no, then didn't. it just cuts to credits. Game yeah, ends. yeah. <laughs> That's the, you have to wait 20 minutes. It's like that Far Cry 4 ending. Where you, you sit around for 20 minutes, the game just ends. It says, happened ah, to my cousin. I mean, you just I, became I noticed, a chef or something. Yeah. I don't know. I noticed significant differences in this Pokemon about the whole Pokemon choosing aspect, yeah. where you do not choose. Normally, the rival takes the one that counters your Pokemon, but instead, in this game, they give you the one that counters his. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I, I also noticed that where I was playing it, I was like, God, did X and Y do this? This seems crazy. Carlos Diaz points it out as well. He says, something that is also new to the series, established canon, is that the rival chooses the Pokemon that is weak to your type. I wonder why the developers chose to do that, and if it's only a way to lower the difficulty compared to past entries. Well, he's also not really your rival. I mean, Correct. I mean yeah, there's like a, a few friendly he's the rival character. Yeah, so. He's kind of like a... I think that'll guy. go places in the next half of the game. It's I hope so. There's a, there's a theory going around that the the whole premise of this game is that you are supposed to be the rival because you're basically making all this because like you beat all the gym all the trials oh. first and you pick the Pokemon that's weak against theirs so like people are saying well in this game you are the rival which is like a weird is this that I don't know yeah. is this like that fan that theory that, that I, think, I think after we finish it we'll, we'll, we should re-examine if we see that's the case yeah. it sounds, what, what, this what sounds like that fan theory that like in red and blue you're the bad guy like you have you heard, read about that like Gary is no. the good guy and like and Ash slash Red is the bad guy. Why like, is that? What's the evidence back then? Like it's like you go around like you you reach the like you come out and like dash his dreams of like being the Pokemon League champion like immediately and like well you dash Sephiroth's dreams of crushing the galaxy in Fantasy Seven therefore yeah. maybe clouds. I don't know. I, I don't dreams. remember the exact thing, but like there was like this well thought out like argument on it was either Reddit or NeoGaf or something or blew it. Um, what were you talking about, Dan? Where you're like they're hinting at something with how? Yeah, I think that like I said, like I said, I. 
I can't imagine we go through the rest of this game just fighting stupid to- totem things as our boss challenges. So, I well, mean, I mean, I don't want to. Maybe I shouldn't spoil anything, but in the marketing, they definitely push something that's going to be coming on yeah. later. Is that what you're getting at? Yes, that is what I'm getting at. Okay, so. gotcha. I'm curious to see how it works. I don't even know if there's an elite four in this game. On that note, though, I pray to God there is. I pray to the sweet the, the Lord in the sky, Arceus. I mean, himself. I don't, I don't know for sure, but there has never been a Pokemon game without them, and I, I don't. Has think... Never been a Pokemon game without you, or some kind of equivalent. Yeah, the right. Whole, I like the, the the taking out of gyms. I didn't like it all. I don't like the I don't like the totems and the trials. Well, we're gonna get so to far. that very much so. So, yes. uh, hey there, GI crew says David Lewis from New York, beautiful New York. He says the first thing that struck me about it was how much more cinematic the game has gotten thanks to its new graphical engine. Um, that was also my biggest takeaway. I didn't play the demo. I saw a couple of trailers here and there and stuff, but actually seeing the game in action, I feel like Kyle on this podcast previously did not talk enough about how much better it looks like i've always considered game freak to be a pretty weak developer technically but i think this game is there's frame rate issues for like bigger yeah. battles that are really mm-hmm. bad Anytime there's, there's more than two you're getting it's frame rate rough issues. Yeah. yeah and like 3d is only available in the camera mode and that frame rate is <laughs> hot trash outside of that i feel like it the overall game really stepped its game oh, it looks up. great yeah the thing that immediately bothered me though is that like having played a bunch of pokemon go the pokeballs do not look as good as they do in Pokemon Go. And I know that's not necessarily that's not necessarily something they can fix, but it's just one of those things I noticed. Well, the resolution, how, issue, the resolution yeah. of the 3DS screen right. is lower than that of the original iPhone. I don't care for your tone, Brian Shay. So there's something really that. cool with the Pokeballs I noticed in this one, too. I don't know if anybody wrote in about that, but like the ball you catch them in is the ball they stay in for that's when you go been, to the Pokemon. I think that's been for a, a long time. Yeah. I'm, I'm really stupid. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> no, no, I, no, on that note, though, I do want to talk about Pokeballs because I feel like it's been a growing thing as they add more balls you use the regular Pokeball for less. And it's such a stupid thing, but it really bothers me. Like the iconic brand, the Pokeball, it's good for like level one to uh, level six. Like yeah. it's so, it's like within an hour that good, they're good just that unusable. Legal. And it's yeah. so bad. Like I don't like the look of a great well, ball. I don't like the look of an ultra ball. I want to stick to that basic. That's the thing is like, I, I kind of liked when it reverted back to just the normal logo because all your Pokemon were in the same kind of ball. And yeah. I kind of like that uniformity. And I like the look of those balls better too. So I wish... There's maybe a way to switch them out after you catch them. I wish it was the equivalent of like an MMOs where you want to see your character's head, but you have a helmet and you can just turn it invisible. Right. I want that for Pokeballs, just an option to make them look just like Pokeballs. And this is nerdy stuff, but that's what Gang Club is all about. Sure. Do you guys use the novelty balls? I yeah. love them, yeah. I've been using quite a few of them. And I, I just, I think there's too many of them already. Yeah. And I'm sure there's more yeah. kinds coming. But like, yeah, I find them very useful. Especially, I don't want to see, you know, go into this yet because I'm sure this is a big other part of it. But for the getting the... Basically, this game has like sort of mobile aspects where once a day you get a rare Pokemon. Really? Right. Do we want to talk yeah, about that? Yeah, I have no idea what this is. Please. Where so, do you find that? I'm going to go into it. So, with the QR Dan, code scans. Spell this out. It's the, a little bit like Pokemon for babies. The QR code scans. You get right? 10 of them a day. All right. They refresh. Every time you scan 10 QR codes, you can uh, do an island scan. So, you want to go to the island. Islands one and two for the people mm-hmm. still on the game club. Melee, melee, and Akula, please. Right. Correct. And you do the island scan, and it will tell you, whoa, rare Pokemon sighted. It will be there for one hour in this area. You, this, these are not alone Pokemon, so they're from other games. And, and I have to do some get, QR, QR crap to scan, trigger this? Scan 10 QR codes. Just any QR codes on the internet or anywhere. Are you serious? Yes, you can do this once per day. So, and it is, this is in the menu on the bottom to bring yeah. this option up? Yeah, just like right near the Festival Plaza or whatever. Really? It's QR yes. code option. Have you done this? Yes, tons. My whole team almost is out of game Pokemon because of using this technique. What kind of Pokemon? So I've got like a Sfeel, a Han Edge. Um, what's that little that little electric Lumin Lumino or whatever? Luminos, Luminox, Lumines. One of those. Of anyway, I got a bunch of exotic Pokemon that aren't found in Aloha uh-huh. huh. uh, through this method. Wow, I gotta check that out. That seems really great. What a hot it is down. great. It's super awesome, and it's part of uh, these sort of side mini games, which offer all kinds. Because I've been stuck at this point in the game, right, for like a week now. So I've been Dan like, never stops complaining. Can I get past so I've been like, what can I do? I'm like, well, I can get these rare Pokemon, which is great. And I can also hang out at the Pokepelago. Pelago. Pokepelago. Pelago. What is that? <laughs> Have you not done that either? No. Oh, my God. Okay, this is so another wow. way to get more Pokemon. This is like an entirely, it's an island mini game of multiple islands. Uh, so what? your Pokemon can hang out there and collect your berries. That's one of the stupid things they hang can on. do. Hang on. What's step one for getting to this? What is this? You go it's to your menu. menu. And it's just, okay, so it's kind of like the weird plaza thing? It's after you get the Charizard to fly. Okay. You can go to this place. It's a set of islands that you build up using jelly beans. 
All right. The, this isn't the game I've been this playing for huge. 20 hours? This is okay. actually a big part of it. I've gotten a lot of Pokemon what? this way, too. Okay. So you have your first island, which you put beans at to attract Pokemon. And as you make it bigger, you get like a longer timer. Like, I only have to check every 16 hours now. Instead of every like five hours. See if new guys show up there. And if they do, you like pet them. And then they come back the next day and join you for good. I've gotten lots of cool stuff that way. Mm-hmm. Wait, and you keep those Pokemon then? Yeah. yeah they they just go right well, in your box. I got a Murkrow. Huh. That way. Really? That's right. And oh, I love them. That's Island 1. Island 2 lets you uh, harvest berries. Island 3 lets you harvest shards out of a cave and other kind of cool items that you can only get from that cave. Shards. Island 4 lets you exercise your Pokemon so your Pokemon can train and level up there or increase their stats. And the last island I haven't unlocked yet. That's you where you harvest people. min-maxing Pokemon Sun and Moon. That's why I was excited to have you on. Dan it's, that's what I do. You just see the matrix of game code and systems and figure out how <laughs> to get the most This has been a huge thing. element of the it's, game for me. Like, it's, it's also a, a place where you can get more different kinds of beans, so you get rarer beans that basically like increase the affection of your Pokemon more quickly. I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm not is doing anyone, any of the beans. Is anyone I, feeding different types yeah. of coffee to their Pokemon and tickling their throats Absolutely. and all this other nonsense? My Growlithe well, loves me. I'm sure. It, oh, Pokemon love everybody. Not There's the way special. my Growlithe loves me. Oh, okay. All right, I buddy. hate having to like comb their hair. and like, I don't like I don't. I just don't do it. That's so Annoying. I'm not engaging in that part of the game. I do the medicine like if they're paralyzed. That's about it. They I don't do, it. do any. I do it every every meal. time, every opportunity. No? Yeah, they me. give you that button at the end of a battle. I press Y and I pet my growl. My Draytrix is just gonna look like pig pen from Peanuts at the time <laughs> I eventually go in there. Like I don't want to deal with that stuff. Like oh, it increases your critical hit ratio. If they really love you. It's like, I'm doing fine. Oh, I don't need to, to waste time doing you this. You get to play like Nintendogs and like they'll reach out at the screen and they and they love you. They out of the screen. Wait a minute. Nothing is this how you feel about. love in your life for There's the first time? There's also a benefit in battle to this though. <laughs> really? Because uh, once you get them up into really high affection, there will there was in that fight, um, the fight that I almost lost, there was a thing where my Dartress got hit with a, uh, a lightning attack and it said, oh, super effective. And it, you just saw the health drain except for one HP. And it said, oh, it loves you so much. It didn't want to die. Whoa. So it survived this attack. And then like there's also another thing where they'll evade attacks more readily. Like, oh, they, they didn't want to let you down, so they, they evaded that attack. So if you I take just care don't of them, think that the time spent with that is going to make up for those brief little moments where it could save your ass in a battle you would win anyway. Oh, I mean, that's if you consider it work. I, I think it's fun. So, like, I'm I'm totally doing it. For, you know, because I like you're one of those it. weird Fire Emblem Fates guys, aren't you? I've never pl- I've, I okay. played the first six missions in that game and I stopped. Rumor has it, one of my Pokemon will not evolve unless he loves me enough. Who is it? Munchlax. Really? Yeah, he evolves into Snorlax if, oh, like, damn. you reach a certain friendliness level. Hmm. We've already said one, so it doesn't count, but Dan Tack, pop quiz, name one character in this game. Uh, oh, boy. Oak. He's not in this game. Yes, he is. Not he yet. Is. Well, is he on some island mystical in the bonus game. stuff? He's a character in this game. It, have you met him yet in the, the portions we I just played? know that he's in it. Oh, oh bull Is he your character? Did you name you him? You asked me to name a character in the game. Okay, how, right? He... Okay, we already said that. I said besides him. Uh, There's been like dozens of characters that they've introduced to you, and you've seen talk for hours. Your mom. I know one. Far- uh, Farmer Jill. I know one. I know one. <laughs> yeah, Lily. There we go. That's Woo! exactly who David Lewis from New York wrote about. He said the new side characters, particularly Lil- Lily, are interesting and fun to follow. I'm curious to no. see where the story takes her character. Lily really annoys me. I, I am. Listen, I love. I like Pokemon a lot, but man, she's uh, weird. This story. Who's it's ever not doing it? For it the story. Not doing it for me. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever like remembered a Pokemon story and be like, people no, yeah. cite black and white. Okay. Because that where is where the team, the enemy team was fighting for like Pokemon rights. Can we can we talk about the enemy team now? Is that is, is it where we're gonna? Well, do that here's now? a segue of the century because uh, <laughs> David Lewis writes in and says, "Oh, by the way, Team Skull is the best team by what? far." What? Ooh. Their lines had me oh, burst boy. out in laughter on multiple occasions, and while they're not necessarily threatening, they're definitely entertaining <laughs> from their movements to Holy theme song crap. and li- lines oh, that boy. sound like they're straight off the New York City streets. Straight oh, off the oh, New York. Who knows? Oh, he knows. God. He's from oh, New York. I. Uh, oh. What are you talking about? <laughs> he must go to a different New York. Than weird I posture and just and I, the word. Right. I think Upstate. they're what do you mean word? they're I want, funny I want, they're they're worse. To be. I want to find out who came up with the idea for Team Skull I really do I, I want to know who my, designed this I think thing. my reaction to them it will depend on whether or not my theory about this game comes true which is that that Pokemon preservation thing that you go to I feel like my theory is that they're the real bad guys and that later on they'll Team Skull's going to join you or that Team Skull is like a front 
for like, oh, we're going to introduce a, uh, like a team of bad guys into this team and they're going to be right. terrible so everyone will pay attention to them. Meanwhile, we're doing our dark business like as this other organization. So how does Gladion play into this? That mysterious figure that apparently lives Whoa. in a hotel. Uh, I, like I no bet he'll find redemption. Man. He really hated something. you when you walked into so, his hotel room. <laughs> he did. Yeah, he doesn't even talk to you. <laughs> I, I, I between... believe Gladion is the rival. Like What's just based the... on his appearance, he's got the sure. standard Japanese, I'm the bad guy. What's type null? Also, I like Noel a lot. I kind of want to get him. I do too. Like as a Pokemon. I doubt we'll ever be able to get him. I'm also very confused about what that is exactly. But I don't understand the hate for Team Skull. What do you want from a team? Are you, you want, are you, are you, are you you want them to be cool? You want like a comedic team that's full is of personality. Comedic? Are you saying Absolutely. That? They're funny as hell. I don't think you're saying they're the Kylo ridiculous. Ren of Pokemon. What's that? Are you saying they're the Kylo Ren of Pokemon? <laughs> no, don't get Dan Tech started on Kylo Ren. <laughs> I, I'm always delighted when... Team Skull is on the screen, if only for the animations and the yeah. hand movements and the nonsense they say, constantly referencing bones. It's hilarious. My thoughts, mm. Team Skull, more like Team Skull Babies. That's a great <laughs> right. point. Team Dull. No, I, I don't mind. The only thing is, like, Come that on, animation dude. is so stupid. They're completely ridiculous. It's so stupid. funny. It's, it's kind of funny, stupid. but I'm want? also kind of like, somebody's going to be offended by this or something. Yo, right? yo, what up? It's no. Just Pokemon. They're just white guys that are really into rap. There is nothing to be offended by here. They're just dumb guys. Right. They are dumb. Um, yes. I I don't know. I, I like their They're animations, numbskulls. but there's not a whole lot else that I like about them. Okay, tell me one thing about Team Magma. You know, like, tell me one I thing like about Team any Rocket. other... Okay, yeah, because of the cartoon. <laughs> I like Team and Rocket. And Giovanni's a badass. Giovanni's that, awesome. Yeah. There's never been a remarkable team. This, at least, is memorable and weird. What more do you want? Giovanni. Oh, yeah. it's okay, just Giovanni. <laughs> we need Giovanni to be the head of hey, Team just Skull. do that thing I like again. Yeah, yeah. Do that. <laughs> All right, Riley Bethel from Sydney, Australia. Does anybody want to say hello to Riley from Hi, Riley. Riley. Hey, Riley. There we go, Reeves. Thank Good you day. for doing that correctly. <laughs> uh, hi, GI guys and gals. Uh, I am loving Pokemon Moon. I guess we didn't even... Hang on. Before we get to this. I'm playing Sun. Moon. Serial. Sun. Moon. Moon. We're a bunch oh. of gamers. Oh, the, I thought we were going to have a pattern. Yeah, the darkness. Really, really excited. Doesn't it bum you guys out? Because yeah. you know what it does. Like, so If you're playing during the day, then it's nighttime out there. Have you seen or noticed or talked about any other differences? It has not felt different at all. Other than yeah. like, it's always dark. And then also, there's a <laughs> few scenes big. where they're like, like, oh, this, world. this sun is so hot and it's completely dark out. And you're like, <laughs> what are you talking about? You couldn't even like change the like wording in this Oh, like, this one moon scene? is so hot out tonight. Yeah, hot, like, hot, 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 hot. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> Riley says, I'm loving Pokemon Moon. Pokemon Go got me back in the mood. A lot mm. of people reference Pokemon Go. Yeah. Mm. I played Pokemon X to get myself ready for Moon. I didn't like the simpleness of Pokemon X, so I didn't know what to expect with Moon. Although it is simple with the EXP share, the story that takes you from island to island is engaging and helps to know where to go next. No more forgetting where to get the fly HM. HMs are awesome now. You don't need to waste a move slot. I feel like it's important to point out that she put story in quotes. Oh, that's true. The story. But still, positive on the story. Yeah. And it likes uh, the clarity of where to go next. Which, you know, I mean, I'll super, you know, I'll super agree with all that. It's great to be able to have those moves uh, on tap all the time you don't have to worry about yeah. like oh if i use this i'll never be able to use it again so i never use that also tms yeah you can yeah. Use, I, yeah i don't like the being able to call just random pokemon in to like, help it. you out i, like, I love it nope. i hated it at first but the, here's the reason why it's good you don't have to put your I, stupid moves on characters i know but here's course. the alternative that i would rather have is like you get an hm and instead of having it take up a move slot just have it be like an ability so you can just go select that pokemon and then they fly right. but it doesn't take up one of the four abilities you know but yeah, that's true. But hang but on. This, like, it's just weird. Charizard. Like, I don't have a Charizard to battle with, but I have a Charizard where I can just fly wherever the hell I you want. Think you'd, them, yeah. you'd keep that helmet on and be like, hey, I could just use your first you know fight over here. <laughs> yeah. I was around. really against it at first. I thought it was really stupid. But now that I've been playing with it, it's like, all right, I dig it. I like, I like having them tied to the actual Pokemon. Mm. This is loosely related, but it's interesting having the ability to use that so early in the game, especially fly as like the third HM. Mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy. But fishing am i correct you can only fish in those little weird hot pockets that's right I think so yeah cold they're cold pockets. cold pockets yes. that's really strange but you can get water pokemon on the water anywhere just well yeah it's it's you always it. could but yeah. it's, it's another just subtle change with this game i think is interesting uh so now we're getting to the dan tack section uh the dark pages here the dark pages. brian from st louis missouri pages. says that's right hey gi crew was i the only one that thought the opening cutscene tutorial segment of the game was extremely long I mean, seriously, this is the seventh generation of Pokemon, and they couldn't at least give the veterans of the series an option to skip some of it? I felt like in the beginning of the game, I would walk five steps and immediately get trapped in a conversation with a character who would explain something that I already knew how to do. Without question, the opening hour was a part of the game I disliked the most. I Yeah, the opening was rough. I concur. It took a long yeah, time. They definitely need an option to be like, do you know Pokemon? Yeah. 
Are you cool? It also, was, it was long. It, let's go cool? further. Just give us the option of, do you want the story or not? We haven't seen the second half of the story. Maybe it gets better. Dan. I have to give it that credit. This far in, though. Uh, this is not your this preview isn't that mode. Far in. This is Dan Tech. You've been playing this game. Do you For really me, think the story is going to turn around and you're going to be riveted and give it a super thumbs up at the end? No, but it could be a lot vastly improved from what it is now. In the history of the Pokemon series, has that ever proven to be the case? It doesn't matter. You I have heard to the, give, the, have the to latter half. Shake. I heard the latter half of the game is actually just the, the entire season of Band of Brothers. Is that? Oh, yeah. my God. That if you're really reviewing helpful. it, Dan, I agree. Like, you have to give it a shake. But like, if you're just playing it for fun and you're like, I know I'm done. I would turn off the it story. It seems like you hate the story if with that a fiery was a mode, passion. I would turn it I don't, off. I don't hate, it, hate it with a fiery passion, no. You, just, you skipped through all of it is what you said. Uh, yeah, when I can. I don't. I mean, it's really boring. Wait, do you read any of <laughs> okay, it? Then how are you, go, you going to know when it gets you're good not if you're skipping all I know what's happening, okay? I could figure this game is not exactly the most, like, you know, it's not a brain bender or that's, anything that's the that's what he's trying to get at is what do you think of the story is now it's really really boring right there now i'm not liking it that okay, doesn't mean thank you I'm, yeah so continuing this trend matt thomas says hey ben and company huge fan of the podcast thank you matt uh, i appreciated the big step up in presentation for the series uh the different cities and routes felt more alive than in any previous game as for the story uh i enjoyed the more developed characters and the fact that it actually meant something each time i reached a new city with that said having so many cutscenes, it did take away from pokemon's more free-flowing nature there are times, especially on the last island, uh, where you can't take 10 steps without running into another cutscene. It became grating. Nice step forward, but I do hope they pull back a bit on the story and character development in the next one, which feels weird to say as a big movie guy. Um, P.S. Playing the game without experience share definitely solved the lack of difficulty issue most people had with X and Y. I got my ass kicked plenty, especially with Totem Pokemon. Uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a nice suggestion to turn off that experience share. I just can't do it. No, it's, I, I, For me, this falls into the category of no, that's... You're you're doing something that for one thing you can fix like it doesn't change the difficulty. You just have to grind more. I it's not actually that, yeah. it's not a difficulty setting. Like if you want to put hard in the game or something, that's great. But like no, self imposed difficulty changes. I'm not all about. I really wanted to do it, but it's just a matter of looking at this and realizing it's gonna raise my play time by like 60 percent like sure. it's just i don't know if it's worth that and the section of time where i did it was actually right leading up to that second totem fight so okay. i was like oh i definitely need it now i guess but then i turn, turns out like and like it's I not gonna make it harder like what are you gonna do off. you're gonna wander around and level up some other pokemon that's yeah. not gonna be challenging it's yeah just, it's just a waste and then of your time. lead pokemon will just be even stronger because it's gonna get focused on that one yeah for sure uh antonio sanchez by the britney root also wrote in saying just give us the option of skipping the tutorial it's so easy antonio sanchez says i absolutely despise the new direction game freak is going with the narrative oh, there is no. there is way 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 too much exposition exposition in the, be in the beginning part of the game as the player you're barraged by walls of text every five minutes it's absurd how often you talk to the annoying npcs it also drives me insane how much hand-holding there is in the game. Characters literally tell you where to go every time you enter a new area. Talk to this guy. Go to the trainer school. Do the island trial. I have to give Game Freak credit, though. They really captured how it feels to be a 10-year-old being dragged everywhere by your parents. Uh, wow. That's pretty funny. Maybe it opens up a bit later, but the first couple hours are unbearable. <laughs> wow. Uh, so I, I'm with Reeves in that I cannot imagine anyone's playing these games for the story. And I know, like, from the afterwards that we talked about before for Paper Mario that like Nintendo does a lot of like testing and stuff after the fact, surveys, stuff like that. I know that they aren't developing this game first party, but I cannot imagine a world where they test and do surveys on this game and people say, keep the story coming, y'all. Well, like, I mean, we're looking at this from a perspective. We're, we're, we're old men here playing a child's game. All right. I don't. You think it'll? For I an, reject for, the child. For, I think, I think for an eleven-year-old, this story could be pretty captivating. I don't know. I'm not eleven. Come I think, on. but eleven-year-olds, man, they've grown up in a post-Minecraft world. That I don't think I would know an eleven-year-old who would prefer this handholdy garbage compared to just garbage. I, I, I mean, think that, the story that's, is that's garbage. That's a very interesting wow. counterpoint. Well, I think there's a. I, I think. Both of those things can be right. I think the game can primarily be played by a lot, by an older audience, an audience that is a little more discerning about their story, and Nintendo could also be targeting it, targeting it to an audience that may not necessarily be there 100%. Well, and Paper Mario is an interesting comparison because pa Paper Mario has, like, the story is the best part, and, like, especially the new one, it's hilarious. Writing specifically. The writing specifically. Mm -hmm. Overall story. Well, uh, like, sure. But, yeah, like, the... You can have a bad story, but still have like an entertaining like narrative. Like have sure. the like the writing be really funny. And I think Nintendo has a really good localization team. Why didn't they just throw a few people in that? 
Maybe I mean it's I not. I don't think Treehouse is doing the Pokemon. Like they don't do that. I think it's all I, Game Freak. It's yeah. all Game Freak, like localized. Thanks, God, I don't know for sure, but it definitely it is not top tier localization. There are so many lines where it's just like, man, I d- there are some really weird lines that get spit. Here's, out. Here's the one liner trainers. It's especially bad with the trainers that meet you outside. Like for whole, sure, oh, like, yeah. There's one early. My on. pants are down. Yeah, we're talking, <laughs> diddle, 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 diddle. but like you <laughs> a new character early on, and it's like this character is all about knees. And they just make like three references to knees and then they get in a battle with you and then reference their knees. And it's like, what is this? Here's, here's a couple lines that <laughs> trainers actually said. I was really hoping you wrote down some. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I'll use the moves it was so good at. <laughs> um, and then uh, I crammed Pokemon in my backpack, bounced around, and now I'm here. Diddly diddly diddly. Um, <laughs> That's a good backstory. One plus one is two, but it could also be three or four. Diddly 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 and then at diddly. the end of that one, I'm too young for math. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and then there's a guy in the cave who just says, if there was a hole here, I'd want to crawl into it, period. I want to dig a hole and hide. <laughs> I think that guy also corrected. said something like, I, 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 I'm enthused about holes or something like that. Yeah. Or like, I love digging holes oh all day. God. Hey, you know what? The writing is better than I thought. Sorry. But Sorry for bringing it up. <laughs> I, here, the core of it is I want to role play these games more than they allow. Yeah, I just give him my freedom. And I know it's stupid to be like, oh, just treat it like a Bethesda game. But if they could just inch a little bit more in that direction, like would anybody have a problem with a couple general ideas of like move progressively in this area, but here's a bunch of gym battles. Here's bigger environments, more Pokemon. Go nuts. Like that is ideal gaming and yeah, they well, just won't let you do we, it. We don't get what we want, man. I mean, if I got what I want, we'd have a Pokemon MMO. I mean, and that would be the best thing ever. Ever. A Pokemon <laughs> Skyrim style could be really too. Like, they they add a few side quests, but you can't track them anywhere. And then you gotta like, yeah. uh, where was that? Where did I need to go? Absolutely. I think that is a huge thing, the addition of side quests. They haven't really had them in previous games. A couple things that you could loosely define, but people who are also the addition of, in a, uh, not just side quests, but people being like, hey, I'm a trainer. Come back to me after you fought everybody else in this area, and then I'll take you on. Just an mm-hmm. extra little layer of the people you I do like to. that. Yeah. Um, okay, Keaton Griffith says, I'm really enjoying Pokemon Sun. This generation feels far more new than any other so far. I agree. Uh, thanks to all the Smart, smart changes. They managed to kill several birds with a single stone with the ride Pokemon feature. The bike, HMs, and dowsing machine are completely obsolete now. I agree. It was smart. Uh, I'm curious how Island Trials will be received, received by the Pokemon community in the long term. I don't think they offer as much overall challenge as the classic gym system, but I'm appreciating that they flow seamlessly with the rest of the game. That- this, this brings up something interesting. Yeah. I just thought of this. Please. Does anybody know what the hell the Zygarde Cube thing does? No. no. It sucks no. up little Zygarde. I, I know it does that. I have I have ten percent. So when I hit ten percent, they're like, hey, come back to this area route sixteen, I forget exactly where it is, right. and we'll we'll start to hint at what this thing actually we'll does. We'll delve into that more in the next episode. I'm sure like, we will. I was just like, has anybody figured this out? Just I don't know what it's so, I don't know what it does. Up. Yeah. Right. No, it it is confusing. But as far as the trial system, I'm I'm okay with leaving gyms behind in this entry. It's interesting mm. to tr- shake it up a little bit, but in this case, it just feels like more hand-holding. There's so many layers to it. First, you have to go through this, then do this, then this. And that just means introduction to more characters and being told more explicitly exactly well, where to go next. And some of them are dumb. Like the dancing one. It's like, oh. what's the difference between these two pictures? Like, that's the trial, really? Well, I, did, I actually I, really like that I one. did like watching the Marowak dance. I, I, ha- I hated that segment so much that I that I brute-forced it. I refused to, like, follow it, and I just kept ch- picking different answers Hang until on. I wanted. Did we have different experiences? Because it was just, like, a joke. It was. Like the first one, it was the yeah. first one, the first was, one was a little bit challenging. And then they put the hiker in there. Yeah, of course. It was like it was challenging. I was like watching a dance. Thing. I didn't mean like it was a fun challenge. I thought it was really <laughs> stupid. I thought that was the worst thing ever. <laughs> I thought it was funny. It was, well, it, it was only challenging for one of them, and that wasn't even challenging. Right. And then it was just, hey, here's a joke. We're going to shove a bunch of random crap into this yeah. picture and then try and figure out what's different, y'all. Yeah, I, I thought, thought it was, worked. I thought the joke worked. I think it did too. It made me laugh a lot. Um, but uh, let's see. We have Michael Barnett okay. who wrote oh. in. Wonderful. Barnett. Yeah, he's, he's cool. Saying, Thanks, while Mike. I'm having fun with the game, I feel like a lot of the changes made in Sun and Moon detract from the experience. First off, the setting is way too disjointed and inorganic. I figured that there would be water routes between the Alolan Islands as in previous games, but flying fairing between them makes each island feel more like a self-contained course or circuit as opposed to a piece of land. On a related note, I absolutely hate the amount of random barriers in the game. Previous Pokemon games had the roadblocks, sure, but it didn't feel like you were being railroaded quite so much when that roadblock roadblock was a tree that you could cut or a cave you could light. Exploration in Sun and Moon feels very limited. 
there are a lot, at least in the beginning, of, hey, there's a Taurus over here, can't go here. Pseudo yeah. Widow's standing here, can't my, go here. My favorite one is, yeah. like, the, the the guy riding the Pokemon who's like, oh, I want to check this area for items yeah. first. Please come I'm back later. Sniffing around. It's like, get out of here. Screw up. I don't want to, I don't want to, like, I don't care. I'm we'll gonna, give you this thing in a little bit to sniff yeah. around on your own. There are yeah. some really dumb things like that. Like, the, uh, this is isn't like getting blocked off, but like the, the when the two Pokemon like a lot of like weird leaps in logic, like when uh, they call for help when you're trying to catch a wild Pokemon, oh and then like oh, there's too many of them on screen. You can't throw the ball at one of them. There's no difference between throwing it here and here. We can't do that. It's impossible. Who's ever done your that? Your arm would just snap. <laughs> yeah, why is that an it? option? I hate that so much. Oh, That's snapping, my least favorite thing in this arm? game. When you have one down to a sliver of health, and yeah, and it calls pops for help like, oh. like five times, and it's like oh, it, it's my least favorite thing about. This I had game. a Zubat. Is it Zubat? Zubat? Yeah. Zubat is the closest I've come to dying because Where they kept calling for help. he would just keep calling, and mm -hmm. I couldn't, like, kill him just, in one just hit. Just keep killing him. Like, free experience, man. Well, the <laughs> problem with... <laughs> Robot. Yeah, so just keep killing them. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, as far as, like, I, I like... I agree they are kind of self-contained, but I actually like the layout. I do feel they... The layout of the overall islands are a little bit more organic. It's not so much, here's path one leading from this town to this town. I, I like that in theory. Um, as far as, like them telling you exactly where to go i feel like there's a lot of things in this game that are a reaction to yokai watch which is a pokemon derivative from level five but it's extremely popular in japan at least it was probably in the early stages of this game's development and the presentation in yokai watch is was so much better than pokemon i feel like this pokemon is getting close to matching it if not topping it but then just little things like yokai watch it's all about literally a watch that you wear which is exactly like a little z bracelet it huh. looks very similar and then also just having the super clear marker on the map of exactly where you need to go next which is new for pokemon mm -hmm. uh yoke watch also does a huge job of telling you exactly where to go in a similar style so i actually like the the marker on the map i do too yeah it's, like, handy. it's, it's handy, nice but to have it's usually a straight line mm -hmm. so, like, well i mean that, then i can just be like all right well i don't want to go there if i want to advance the story i want to sure. avoid that area and like explore this area a little bit more before i move on yeah uh, michael burnett also says the setting itself is wonderful too uh, feeling very vibrant and alive and full of personality. I especially like the commentary from the tourists visiting the island, particularly from the woman from Kanto who is shocked that she's not allowed to have her Pokemon using Fly to get around. Oh, she's my favorite. Yeah, I'm also really looking forward to where things go with the Ultra Beasts. I avoided all spoilers leading up to the game's release, and now having encountered my first one, I played a little ahead, couldn't help myself. Thank you for spoiling it. Uh, my curiosity <laughs> is peaked. Also, Z-moves are a lame replacement for Mega Evolutions. I agree with that. Yes. Z moves are, are dumb. I didn't particularly care for Mega Evolution. Why are they dumb? I didn't but, but I'm not like super into this stuff either. I, I don't like either, but I, I prefer Mega Evolutions over I kinda this. Like having, uh, I didn't know anything about the Mega Evolutions, but I kind of like having that one powerful move you can use once per battle to like take out a. So I don't really get it. I, I get. I, I think it's cool to look at. They're cool to like. Whoa! I did a super powerful move. That's cool. Why? Uh -huh. Why do you have two options though? Like I have. Like, I don't know. Like there are two options, but they're the exact same move, and like it's sometimes one is sparkly. Year. I, 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 that's, I'm also confused about that. Like, I have, like, uh, I think it's just a normal type Z Normanium or whatever. Normanium. And I put it on my, my cool Grimer. Normalism. And then it's like, hey, you can use the Z version of Disable. Yeah. It's like, what the hell? Okay. Is that just like a more powerful? I think it's supposed variant? to be like a guaranteed critical hit or something. It translates okay. into different moves when it's an ultimate sometimes. Yeah. So I don't, you have to try. Yeah, like, but there's this just, <laughs> yeah, there's this just this weird disconnect of like, I'll try to use my Z move. And then it's like this big animation where they power up and turn to a fireball and then hit them and then. My shop uses low kick, and they do about as much damage. Yeah. So, well, they do more damage. It, it's more powerful. But how how were Mega Evolutions different? Because that was a whole different form. So you could use it once per battle, and then press the button on the screen, and they would turn into basically like a it could be even like a fourth stage of evolution, and they would stay like that for the entire battle. Just so battle. yeah, like Charizard would turn into Mega Charizard, okay. and like sometimes yeah. like you'd either it, depending on which X Y you had, you'd either like grow like bigger horns and like you had like blue flames coming out or he'd sure. turn black and have like mega, a horny mega dragon. Gengar, mega Alakazam like crazy. Yeah, so it's, would, it's kind of fun to do? see a new design but they're just more powerful. Hmm. Um, so Jeffrey Benoit writes in and says the totem Pokemon are probably my favorite new addition to the series and feel like a real challenge. Uh, they feel like the boss fights legendary Pokemon were supposed to be in the previous games but never were. Mm. In every totem fight so far I always feel afraid my whole team is going to get wiped out and it's great. Wishy Washy did actually manage to take out my entire team when I first fought it. And Salazzle would have wiped me out too if I hadn't gotten a lucky paralysis from my Torakat's lick. <laughs> I think we'd all go for a lucky paralysis <laughs> from our Torakat's lick, yeah. right, fellas? Hey, I'm surprised you had that much Pokemon trouble with for babies. Ball, though. I hear you. Uh, but just a couple quick asides. Wishy Washy is the best new name for a Pokemon that I've seen so far. Very good for a fish's name. Uh, and then that Salazzle thing. Like, I, I desperately needed a fire type. 
And so when I saw that weird little blackish Swat fire and, lizard, yeah, or I, I don't, I, I forget exactly. It it's a it's sandalit? a very sandalit sandalit sand, 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 yeah. something like sand that. Yeah, like anyway. So I caught it and I was really excited because like, oh, it's gonna turn into a sweet fire dragon thing. Of course, it's gonna be great. And then the totem Pokemon is its evolution. I was like, oh, it also looks stupid. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, uh, mine hasn't evolved yet. I was like, intern, what's intern, do? intern Kevin told me that they only evolve if they're female. Oh really? Wait, really? I don't know if that's true. I've heard it from. What do you go in the park and lift up the dinosaur skirt? Whoa! Oh come on! Speaking of which, come on! For babies, come on! Am I nuts to read too much into Jurassic Park references because the game is set in Hawaii where Jurassic Park is filmed? But I'm playing a lady, a a beautiful young lady, nubile, some would say. And when I got to the second island, the Rodham, the Rhododex character, (laughs) okay, uh, it called me a clever girl. Did you guys read too much into it? I think. Did you I, guys I have that? that? But it was like completely out of context. Like, clever girl, welcome to the second island. I probably just hit B. I think it's the I think it's the localization team having a little bit of cheeky could, fun. Could be. Well, you know what? Life finds a way. Well, speaking of life finding the uh, way, what about Dream Park? Must go faster. Did you notice this? I never made that connection until you just mentioned it. Of but. course, there's a weirdo hiding out in an RV saying, "Hey, we're going to revive uh, old fossil Pokemon and create a park called Dream Park filled with dinosaur Pokemon." Like, I think that's a reference. Oh, of course, there we go. Anyways, um, oh, yeah. hi all says Thankin forty one. Uh, really enjoying the game so far. I love the new environment and find all the new Pokemon this generation to be really fun and interesting. Uh, I actually made the rule for myself that my team will only be new Pokemon. Whoa. And I'm going out of my way to catch cool. Critters. That's a cool rule. So I did the same thing, actually. Really? Because I was playing halfway through, and I was like, like catching, what, Pikachu and like a Ghastly. I'm like, I'm gonna, all right, all these Pokemon I love. And then I'm like, well, am I really getting the best out of the experiment? experience if I'm just like going back to all these old Pokemon? I like, I think I should try out the new ones. How can you not have a Pikachu? I have I not found Pikachu, Pikachu, Pikachu Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. I didn't see it either. You can find them. Uh, I had the same thing, Reeves, where at a certain point I looked down on my team and realized five out of the six were all <laughs> original 151. That, that's yeah. what I have right now. Yeah, I'm trying to shake it up, but I just can't find new ones. Like, the only real new one I like... Well, I, I suddenly swapped it out towards the end, and I have the ghosty so, sandcastle thing. But yeah. I, it just there's nothing that's fitting the bill. It's all, like, more grass types and bug types. Like, I don't you, want you that. You got to try the yeah. QR code thing, man. Really, yeah. really helps. So what is everybody's team? But is that team? still, like, that's not new, new Pokemon, Pokemon? Like, that's, that's all the new, old stuff, though, right? They're not, yeah, but they're old, but they're not, like, the 150. It's a grab bag. Yeah. So my team, uh, Serial, I'm glad you asked. Um, Dartrix, the out- Rowlet evolution, Best starter. who okay, I cool. like a lot. Level who 33. I liked, I liked Rowlet a lot, and then he evolved. I was like, eh. He looks pretty good. <laughs> That's okay. I've got him third stage, and he is baller. Like that. <laughs> All right, baller? as long as you promise. Baller. All right, as long as he's baller. Uh, I have a Slowpoke, level 31. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's kind of my water type. He's having a good time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got uh, Machop, uh, now Machamp, uh, level 35 from that trade early yeah, on. Yeah, that trade was crucial. Yeah, its name is Macho, which isn't great. I hate it. Um, level 30, my Grimer. I like just having a dicky Grimer. <laughs> yeah, Grimer's good. Grimer's <laughs> oh, an underrated. Really good. I also have not looks found a Grimer. Cool. You can find dicky ones? Dirty, yeah. dirty little Grimer. Go on. Uh, Salandit, which I mentioned, level 28. And then I just caught uh, the little Radagast. What's this thing's name? Uh, the Sandcastle. They go Sandcastle. Red, red really? It's called Dirty either. Mouth. So. Have you haven't seen the Sandcastle? Mm-mm, He's on either. the beach at the end of the second island. There's these little, like, I don't know, spouts. And you go up to them and it randomizes either the Ghost Sandcastle, the Freaky Sandcastle, or it is um, a Staryu. And I Whoa. kept accidentally killing the Sandcastle. And then those are just gone forever. So I'd have to restart and then go there again, again, and again, and again. I did get a Staryu. Like, Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, so, so maybe, there we go. I just uh, it. So my, my team is, I think, mostly new ones. Um, and then I have a... So I have a Dartrix. I have a Magnemite. I have a Growlithe. Um, and then I have a Mudbray, who is pretty strong. Uh, That's the, the Dirt Horse. That's right. Or dirt it's Donkey. A, it's a dirt donkey. Yeah. That's literally what it is. Yeah. Uh, he, so I have that two cereal, and uh, I think his evolution looks pretty cool. So. Yeah, I like his evolution a lot. And then I have a Crab Brawler, which oh, is the, which who I found you. randomly one of those trees. Yeah, He's uh, hanging up by yeah. those berry yeah. trees. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I know this has been part of Pokemon since Gold and Silver, but are you guys into the whole holding items thing, the berry thing? No, I hate it. I never use it. All but, my Pokemon yeah. are not holding anything. I mostly I give them just the the Z thing. Well, yeah, you I, give them I, Z I guess a Z thing. I have yeah. um, I had a Slowpoke for a while who was slow, so I gave him a Quick Claw, which meant he randomly would go first every once in a while. Did his head explode? Yeah. Okay. He died. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I have right now. My team is Gyarados, Munchlax, Brion, who is the evolved form of Poplio. Alakazam, Arcanine, and Machamp. Al- Alakazam already, really? Yeah. I have you have a Machamp well. already. Well, I got it to yeah. Kadabra, and then I traded with Kyle and traded back, so uh-huh. I get my Alakazam. I meant to say Machoke, by the way. 
How much did you uh, hate yourself when you decided to pick Poplio? I hated it at first, and now I'm glad because it's actually a pretty strong water. No, sure, Pokemon. no, it's not. But it's do so you weird. like take showers in the morning just to try to wash the memory away? Yes. And Dan- shower in the morning? I actually scream Let's in go the shower. This. Yeah, okay. this. Daniel Lynch wrote in. Uh, he says, "I chose Litton as my starter to respond to Ben Raves." Um, I go fire and hope to catch the magic that was Charizard once again. Nope. He's neat, but Salandit having flame burst. I can't say that name. Salandit. Salandit having flame Salandit. burst, That's dragon it. range, Salandit. Salandit and smog has good. more options from a fire Pokemon. Torcat is my most Pokemon, I don't know, with the highest stats, but he isn't that interesting. The standout Pokemon for my team so far has been Grubbin, who evolved into Charger mm-hmm. Bug. Charger Bug, he's like the rectangle. Yeah, he's, a, he's a rect. Yeah, I've seen I think him. he's really cool looking. That's I remember the boss? Yeah. I yeah. remembered Bug Ugh. type being the only good Pokemon <laughs> against Psychic. Charger Bug has been my go-to electric Pokemon as well. Mm. He just hits hard. I want one of those things. I, I ran yeah, into one, but I didn't find one. Grubbins now. are all over the freaking yeah, place. I, I haven't, seen, I haven't seen one. Maybe it's a, a moon thing. Uh, I guess I missed it. It must be a moon thing. It's a moon thing you wouldn't understand. Yeah. Owen from Houston says, hello, Ben and company. As a lifelong fan of Pokemon, quite literally, I'm 19 years old. Mm. I've dedicated thousands of hours across my life to this esteemed franchise. All right, now we're getting expert talk here. Mm-hmm. I like it. Okay, let's my get favorite it. thing about Sun and Moon are the quality of life improvements I've seen on beloved Kanto Pokemon, such as Raticate, Persian, and Doug Trio. My issue with the balance is that you can leave Mele Mele Island with a Blissey, Sudowoodo, Snorlax, and an Alakazam at least then level 18 on all of them. These are four late game viable Pokemon you can basically have at the start of the game with minimal grinding. This design choice uh, to give players such powerful Pokemon so early kills any any shred of difficulty in the game. You can build a Blissey to be a cheese ball in fights by sp- spamming Echoed Voice and living through the damage of every early game opponent with its insane health pool. This guy knows what uh, he's talking about. He really does. Mm-hmm. As it's far like as a like, Dantac wow. analysis. We all see that early Blissey pre-evolution thing. It's like, oh, whatever. It's okay. Moving on. It's like, <laughs> I guess that's the way to go. I guess I'm a sucker because I want my Pokemon to look cool. So I'm like... You really are a sucker. Judging them by how they look first. Is, is that your uh, strategy for friends as well? Yeah. How's it going? That's why I don't call you. That's why he stays away from me. I also strangely like the impl- implementation of a fetch quest similar to the one in Assassin's Creed 2, where you can collect all the Zygarde cells and cores to get a pretty sweet reward. Ooh. Uh, and I like furthers, that he teases it without spoiling yeah, it. That's and furthers cool. the emphasis on returning to old it's areas in the game to explore more deeply a quality that other Pokemon games didn't really have. There's less linearity in the game because of it. Um, speaking of you know those kinds of long burns, did you guys get the egg? Yeah. 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 What a bummer. I had yeah. to go. What the heck? I don't want an Eevee. You got uh-huh. an Eevee? But it's got like, what? What'd you get? Wait, what'd you get? I'm just kidding. Oh, oh, damn okay. it. I was about to be really excited. Yeah, it's like I was hoping because like that was on my quest to only have new ones in my party. So I was hoping for something awesome and new. And it's like Eevee. Yeah. yeah. And like, in, hey, in it's a classic. Golden I know Silver, it's you get a, a Togepi. Yeah. yeah. Are any of the Eevee evolutions in this game new? I don't I, think no. so. Or is it all think so. old stuff? I think it's all old stuff. At By least the way, as far as I know. The, uh, another one I had a tough time with, speaking of EV evolutions, was an Umbreon uh, near the time where we cut off for the game club. Like There was an Umbreon battle. And yeah, I remember that one. He actually gave me a little bit of a, a run for my money. Are you okay? Knocked out like two or three of my I Pokemon. mean, the, guy, the guy's right. I mean, if you want to make it, if you want to min-max this game, it's not going to be challenging. I mean, if I ever if I ever do encounter a hard fight, that's why I've got Gengar. Yeah. You just curse him. The game, the game is over. Yeah. Pretty much. Cursed it. Over. I love ghost type, but there's so many weirdo moves. I'm, I'm actually, not smart enough to learn. I'm glad that ghosts are like weaker now than they are when on Gen 1. Like yeah. Ghost and Dragon and Psychic were like the ultimate. Mm-hmm. Nothing would destroy them. Totally. Now at least you can take them on. So here we go. We have Kevin from Georgia who writes in and says, This is my first Pokemon game since Ruby. And I've been wondering, what determines your six party members throughout the game? Do you stick with the first six you get, swap them out, or just go with a nice variety? Aside from my starter, who will always be with me, forever until death i ended up with a bunch of bird pokemon to the point where four out of the six are birds and flying types i feel as if i should become a gym leader hmm. you should. i think you should cool. become a gym yeah, leader you should. no cool. shame in flying types birds are cool absolutely i never have a flying type like it's never. always like flying in something else like except for in the very beginning of the game when that's oh. all they're throwing at you i mean like pure flying i mean you have a flying as one of your starters man uh, I, I well, he picked, picked the cat. He picked, no, he picked. Oh, he picked the cat thing. Yeah, Poppy. I picked Poppy. Oh, Poppy. Yeah. But I'm saying like right. I never have like I'll never like have like Poopleo, a Pidgeot right? in my in my party. Like it'll yeah. always be like okay, I'll have a Charizard that's like a flying fire. Well, especially now that you don't need the fly HM in your party, like mm-hmm. flying is really taking a hit. So Kevin, you're a champion for flying. Picking them pretty up. handy. To be I honest, always for my team composition, I always try to keep it as as balanced as possible. Like I have like a like right now. I I guess I have two waters in mind, but I if you count Gyarados and Brion, but like I think that. Almost every single one of mine is a, a different type, and that's really key for me. I like to just go for the underdogs. 
uh, that's where eventually, because I know I'm going to win. I'm not going to lose. I don't need the Dantac strategy of just having like six Wait, dragons or whatever. You don't know nonsense. what I've been doing. Hey, I've been rotating out every time, every day when I get those new rare every ones. Day, I'm, like, yeah. I'm like, oh, I like this feel. I'm going to take him. Like that little seal round ball thing. I'm like, this thing looks dumb and cute. I'm going to put him in. <laughs> okay. All right. So I've been rotating out based on like what looks cool based on the rares. Like that's why the Han yeah. Edge is in my party. I mean, that thing's a piece of crap, but... It's in my team anyway. Do you feel like we focus too much because we've been trained from some of the earlier, more difficult games when maybe we're young and dumber? Um, but have we been trained to focus too much on the variety and like filling out every elemental thing? Because it's not the end of the world if there's a Pokemon that you aren't super effective against. You're always going to be somewhat effective. It's nice to have that. Because there's way more categories now too than yeah. when I last played. So it's like, like hard to actually fill out your team with everything. Having mm -hmm. at least one of every, like of the main types, especially like fire, grass, and uh, water. I think is pretty good, even though I don't have a grass type right now. I haven't, I haven't caught any good grass types yet. I don't think. What about? Oh, I, you know who's I a good grass I was, type is Rowlet. Rowlet. Yeah, yeah, he's the best. <laughs> I really like the one. It's got little like slicey, dancey things. That's a bug type, isn't it? I, I think it's, it's also bug grass. About yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it looks oh, cool. Oh yeah, I don't know which one you're talking about. Uh, Keegan from New Jersey says, "Hello, GI crew. Uh, I've come into a Pokemon game only knowing what was officially revealed, and it's been really refreshing. Seeing Pokemon I don't know about or seeing new moves used is really exciting." Also, not knowing which Pokemon is in each route. Uh, I'm also doing a Nuzlocke light run to make mm -hmm. it tougher by playing to the number of Pokemon an opposing, an opposing trainer has, um, which is an interesting strategy. Uh, I was looking for a female Salandit, Sal Salandit. Salandit. So I can evolve her, and about 45 minutes after looking, I find another one. But wait, why is it white? No way! For the first time in a decade, and only for the third time ever since the first games, I found a shiny Pokemon, and it's a Salandit that I very really lucky. wanted. Very lucky. I don't think I've ever found a shiny Pokemon in all the games I've played. I don't think I, I can't They're remember very rare. One. Like, Isn't it like one in 10,000 or something? Like very that? rare. Wow. Well, if one of us finds this on this game club, we're going to lose so, our minds. So it sounds like it is just the female ones that evolve in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems that way. Hey, huh. Serial wasn't full of it. I think um, mine's got a I think it was penis. Kevin that brought that up. Yeah, right? it was... Intern Kevin. Well, I brought it up here. Blessed. Whatever. Uh, he also says, I'm surprised at how little Team Skull and Aether Foundation has been shown so far. Speaking of Team Skull, I absolutely love them. Keegan's mm -hmm. correct from New Jersey. Uh, let's see. We also have William Ryan who says, I've been enjoying Pokemon Sun. If there's any complaints, it's the removal of Mega Evolutions. Mm -hmm. The totem battles make the game seem harder. The environments are gorgeous. Alola forms add an extra incentive to catch them all. Kenneth Brickert writes in and says... Zubat calls for help. Zubat uses supersonic. Zubat calls for help. Yep. Zubat uses supersonic. Zubat can go to hell. I hate it. I I hate the There's call only for been so one much. cave, just that little diglet cave, and I it's so small. Not even the, the, the Zubat Zubats. thing. Like I'm saying every wild Pokemon calling for help. Like, <laughs> it is. I, it's my least favorite thing. I've said it I've said it on this already, but like I, I it's like my one thing that I absolutely hate. Like all the other things like I I'm nitpicking on, like I can live with, but like man, I don't like that. Zubats and caves has been a stickler for for, for so the, long, for, but for the, there hasn't the been like a time. beast of a cave yet. It's just been that little jaunt through. I bet, I bet we get one. I, I don't know, man. All it's right. been pretty light on like the puzzle stuff it's so true. far. True, true. Um, okay, now we have a bunch of just shotgun blasts. All right. I hope you guys are ready. All right. uh -oh. uh, this one here, it says, I've only gotten to the second island and I'm not very excited to keep going. Yeah. This is from William, William Hiddle. Um, it has a number of frustrating user interface issues. Which, hmm. yes, now you're speaking my language. Despite having two screens, I can't check my Pokemon status at a glance. I have to open up the menu, select Pokemon, see my HP, then back out twice. Also, every time I pick up an item, there's an unnecessary second confirmation window. God help me if I start picking up a pile of berries. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> confirmation when Game Freak should change their name to Confirmation Windows. Freak. The well, confirmation window freak. Exactly. More like the, confirmation window babies. The fact that after every battle, it's constantly pages after pages of confirmation windows. Just show me my six team members. Show the experience going up. I don't want to leaf through all this nonsense. Yeah. And the fact that to change your moves, it really, the UI has not changed between forget this move, keep old moves. Just show me the five options and I can drag and drop it. It'll be so easy. But well, it's just and pages it's nice of text. See, what does this new move do? You have to click into it first. Yeah. Or yeah. press L plus out. A, which is like kind yeah. of weird. I mean, if only we had a second screen that could display this information. Oh, it's so dumb. Also, the start button doesn't do anything. Like, there are a number of unused buttons on that on that system that you could just use as a quick reference. Like, oh, if I want to access this menu, I don't. I shouldn't mm -hmm. have to go into the menu and then slide over the next one and press the other one. It's almost it's like they're splitting the design considerations for another system, which we'll talk Whoa. about a little later. Uh, this person knows like a 
continues to write in uh, William saying, hopping on and off a mount is a quick two button press. Good. But why is switching my battle start Pokemon still as frustrating, frustratingly cumbersome as it was 20 years ago with Pokemon Red and Blue? Uh, other things I dislike include the writing outfit, which looks terrible. Um, also, yep. here's a bunch of random things. Why does Kukui, <laughs> Kukui also call my mom mom? Is he actually my cousin or just insane? Uh, I know why. More like poke babies. <laughs> but he has a he has a hot mistress of a wife uh, yeah. that comes in later. Wait, he calls her mom. I didn't notice. I that, guess I, I didn't guess. notice. Yeah. Do you think he's actually the cousin? I think I know what's going on, but Ooh, I, you know, is they, it like <laughs> Professor Oak and Ash's mom in the anime? He's just, your half brother. Some, there's something going on there. That's all I'm gonna say. Why do we call Mom? Have you watched that, like the anime at all? Like, yeah. with with <laughs> Professor Oak's Professor Oak and Ash's mom are totally doing it. No, grow well, up. Oh, dude, grow up. They right. show up in a variety of ways. Up, if if you have listened to the podcast, you know that Ash's mom was in love with Giovanni and that he's secretly Ash's dad. That's it was explained right. in the Pokemon musical. Um, <laughs> but with this this Professor Kakui, the shirtless weirdo. Why does he call you cousin? Is it just like a Hawaiian thing? I think it's a Hawaiian, a Hawaiian thing, thing. Or a lowland thing. I think it's a... Aloha. I think there's something else going on. I knew Hawaiian once he called everybody cousin. Yeah. Uh, where is mom getting money? Does she have a job? I sure hope it isn't just putting boxes away. Uh, Slowpoke's entry says, People eat Slowpoke tails? <laughs> Pokemon are slaves and food? Uh, we actually asked Masuda, the director, about this, and he explained that the world of Pokemon is so technolog technologically advanced that they can synthesize new meat. Uh, my Snorlax <laughs> is going to die in his Pokeball because I do not have 900 pounds of food to feed him daily. Uh, let's see. Other weird phrases I've seen. That gave me chicken skin. Yep. Let's go. Kneecaps. There's the old kneecaps guy. Yeah. And Kukui says my body is ready. Of course. He does. Also, William Hiddle gets to the core of it here. What is malasada? And why does uh, the TV want me to have some so bad? It's my favorite food. Also it's phrasing everywhere. it as this is the best thing I've ever had in my mouth. It's really uh, good. How <laughs> likes it? It's it's a lot of this game is them constantly referencing things where it's like I think I can just ignore that. That's not going to affect my game. And Malasada is one of those things. Yeah, I can't wait to get some after work today. Oh my gosh, where do you go for your local Malasada? To the to the Malasada shack. Absolutely. Barbara Joe, who's written in for every game club, she's awesome. Says hello, GI. I love the idea of doing a game club for Pokemon. Uh, it's been a constant in my gaming life ever since the original games. I picked up Sun and I'm loving it. Uh, I have a couple of questions and comments. I didn't think it was possible for me to hate Zubats even more, but this game managed to make that happen. Can we talk about how awesome Professor Kukui is? I love that he's just rocking that six-pack, and he apparently moonlights as a luchador. Hubba hubba. Hey, now, she clearly spoiled it. I don't want to... Yeah. I think that luchador was secretly... Well, that's a big spoiler. I'm, I don't I'm really not going to be able to handle it. How can anybody have known that? Oh, here we go, guys. Uh, Barbara also says, Must Team Skull one. is stupid. Yes. Yes. But, she says, I kind of really like them for that. You set that up. You yeah, did that on purpose. They're certainly more memorable than whatever that team in X and Y was. 100% agree. I just sort of wish their goals had been fleshed out a bit more at this point in the story. Right now, they still seem to be at the give me all your Pokemon stage. <laughs> uh, aside from the starters, I'm not finding the new Pokemon to be very interesting. X and Y at least had the benefit of having the brand new fairy type. That's true. Holy crap, HMs are gone. I always hated having to waste a precious move slot. Um, I'm not exactly getting to the point. I'm not exactly getting the point of the Aether Foundation right now, but since they're Decor seems to be stark white. I'm going to say that they wind up being the true evil in the game. Oh, so and also, I mean, that's what I'm saying. We're going to start learning I mean, a lot more about them. I, does anyone here actually disagree with that? It's always the in these games, the, the technological always, people are always the bad guys. It's going to be that way tier two. I mean, I'm not going to yeah. argue that. Bill was pretty technologically advanced in the first one. And he made cool a computer. Guy. Bill was that's pretty right. awful. Uh, what an awful man. Mm. Darren from Stillwater, Minnesota, writes in and says, Overall, it still, still feels very much like a traditional Pokemon, but the slight tweaks to gameplay have added a little new flavor. Here are three things I wanted to point out. Number one, Poplio is the best. And no. then he says, don't you dare eye roll me Dan Tech. I, I didn't. He uh, didn't. Please he don't really lie didn't. on this podcast. The trials are an okay addition, but I feel like they'd be better for segments in between gyms rather than mm -hmm. replacing gyms. Right. I agree. Three, every part of my being wants Team Skull to completely turn into the most evil group in Pokemon history just to completely take me by surprise. But at this point, they're just the dumbest thing. They're going to end oh, up being your in partners. A, in a good way. I like this guy. Says. Oh, no. I <laughs> change your mind. Uh, Hazal Mohammed, who we just read an email from earlier on in this episode of the podcast, right back there, Cyril, oh. says, I hope that's the last time I have to use the greeting of Hello Pokemaniacs. But seriously, screw you, Hanson, for choosing this game for Game Club. This is my first Pokemon game since Diamond Pearl, and I'm starting to remember why I bailed the first time. Ooh, my OCD just like wasn't this. made for this game. Every time I find a new Pokemon, I have to stay in that area until I catch it. Also, grinding isn't something I like to do, but I feel like I have to in Pokemon games because I don't want my team to fail when completing trials. Regardless, here are my questions. 
Um, what teams does everybody have? We kind of went over that. I'm not sure if it's in the time between Pokemon games, but Sun feels a lot more welcoming than Diamond and Pearl in terms of pointing out objectives and traveling the islands. Totally. Um, does anyone in the GI crew play with the volume off? I'm currently making time to play while catching up on podcasts. Am I missing anything by playing with the volume off? Again, screw you, Hanson. Oh, Serial has a question. No, oh, no, I'm just saying that I do. I, I alternate. I go back and I, forth. I, 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 I go back and forth. And I'd say, you know, sound is pretty good in this game. Music is great. Mm -hmm. Music is really good. Um, I mean, but it is, it's prime podcasting. Whenever there's yeah. a story heavy moment, I'll pause the podcast and turn the music up and listen a little bit. Yeah. But because you don't want to miss that story. <laughs> It's so really good. good. Yeah, yeah like I'll, be great. I'll have like football on in the background. And I'll be playing while I'm. What's that? Mon I, I don't know. I don't. Which Pokemon games are from? <laughs> uh, let's see. We yes. have uh, a dear friend here, Joel Cost from Westford, Massachusetts. All right. Saying, hey, Game Club peeps. Uh, the biggest surprise of Pokemon Sun and Moon sexual innuendos. They're everywhere, from Magmars pulling Pokeballs out of somewhere to male and female, quote, swimmer characters. These versions of Pokemon can get pretty raunchy. One character even tells you it's difficult pulling Pokeballs out of her bikini. Yikes! Huh. Uh, it's hilarious, but very surprising. Do you think this is this Pokemon game is trying to appeal to its older audience uh, as the game is celebrating Pokemon's 20, 20th anniversary, or do you think the developers snuck this in? I There is... I, there are some weird things in this game. Some more adult language and innuendo why do you think that is i don't think they're put in there to to appeal to an older audience and i don't think they were you know i just think they're there um, you don't think it was like the pixar thing where they put in like hey here's a joke for mom and dad no i don't think, you don't no. think it's just like a weird japanese weirdness i would i would i'm gonna have to go with that actually but i still think there are plenty of things that are probably divorced from the japanese side completely and just localization team slipping in just strange little things like there's a, in the first town you are in there's an old guy who says like i keep telling these kids that lightning is going to strike them from the sky and god's going to kill them but they don't believe me <laughs> weird stuff like that. I was like, what the hell are they talking about <laughs> i don't know or even like in uh the pokemon descriptions i know oh, the descriptions okay. are so those, dark those are like time. legendary okay and i feel like early on they were dark and even we did an interview with masuda from the pokemon company where he even talked about how early on with the first pokemon games they wanted to treat them as scary monsters they still were, i mean even back then they were scary oh that's what i'm saying so but new. i feel like it's taken a dip in the past and now it's back up again in a big bad way i have a couple for you guys if you're ready yeah hunter's description it strikes at humans from total darkness. Those licked by its cold tongue grow weaker with each passing day until they die. Yeah. Whoa. Cubone. There's some really bad ones. When it thinks of its deceased mother, it weeps loudly. Mandibuzz that hear its cries will attack it from the air. Yep. For Isn't the thing like his Gyarados he was wearing the skull one. of his mother? Yeah, you, you got Drift Loon in there. I think that one's a pretty cre creepy one. Uh, I do. <laughs> Stories go that Drift Loon grabs the hand of small children and drags them away to the afterlife. <laughs> yeah. It dislikes children heavily. <laughs> It's just insane. I didn't go read these, apparently. Heavy. Holy crap. Isn't it, it dislikes heavy children? Oh, it dislikes heavy. Oh, you're totally right. Thank you. Good catch. Um, I thought I had Gyaradoses, but I, I guess I didn't. Sandy Gast, who I just caught, actually has a pretty uplifting description. Born from a sand mound, playfully built by a child. Oh. Oh, wait, no. Comma, this Pokemon embodies the grudges of the departed. <laughs> there we go. See, I think it's just I think it's just weird translation from the... From the Isn't there another I, I one where do. it was like, this is like the the ghost of a child that has passed away or something it's or? all something like, oh no it was like this, there was a ghost who like want or a child who wandered into the woods and died and this is their spirit i don't think any of that's like you know purposely supposed to be scary or anything it's just like that's it's not supposed the, to be scary but it's it's dark as hell you it's think just, it's uh, maybe another thing they're kind of trying to take from yokai watch where it's like oh, all these things are supposed to be dead so like let's ramp up the whole everybody's know. dead i wonder if there was a bullet point of let's make it over a little bit scary we are two for two for islands and cemeteries which is something worth pointing yes, out yeah, yeah, i mean every true. island's got to have some place to bury their dead you know what you aren't wrong you gotta you can't bury just, your dead can't just throw it in the ocean like osama bin laden um Let's see. We have... Oh, yeah, Sexual Innuendos. Yeah. It's a very sexy game. Um, very sexy game. Zach it from is. Woodbury, Minnesota says, let's just talk about how the main character walks for a bit. Okay. At least the male main character. I don't know okay. about the girl. But he's acting like he owns the place already after having just moved there. Smiling at everyone like he's got some master plan to take over the islands. I can't 
help but hope that this game has a major plot twist that Pokemon hasn't seen before. That Professor Kakui gives me a bad feeling. And Joe Montgomery says, your avatar or player in the game has no facial expressions. He just keeps smiling no matter what the situation he's in. That's just creepy. Like the first time he meets Lily and Nebby on the bridge surrounded by Spiro, he's just there smiling like they're taking their happy pills. You are the rival. I think that's not supposed to, <laughs> I don't think that's supposed to mean anything except that just the, you know, that's an animation budget. That's right. what that is. But what do you How guys think? What's going on with Nebby and uh, Lily? I think we'll find out more. I blacked out when you mentioned their <laughs> uh, Do you think... It- I don't care. Honestly. <laughs> I, I don't either, but I might. Yeah. But uh, I might back, in the future. To go, to go back to the face thing, I think that's like, um, you know made worse by the fact that the game during battles will take all these weird angles. Like every once in a while, there will be like this weird like tilted Dutch angle or whatever where it zooms in on their face. And it's just like no matter like, oh, I'm about to lose this fight. It's just like... It's just like Villager <laughs> from Animal Crossing. Yeah, it's Smash just the entire Brothers. time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see. Brian from Saginaw, Michigan, to close things out here, says, Hello, Ben in the Game Club. There's a rumor going around that Sun and Moon will be ported to the Nintendo Switch when it comes out next year. Mm-hmm. What do you think of these rumors? And where's the likelihood that it could happen? I really disliked handheld gaming and would love a Pokemon I can play on my TV, so I hope the rumors are true. Well, I would like to clap for that. I, I hate playing a game of this quality stuck on my little thing all day. I I love the DS and 3DS and all that stuff, but like for games like Monster Hunter and Pokemon, I'd want to play them on a real, not on a a larger thing that I can just chill with, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of scrunching down, hunched over, you know. I mean, I'm not alone in being like, all right, for 20 years I've wanted a console Pokemon, like a a full-fledged one. Will a port be exactly what you wanted? No, but like I would say this is as close to like a console quality experience. Like if they just took like red and blue back in the day and put it on GameCube or Super NES like or Nintendo 64, like it would have been weird to like have that quality of a game. But like we're not that far off from what like a console Pokemon game would be in terms of like, all right, you can move freely. It's not grid based anymore. Like Mm -hmm. the visuals are pretty good. If they have HD versions of these assets, which Mm -hmm. I'm sure they do. Yeah, uh, they probably planned ahead if if this is a thing that like they are actually doing right I, now. Yeah, I'm not 100% convinced. I think it's likely that they'll do this. I think it'll be I really interesting. Likely. But I, one indicator towards it, I feel like, is with Pokemon X and Y, they were pushing that bottom screen so much. There's just an avalanche of UI and different options down there. And in this, it's relatively minimal. And if they have to get rid of that second screen for the Nintendo Switch, it would uh-huh. make more sense. I don't yeah. know if that's just paranoia, conspiracy theories, but and you can still take it anywhere you want. Yeah, for like great. three hours. You could take it to the rooftop, baseball, rooftop party, basketball, baseball games, game, basketball dog games. park. Your dog will run away. Would you guys uh, play this game again? Uh, I, I would not. HD? I would. I wouldn't. I think I probably. But I would buy a Switch for the Pokemon MMORPG. I'd play the yeah. next Pokemon. I'd buy game ten on Switches. Switch. I'd buy. I'd. I'd just ten Switches. I would buy ten Switches you, and set them up. Would you buy me myself. a Switch? Yes. Thank you. I know. You I said it on air. <laughs> you did. I did. That means it's true. I, it's so stupid, but like. Hearing Bethesda saying they're supporting the Switch in that Todd Howard interview on Glixel recently, yep. and him talking about the projects coming up, I really thought maybe this is it. Maybe they outsourced the next console Pokemon to Bethesda. How bizarre I think would that, that be? When I first joined Game Inform, I wrote an article about like, hey, if Nintendo, like this is when Hyrule Warriors was like coming out, and I was like, here, here are like the the developers I'd want to tackle other Nintendo properties if they ever outsource these, and I think I did say Bethesda for Pokemon, and I, I, yeah, I would absolutely love that. What a vision. Should have said the antic. I, I, I know said. that I know that Paul Sage, who's the creative director over for Elder Scrolls Online, is a huge Pokemon fan. Just saying. Yeah. Just what more do you need? Just saying. Just saying. Two different companies. Yeah. Three different companies. Like six different companies. Give that famous Bethesda polish. Real quick before we go, there's one confusing thing. I wanted to address with you guys. Right. There's a police station. Yeah. And there's a sign outside the police station. Uh, and it tells you don't make eye contact and don't fight with other trainers. Huh. So have we been like renegade rebels throughout all these Pokemon what games? If you get arrested. Is it like fighting in the street? Is that the equivalent of what we've been that, doing? I mean, if if that's the think... case, that's like the worst law enforcement agency I've ever seen because everybody's doing it out in the open. Well, well especially well, then you go to your feet and you fight the cop himself. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, I'm bored. You want to fight? And yeah. also, if you go in the police station, you go to talk to the cop. He's like, don't talk to me. I'm really busy. Like, what? Like, <laughs> Well, the, to be fair, Haruki, the cop that you fight outside, he then does explain that he doesn't need to do a good job because everyone in Alola is so nice. But then why is that That's one true. cop so busy, reportedly? He's, He's filing all the reports yeah. of the people nice that are people. fighting in the streets. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's They're super nice I mean, the whole concept of Pokemon is like, back. it's like, what is it? It's like, it's basically like, you know, what? You're dog fighting. Of hey, course. I, I mean, hey, I, didn't, I didn't say it. 
What do you think? It's not it really. I also is. like it's, that. Like midway, Lily's like, "Oh, I hate to see Pokemon." Oh, it's been the whole hurt. way. But it's I'll a, watch him fight. I don't totally, care. It's out of the gate. <laughs> she's like, watch. "This makes me feel guilt." Or she's I'm like, actually, "I'm not going to watch this because I think it's disgusting that Pokemon fight each other." Like, I'm trying to have a good time, Lily. And within the first I, thirty minutes of this game, you're making me feel like crap. I'm actually really glad. Finally, like someone in the game addressed it, though. That like you're catching these creatures in the wild and then forcing them to battle one another until the point where they addressed it. Even then, she's like, "Ah, whatever." I did not play black and white. I tried to. Yeah. Well, hey. Having a good time, folks. Having a good time. All right. Uh, I don't think I mentioned it yet. The story stuff is way too much. I want to be let loose, but I'm really impressed by this game so far. I'm having a great time with yeah. it. Yeah. Overall, um, I'm enjoying it. Other than the pages and pages of text that you have to wade through to get to the core, I think that core's there and it's still solid. Um, next episode of the Game Club is going to be December 15th. Ooh. Can you guys do it? Can we all beat the game Two by December weeks. 15th? Right we'll as see. Final Fantasy 15 comes out? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, brother. We got to we'll check it. out these mystery islands Dan Tax talking about. You, you really should. We have to unplug Ben Reeves' nose. That's There's right. so many things to get to. But December 15th, please so play along with us here. and finish the entire game. Let's see credits roll. Let's do it. We're going to get Kyle Hilliard in here to talk about the end of the game with us and stuff. Are we going to discuss uh, one of us kicked out? Post credit stuff as well, yeah? Absolutely everything. So the rest of Pokemon Sun and Moon will be discussed on December 15th. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this segment and you like Pokemon, feel free to tell a friend. We strongly encourage you to have fun with us and send emails into podcast at gameoformer.com. I love scatter shots. I love one-offs of things that were mm -hmm. funny in the game. That's my sweet spot for those emails. So keep them coming to podcastinginformer.com. But that's it for this entire giant episode of the Game Informer Show. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Be sure to tune in next Thursday and we'll have another new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.